This is Audible. Zombie Necropolis, Chad Halverson. Written by Brian Cassidy. Narrated by Mike Vendetti. Prelude. CIA Black Ops agent Greg Coogan couldn't believe his eyes. If anyone outside of the agency tumbled to this, the blowback would inflict incalculable damage on the CIA's resurgent reputation. After all, it was the CIA, along with the SEALs, that had been instrumental in the tracking and execution of the notorious Osama bin Laden. But now this. In his mid-thirties, Coogan wasn't a novice, but experienced or not. He didn't know what to do. He had to tell someone. But who could he trust in the agency? Agency employees were sure to close ranks on this one. Nobody in the agency would want this particular intel to leak beyond Langley's walls. Though at this moment Coogan wasn't in Langley, and neither were his co-workers. They were all hunkered down in the bomb-proof, airtight, Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center in Virginia. Sitting at his desk in his cubicle, Coogan was watching a video on his laptop concerning the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, Holland. The video had been sent to him as an attachment to an email. He had been treated at the Erasmus Hospital for a bullet he had taken that had just missed his femoral artery in his time while he was stationed in Europe a few years back, which might explain why the email was addressed to him. The medical center was a bleak-looking complex with towering cranes parked in its many areas that were under construction. A few pedestrians were strolling on a cement concourse outside of a white skyscraper that had large white block letters perched on top of it saying, Erasmus M.C. Within moments a nightmare began as a knot of medical staff workers in white scrubs were disgorged from the high-rise. The staff personnel staggered drunkenly toward the unsuspecting pedestrians and descended on them and, incredibly, commenced tearing them limb from limb. Coogan turned his face away from the laptop screen in horror. He had to tell someone of his discovery, but who? The agency was riddled with bureaucrats who would do anything to cover their asses. If the intel Coogan had got his hands on leaked to the public, it could lead to a major overhaul of the agency, and Coogan knew heads would assuredly roll. Coogan could think of only one person he could trust, a fellow worker in the National Clandestine Service, otherwise known as the Black Ops arm of the CIA. The fellow worker was Chad Halberson, who was about the same age as Coogan. They were both members of SOG, Special Operations Group, which was responsible for paramilitary operations in the NCS. Officially, Coogan and Halverson were known as paramilitary operations officers, who neither wore uniforms nor carried government ID. Unofficially and off the books, they were in actuality CIA hitmen. Coogan had been trying to contact Halverson by phone for hours with no success. Coogan, in fact, had no inkling where Halverson was. For some reason, Halverson wasn't answering his phone. Coogan reached for his encrypted agency satellite phone and urgently punched out Halverson's phone number one more time. No answer. Coogan threw down his phone and cursed. It was vital that he get in touch with Halverson. Chapter 1 Halverson found out it was much worse than anything he could have imagined. As near as he could tell, the entire state of California had been reduced to a wasteland. A charred, smoking battlescape of twisted debris strewn with corpses, among fire-gutted, desolate, smoldering remains of buildings. Banks of dirty yellow smog billowed across the flatlands in the Los Angeles basin, revealing plague victims everywhere around him, as far as the eye could see, which wasn't very far on account of the smog that obfuscated his vision and stung his eyes. The sallow, noxious smog. Wasn't easy on his lungs either, for that matter. Corpses sprawled in the middle of the streets. Corpses slumped over steering wheels and crashed cars abandoned on those self-same streets. Corpses everywhere. And then there were the creatures. Even now a leash of them were approaching him, emerging from the smog with their signature herky-jerky movements. The bumbling creatures could barely walk. He could easily outstrip them by walking. 
He was on the verge of fleeing the plague-infested creatures when he spotted a blonde that looked to be in her late twenties, walking near the veteran's cemetery on his right. She was wearing blue jeans and a pink blouse. Pegging her for a creature, he decided it would be best to head away from her. She caught sight of him at the same time he laid eyes on her. She broke into a run away from him along the chain-link fence that skirted the necropolis. That was strange, he decided. As far as he knew, the creatures could not run. They could only shuffle and jerk along, unless they were in the process of mutating. But she had run away from him, not toward him. The thought of making a meal of him obviously hadn't crossed her mind. She must be human, he decided. He bolted after her. She glanced over her shoulder, saw him giving chase, and terrified, accelerated her gait. Wait, he called out to her. I'm not one of them. The gate and the chain link fence around the cemetery hung open. She fled into the graveyard. He charged after her. She stumbled over a white tombstone in the well-manicured cemetery and fell on her stomach. She let out a cry of pain as she hit the ground. Seeing her prostrate, he pumped his legs harder, knowing she was within his grasp. She scrambled to her feet, her face ashen at the sight of him nearing her. She lurched away from him, but she was off balance, he could see, and she tripped over another tombstone. He caught up with her, gasping for breath. I'm not one of them, he managed to say between gasps. Her blue eyes wide with terror, she considered him. Like him, she was breathing heavily. I can talk, he said. They can't talk. What's that got to do with anything? she said, still apprehensive. You could still be a rioter. Rioter? The riots. Look around you. She gesticulated with her arms. The whole city's burned down. Where have you been the last couple of days? Rioters didn't do this. Of course they did. Don't you remember the L.A. riots? This has happened before. And now it's happening all over again. It's the plague. The plague-infected creatures did this. Non-pulsed, she stared at him. Then she screwed up her face. Are you nuts? she said at last. You've been watching too many reruns of Night of the Living Dead. Look at the way those things walk, he said. He pointed at the trio of creatures that had been trailing him earlier and now were making their way toward him and her in the cemetery. Normal people don't walk like that. She gazed at the three creatures. Confused, she shook her head, unwilling or unable to believe this was really happening. I just flew in from Washington, D.C. yesterday, he said. When we landed, LAX was taken over by these creatures. They're occupying the entire state as near as I can figure. Maybe even the entire country. She grabbed her head with both hands. This is insane! He could not tell her he was a CIA agent. If he told her, she would think he had gone mad like the rest of the world had. He used his cover story instead. I'm a journalist, he said. I've been covering this outbreak of plague. The government thinks it started in China and spread here. What government? Our government. We're already slaves to China, I guess it figures. We'd get their disease. I'm still researching the story. This is nuts. I flew here to find my brother. He was run over in a car accident. I couldn't find him at the UCLA Medical Center. I don't know where he is. My clothing store burned down. I own a dress store. She started sobbing. I used to own a dress store. We need to get out of here. We need to find out what's really going on. What's really going on is my job's gone, my company's destroyed. She started sobbing again. I think it's even worse than that. The whole country may be devastated by this plague. He shook his stat phone in his hand in frustration. If I can get a battery for this thing, I might be able to contact someone and find out what's going on in the rest of the country. What do you want me to do about it? I'm not blaming you. I'm just telling you what's going on. You just said you don't know what's going on. He hung fire. He gathered his thoughts. We need to find out what's happening in this country. Then we can figure out what to do. Right now we need information. She threw up her hands in futility. 
Nothing works. No phones, no internet, no TV. How are we supposed to find out what's happening? I don't even care about it. All I care about is finding my daughter. How am I supposed to get in touch with her? She looked too supple to have stretch marks, decided Halverson. It was hard to believe she had a child. I know what you're going through, he said. I'm trying to contact my kid brother Dan. He paused. I'm Chad Halverson, by the way. I'm Victoria Brady. She offered no further details about herself. She still looked like she didn't trust him that much, decided Halverson. The three plague victims had entered the graveyard and were closing in on them, he noticed. When there was one, there were usually more nearby. He looked at Victoria. It would behoove them to beat it from this place, he knew. We need to get out of here, and we need weapons, he told her. He wondered if she knew those creatures fed on living human flesh. If she believed they were merely rioters, maybe she didn't know yet. In any case, she would find out none too soon. Chapter 2 Where are you headed? Halverson asked. To the UCLA Medical Center, answered Victoria. I heard there was an emergency shelter set up there. Don't bother. What do you mean? She studied his face. I just came from there. I was looking for my brother. It's infested with creatures. Creatures? What are these creatures you're talking about? He nodded at the creatures approaching through the graveyard. The plague causes them to reanimate after they die. She surveyed the area around them. What about all those dead bodies on the street and on the sidewalks? Why haven't they reanimated? What you're saying makes no sense. They haven't reanimated yet. Okay, suppose they do reanimate, like you said. So what? So they develop an appetite for living human flesh. She shook her head in disbelief. I'll believe it when I see it. You don't want to see it. If we dwaddle around here any longer, those creatures will catch up to us and make examples of us. He watched the three grimacing creatures shuffling through the cemetery toward them past isolated charred palm trees that jutted out of the grounds with burned fronds on their crowns. Already the place reeked of putrescent flesh, noticed Halverson. It was only a matter of time, he knew, before the corpses on the sidewalks and in the roads reanimated and went foraging for human victims. Where should we go? Victoria asked. We need to find more people. I think west is our best, toward the ocean. Why? If we can't find more people there, we might be able to find a boat and head out to sea. At this point, maybe the ocean is the only safe place to be. The three creatures were coming uncomfortably close, Halverson realized. Just looking at their creatures made his hair stand on end. He heard them moaning as they stumbled toward him. He angled away from them, not knowing what else to do. Victoria followed him. She's only seven years old, she said. What? My daughter, Shauna. She's only seven. She was at school when the riots or whatever happened. Where were you? I was at work. Someone told me Shauna's school had been evacuated and the students were sent to the shelter at UCLA. She faced him. Are you sure there's no shelter there? Not now. Maybe before. I don't know. All I know is that it's overrun with creatures now. She started sobbing again. God, I hope they didn't get Shauna. She paused to beat. She must be in this area somewhere. Why? The people in the UCLA shelter must have gone somewhere nearby. We can't count on that. We don't even know for sure if it was a shelter in the first place. Who told you it was, anyway? A friend of mine. Her daughter goes to school with Shona. Did your friend go to the shelter? I don't know. She told me over the phone that she was going there. I don't know if she ever made it. That was just before my phone went dead. All I can tell you is there is no shelter there now. We need to find a reliable source of information. Halverson peered through the sooty air at the devastation around him. Everywhere he looked were crashed cars and dead bodies. Smoking, black ruins of buildings stood in stark relief against the hazy blue afternoon sky. 
he felt ashes falling on his head. What is this stuff? asked Victoria, brushing the ashes off her hair and shoulder. Ashes. It reminds me of snow flurries back in Connecticut. That where you're originally from? Once upon a time, she squinted at the goggles dangling on his chest from a strap around his neck. What is that around your neck? He glanced down at the goggle. NVGs, huh? Night vision goggles. Where did you get them? It's a long story. They look military. Are you military? He wasn't about to tell her about his CIA connection. I got them at LAX when I landed there in an airliner. Do they sell them there or something? I never heard of such a thing. No, I told you, the airport was infested with plague victims. Nobody else was there. I took these goggles out of the Homeland Security office. I hope you know how to use them. Too bad you didn't get a gun, too. I had one, he muttered. What? Halverson didn't elaborate. He continued surveying the environs. It looks like pictures of bombed-out Berlin at the end of World War II. The rioters must have burned the whole city down. Halverson heard a rattling sound near the chain-link fence. He scoped out the source of the jangling. Two more creatures were shambling outside the perimeter of the cemetery's fence. Each was dragging one of its hands, which looked more like claws, to Halverson along the fence, rattling it, creating an unnerving, jarring clinking. "'Why are they doing that?' asked Victoria, following the direction of his gaze. "'They're dead,' he said. "'They don't know what they're doing.' How can they be dead? They're walking. They're just a couple of ugly creeps. Look at their eyes. Victoria took in the milky white eyes of the two figures. Real ugly. The two creatures returned her gaze with chilling glares. Meanwhile, the three creatures already inside the graveyard with Halverson and Victoria continued lumbering slowly but surely after them. We need to shut that gate, said Halverson. Those two things are heading here. Then we'll be locked inside with these three already here, said Victoria with disgust. Better to have three than five. And there may be more of them out there waiting to come in. I don't see any more. He broke into a jog toward the ajar gate. Not wanting to be left behind with the three shuffling ghouls, she took off after him. Halverson noticed one of the creatures on the outside of the fence had but one hand. Where the other hand had once been was now a festering shredded wrist with the frayed ends of a shattered radius and ulna protruding from it. Now do you believe me? he asked Victoria. What? Look at that thing's wrist. It's rotten with decay. She checked the figure's wrist out. She pulled a face. On closer inspection, she saw that the creature was also missing an ear. In lieu of an ear, a maggot was writhing out of the black putrefying hole in the side of the creature's head. Halverson watched Victoria wretch. As he neared the gateway, out of the corner of his eye, he caught sight of a movement in a black stretch limo that was crashed on the road, the better part of twenty feet from the fence. The limo's back door opened. A groggy, middle-aged man with grizzled sideburns and tousled black hair stuck his head through the opening. Wearing a rumpled navy blue suit and a russet silk tie, he blinked his eyes as if coming to after being in a state of unconsciousness. He stumbled out of limbo. The way the man was staggering, Halverson pegged the guy for a creature. On the other hand, Halverson could not make out the guy's eyes to see if they had a milky film on them on account of the she-she shades he was sporting. Victoria caught up with Halverson. Hey, isn't that what's-his-name? she said, picking up on the limo. Halverson suddenly recognized him. The senator's dark glasses and overall unkept appearance had thrown Halverson off at first blush. Yeah, it looks like him, said Halverson. Oliver Becker, isn't that his name? The politician who had to resign because of a sex scandal? The senator from New Jersey, said Halverson, recalling. How could he forget Oliver Becker? Becker had been on the Senate Intelligence Committee and had been one of the harshest critics of Halverson's employer, the CIA. 
Becker had been a rising star in politics before the scandal had besmirched his image and sabotaged his career. Two teenage girls on Facebook had ratted him out for emailing them nude pictures of him. Becker denied the charges, of course. He claimed his Facebook page had been hacked, that hackers had sent the smutty pictures to the girls. Furthermore, he claimed he had no idea where these dirty photos had come from. He speculated the paparazzi had snapped them without his permission. Nobody bought his explanation. Becker was tarred with the reputation of being a pervert. He had tried to weather the storm and stick it out till the end of his term. To no avail, he became the laughing stock of late-night talk shows. In the end, the media and his colleagues in Congress exerted so much pressure on him that he was forced to resign in disgrace. "'What's he doing here?' asked Victoria. "'Probably trying to sell his story to Hollywood.' Catching sight of Halverson and Victoria, Becker lurched toward them. "'He's coming over here,' said Victoria. "'Let's help him. He can barely walk.' Warily, Halverson latched onto her arm and held her back. "'He may be one of them. Look how he's walking. "'He's probably staggering because he got knocked out in a car accident.' Becker waved at the two of them. "'Help me!' "'Let's help him,' said Victoria. She started toward Becker. Grudgingly, Halverson followed her. Even if Becker had not morphed into a plague victim, Halverson was not one of his fans. Some thirty feet behind Halverson, the three creatures traipsed after him. Halverson figured Becker wasn't infected because Becker could talk. The creatures couldn't talk. They could only moan. Still woozy, Becker stumbled toward Halverson and Victoria. Victoria caught up to Becker and guided him through the mismatch of crashed cars on the road. The world's gone mad, said Becker. Chapter 3 The whole city's burned down, we think, said Victoria. I saw people killing each other, Becker said, consternated. It's a plague, said Halverson. Plague? Becker looked confused. An outbreak of plague decimated the city. I know it sounds insane, said Victoria. I had my doubts, too. But look at all these dead everywhere. They couldn't all have died from the fire. I don't know the exact mechanics of it, said Halverson. But the plague infects people, kills them, then brings them back to life, if you can call it that. Becker shook his head. Impossible. You mean to tell me that all these dead people around us are going to come back to life? They'll all come back to life with only one thing on their minds. To eat living human flesh. Any living flesh, for that matter. How come the three of us aren't dead, then? Yeah, said Victoria, facing Halverson. I don't know. As for myself, I was on a plane when the plague struck here. Maybe that prevented me from contracting it. But what about us? I wasn't on any plane. I was here on the ground. Me too, said Becker. I told you I don't know, said Halverson. Maybe some people are immune to it. Halverson doubted that. From what he had learned at the CIA about the disease, he didn't think anyone was immune. Or maybe you weren't exposed to the pathogen that transmits the plague. How is the plague transmitted? I don't know that either. All I know for sure is, if one of those plague-infected creatures bites you, you'll contract it. You'll die and turn into one of them when you reanimate. This is fantastic, said Becker, overwhelmed. We're doomed, said Victoria. Not necessarily, said Halverson. These creatures can be destroyed. With what? asked Becker. He held his hands open. I don't have a gun on me. Victoria looked at Becker. I don't understand why we don't have this plague stuff. Maybe we can figure it out, said Halverson. Where were you when you first noticed the city was burning down? He asked Victoria. Let me see, she paused and thought. I was in my stores walking safe. All property is theft, chimed in Becker. Fist balled at her sides, Victoria confronted him. I saved up my earnings from my dressmaking shop, and I bought that store. Nobody stole anything. Taken aback, Becker said, Don't get all huffy. I was quoting Proudhon. 
That's another politician I won't ever vote for, along with you. Becker pooh-poohed a remark. You're not in my district. You don't even have a district, last I heard. Can we get back to the subject, said Halverson, peeved at both of them. You have no authority over me, said Becker. That woman insulted me. Nobody gets away with that. You started it, countered Victoria. Let it die, Halverson told both of them. Becker shrugged in disgust, as if the matter was of no importance. Where were we? Victoria asked Halverson. We were trying to figure out why you don't have the plague. Oh, yeah. Halverson tried to recall the gist of their conversation before Becker had interrupted them. When you were in the safe, was its door shut behind you? asked Halverson, picking up the thread of his earlier line of questioning. Yep. I always close it behind me. I can open the safe door from the inside. Then what? When I walked out of the safe, I saw rioters running amok through the streets, attacking each other, and the city was ablaze. Halverson thought about it. Your safe is probably hematically sealed. That prevented you from breathing the outside air at the time of the contamination. That's only true if it's an airborne pathogen that causes the disease, said Becker. All these dead bodies around us could reaminate any time now. Becker surveyed the corpses littering the sidewalks and streets. Even the crashed cars had corpses slumped inside them. Pools of drying blood mottled the asphalt under the motor vehicles. Many windshields were splashed with blood on their interiors. Victoria looked over her shoulder at the three creatures already inside the cemetery as they closed the gap between them and her. We may be safer hitting the road, she said. The thing is, these corpses could all reanimate at the same time while we're on the road, said Halverson. Then we'd be screwed. Let's get inside the cemetery until we can figure out our next move, said Becker. What if we commandeer a car and drive away, suggested Victoria. How can we drive anywhere, said Halverson. The roads are all blocked with abandoned vehicles. Maybe we could drive the abandoned cars out of the way. I think what you're saying, said Becker. How could we possibly drive all of the cars out of the way? That makes no sense. Victoria threw up her hands in frustration. Looking flustered, her face red, she paced around the sidewalk that skirted the cemetery. Excuse me for breathing, she said. Becker made for the cemetery. I don't know about the rest of you, but I have no desire to stand here and be eaten for lunch by one of those things, whatever they are. Halverson started when he heard a commotion on the road. It sounded like a car door was opening. If those things moved any slower, they could wear shells on their backs, said Becker. Halverson ignored him and tried to home in on the direction of the clangor in the street. Chapter 4 Halverson caught sight of a chestnut-haired thirty-something woman clambering out of a crumpled sedan less than twenty feet from him. The question was, Halverson knew, was she reanimating as a creature? Or had she somehow survived the plague like Becker his side of the cab? Dressed in a butternut uniform, he had close-cropped black hair and looked to be pushing thirty to Halverson. Halverson could tell from the agile way the guard scrambled down from his cab that the guy had not been infected. Over here, Halverson called out to him. The guard jogged over. What the hell's going on? he said, wide-eyed at the massive destruction on the streets. Is that right? What happened to you? asked Halverson. I was in my truck when everybody started crashing into everybody else for no reason at all that I could see. Were you knocked unconscious in the crash? No, I locked myself in the cab. I thought riots were breaking out. I knew I'd be safe in my truck. That thing's airtight and bulletproof. It seemed like the safest place to be. It wasn't a riot. The plague wiped everybody out. Jesus. Halverson eyed the semi-automatic in the guard's leather holster hanging from his waist. Do you have another gun? asked Halverson. Reflexively, the guard reached for his gun. He squinted at Halverson suspiciously. Why? You see those creatures walking along the fence? The guard checked out the two decaying creatures trudging toward them. They're all messed up. What's with them? They're infected with a plague. 
All they want to do is eat living human flesh. The guard rolled his eyes and shook his head, trying to come to grips with Halverson's explanation. You're coming at me from the twilight zone. What's this all about? If those things bite us, we'll become infected with plague and end up like them. They're the walking dead. No way. They need to be killed. How can you kill them if they're already dead? Look, we need weapons. Do you have any more in your truck? The guard withdrew a stick of peppermint gum from his breast pocket. He unwrapped the gum, flicked it into his open mouth, and commenced chewing. If this is a heist, it's the weirdest one I ever heard of. You must be okay. I got another Glock 17 pistol and a tactical shotgun in my cab. Great. Halverson sprang into the car-crammed street and snaked his way toward the armored truck. He found the pistol encased in a leather holster attached to the side of the door. The pistol was, as the guard had said, a Glock 17. Halverson withdrew it and wedged it inside his waistband. Shotgun he slid out from its sleeve that was affixed to the inside of the door. He inspected the shotgun. He noted with approval that it was a pump-action Mossberg 500, tactical persuader. He spotted a row of spare magazine clips for the Glock lining the opposite door. He climbed into the cab. He retrieved the clips and shoved them into his trouser pockets. He scooped up nearby cartridges for the shotgun as well. He thrust some of them into his pockets, the rest he carried in his hand. He returned to the others near the fence. Is this the twelve-gauge? he asked the guard. Yeah. He must know something about guns. A little. Halverson couldn't tell him any more than that. Halverson happened to know a lot about guns, since he worked for the Black Ops Division of the CIA, the National Clandestine Service. But he couldn't let anyone know about his profession. A secret agent with a blown cover was useless. Then again, everyone at the CIA might have become infected with plague and was now one of the walking dead, in which case it was pointless for him to worry about revealing his profession. He may have been out of work like everybody else. The question was, he knew, how far had the plague spread? It's a 12-gauge, 18.5-inch, six-shot, matte black pump with a parkerized barrel, the guard elaborated. They don't call it a persuader for nothing, said Halverson, admiring it. He held it up for the others to look at. Who wants it? Reba shrugged. I'll take it. Do you mind telling me what for? She accepted the Mossberg from him. He gave her a handful of cartridges for the shotgun. We need weapons for self-defense, he explained. Self-defense from what? From those creatures. They want to kill us. Haven't you been listening to me? He stared at the creatures for a moment. He turned to Reba. Could I have that shotgun for a minute? Sure, she handed the Mossberg to him. As if to illustrate his point. He confronted one of the things walking toward him. He turned the shotgun around in his hands, grabbed it by the barrel, and set to clubbing the creature's head, bashing its brains in with a shotgun's sturdy synthetic stock. Victoria screamed at the sight. Are you crazy? Reba asked Halverson with a grimace. Its head caved in. The creature collapsed to its knees, then toppled over on its rotting, haggard face. The stench from the creature's Putrefying flesh was unbearable. Halverson gagged and retreated. Flies swarmed around the creature's smashed head. Those creatures smell horrible, he said, wincing. Why don't you just do this? asked the guard. He withdrew his semi-automatic and shot the other creature in the chest. The creature backed up two steps and then kept shambling forward. Puzzled, the guard unloaded three more shots into the creature's chest. One round hit this creature squarely in the heart. Still, the creature did not go down. It kept approaching. Don't use your gun, said Halverson. Why not? The guard aimed again for the upper body mass. He fired. He knew he hit the thing in its heart. No matter. The thing just kept coming. The guard could not believe his eyes. Halverson snagged the guard's gun hand and pushed it down. Don't shoot any more. If there are more of those things anywhere nearby, they'll hear the gunshots and come here. Loud noises attract them. They should be dead. I hit it twice in the heart. Shotgun in hand, Halverson bolted towards the creature. 
He pummeled the creature's head with a shotgun's rugged stock three times. Creature dropped. It sprawled motionless on the grass verge outside the fence. You have to kill her brain, said Halverson. It's the only part of them that's reanimated. All their other organs are dead. Can we move away from here? said Reba. She pinched her nose. Those things stink worse than garbage. Let's get into the cemetery. We'll close the gate, just in case there are more of those where they came from. Halverson and the others retreated into the graveyard. As soon as they did so, the three ghouls already inside it shuffled toward them. Still holding the shotgun, Halverson waded into the creatures. After he dispatched the lead creature, Halverson had to retreat to avoid the clutches of the two remaining creatures that lunged after him. I'd help you out, but I don't have a club, said the guard. Just distract one of those things while I go after the other one, said Halverson. The guard beset one of the creatures, kicking it in the back of its knee. The creature reacted by turning around and trudging after him. Not wanting to use his gun and invite more creatures with its report, he darted away from the gangling thing. Halverson took the opportunity to bludgeon the other creature's head. Halverson had to bash the cranium four times before it cracked and he was able to make contact with brain tissue. With that, the creature crumbled on the grass near a white marble tombstone. You're worse than they are, said Reba, eyeing Halverson apprehensively. Jacked up on adrenaline, he said, You wouldn't say that if you'd seen these things in action like I have. Seeing that the guard was out of reach, the remaining creature reversed course and homed in on Halverson, who was nearer to it. Chapter 5 Creature looked like hell, Halverson noticed. One of its milky eyes was dislodged from the socket and hanging down the creature's cheek on a stalk. Sickened by the sight, Halverson wondered how the creature could see anything in the first place with those white-filmed eyes, let alone with just one eye. The creature's wardrobe was in no better shape than the creature. Its black leather bomber jacket had both of its sleeves torn. Halverson faced the guard. What's your name, by the way? Felix Ocala. Okay, Felix, that's Reba, Victoria, and Oliver Becker. I'm Chad. Becker harumped. Now that we've bonded, how do you know so much about these plague victims? Halverson could not tell him he worked for the CIA. For sure, Halverson would not tell Becker, the one-time Senate Intelligence Committee member. It was nobody's business anyway, decided Halverson. To be honest, Halverson didn't even know if his real employer, the CIA, even existed anymore. I'm a journalist, he said. I was researching the outbreak of the plague for an article I'm writing. People think the disease started in China. People? What people? Halverson had no intention of revealing his sources to Becker. The people have contacted about the disease. Becker snickered at Halverson's disingenuousness. Whatever. I don't care whether this stuff started in China or Podunk, said Reba. What are we supposed to do? How do we deal with it? Let's just get out of California, said Felix. The rest of the country is probably okay. It's not okay, said Halverson. I heard on the news the entire country is infested. Jesus Christ, then it's hopeless. I think we should head for the ocean. We could hijack a boat and head out to sea away from the infected land. Becker shook his head. First off, I don't believe anything you say. Why should we believe your cock-and-bull nonsense? This doomsday scenario you're painting is ludicrous. What we need to do is find out what's really happening. I agree with you on that, but we also need to make sure we're safe and have access to food and water. I refuse to believe it's as bad as you say it is. Halverson was getting fed up with Becker's arguing. What's your explanation for what happened? I don't know yet. I can only speculate. Maybe some kind of terrorist attack. Even if it was a terrorist attack, the fact remains this entire area is ravaged by plague. I don't accept that. Then what about those creatures you saw attacking us? You think they're just your average Joe Sixpacks? They're flesh-eating ghouls. I didn't see them eat anybody's flesh. In fact, all I saw was you bashing their brains in. You could be some homicidal maniac for all we know. 
Halverson caught Rila searching his face. Those creatures look like us, said Halverson, but they're not us. They're not human. They're not even alive. If they're not alive, how could you kill them? demanded Becker. We're going around in circles with this, said Halverson in exasperation. If you want to let those creatures eat your flesh, be my guest. If they come near me, they're going to regret it. I wish we knew where you're getting your information from, said Reba. Look at those things. Do you seriously think they're just like us? Reba padded over to one of the dead ghouls. She bent over it to get a better look at its decaying flesh. Don't get too close to it, said Halverson. Whatever you do, don't touch it. For all we know, its disease can be spread by physical contact. Reba pulled away from the thing. Granted, it's ugly, but you can't go around killing people just because they're ugly. Look at its face. How can I look at its face? You bashed its brains in. Its head is a mess. Okay, what's your explanation for what's happening? This person here on the ground probably did have some kind of disease. His skin's all discolored, and it looks like it's rotting. Maybe he had leprosy. Leprosy makes people look grotesque. That makes more sense than zombies walking around, said Becker. What about all these crashed cars and dead bodies all over the streets and sidewalks, said Halverson. Are you saying these people were all lepers? That's certainly something else entirely. That has nothing to do with these unfortunate sick people that you murdered. Halverson ran his hand down over his face in frustration. They were attacking us. None of them laid a hand on me. Fed up with arguing about it, Halverson said, The next time they attack you, I'll let them. I say we should hold you for the authorities to deal with. What authorities? Don't you realize yet what's happened here? This whole city has been wiped out by plague. That includes the authorities. I'll believe it when I see it. All you got to do is open your eyes. Can we please talk about something else, said Victoria. We need to figure out our next move, said Becker. Halverson twigged movement on the sidewalk beyond the chain-link fence. A corpse was rising jerkily from the cement. Chapter 6 Now what do you say? said Halverson, watching the cadaver rise to its feet. Becker turned to behold the figure stumbling along the fence. That poor man needs our help. Why are you just standing there? That guy was dead on the sidewalk a few seconds ago. How do you know? Maybe he was just unconscious. Look at the way he's staggering around. He'd be staggering, too, if you were regaining consciousness. Let's not jump to conclusions, said Victoria. There's a reasonable explanation for all of this. Halverson watched another corpse reanimate inside a T-boned Camaro in the street. Its face ashen, its eyes veiled by white film, the figure tripped onto the asphalt while climbing out of the car. With difficulty, the figure got to its feet again and lurched out of the road toward the graveyard. A lot of these people in their cars must still be alive, said Reba. I doubt it, said Halverson. Hunted, it could be contagious. Halverson picked up on the sudden movement of some of the creatures away from the fence. He could not understand why they would be retreating from the fence when they knew living human flesh was inside the cemetery. Help! He heard a woman cry. It sounded like her voice was emanating from the road somewhere, possibly from the interior of a car. As yet he could not make out the woman. Then he saw her. One of the creatures had a hold of her arm and was hauling her through the broken window of her tan SUV that was sandwiched between two other vehicles in the road, thirty-odd feet from the fence's gate. Incensed by the proximity of a human, other ghouls stumbled in a frenzy of bloodlust towards her. Several of them clambered over car hoods to reach the hapless woman. Clad in a loose white dress, the woman was middle-aged with auburn hair. She struggled to free her arm from the creature's grasp. Another creature snagged her arm and yanked on it. Together, the two creatures hoiked the woman's arm out of its socket. She screamed in agony as blood gushed out from her shredded shoulder. 
The ghouls lapped up the fresh hot blood that showered their fly-blown faces and writhed in ecstasy. Victoria screamed as she watched. Reba collapsed to her knees and threw up. What the hell's going on? said Felix, grimacing. A score of creatures surrounded the woman. They lunged and clawed at her. They ripped her dress off, then ripped her bloody flesh off and stuffed it into their rotting mouths. The woman was beyond help, Halverson realized. I must be going crazy, said Victoria. She held her forehead, her eyes glassy. This can't be happening. It's worse than that, said Halverson. It really is happening, and those creatures are going to come after us when they're through devouring that woman. Halverson watched in dread as more corpses became reanimated in the streets. The creatures crawled out of smashed cars and rose from the pavement and sidewalks. I don't like our chances, said Felix. More of those things are headed our way. Look at all of them, Reba said in awe. It's hopeless. The fence will hold them out for now, said Halverson. Then what? We can do it, said Becker. We'll think of something. I wonder how long we've got to live, said Felix, a dismal expression on his face. For the first time, Halverson noticed Felix had a scar about an inch long over his right eyebrow. Bank robber wannabe pistol whipped me, said Felix, as if reading Halverson's thoughts. He had a short life. A faint smile lifted the right corner of Felix's mouth. We're all going to have short lives, said Reba. How do we know we won't turn into one of those things? asked Victoria. Reba looked shocked at the idea. In fact, everyone in their group looked shaken at the prospect, Halverson saw. We can't be sure of anything, said Halverson at last. There are too many of those things, said Felix. Hundreds of the creatures were indeed swarming around the cemetery fence, lining up along the fence's entire perimeter rattling the chain links with their decomposing hands. "'Now I know how Custer felt,' said Becker. "'I know there are a lot of them,' said Halverson. "'But we still have advantages over them. We can move faster and we can think.' "'A lot of good that will do us if those things get through the fence,' said Felix. A bank of gray smoke wafted over the cemetery. Victoria coughed as the smoke burned her throat. The city's still on fire somewhere. That's one good thing about this graveyard, said Halverson. There aren't any buildings here to burn down, only grass and tombstones and tree or two, he added, taking stock of the cemetery. Hey, isn't that a motor cart over there, said Felix. That might come in handy. He loped toward the white cart that was parked along the side of one of the few narrow roads that intersected the cemetery. He scrambled into the driver's seat. Halverson figured the key must have been in the ignition because Felix started the cart right up. Felix executed a three-point turn in the street and drove toward Halverson and the others. A smile on his face, Felix parked next to them. And we got a little luck anyway. What good is that golf cart going to do us? said Reba. I'm sure we can use it for something. Yeah, I'm tired of carrying this shotgun around. Reba laid the shotgun between the motor cart's two seats. You're going to need that, said Halverson, watching her. I know where to find it. Lucky the key was in the ignition, Halverson told Felix. Whoever left it must have been in a hurry, said Felix. I still don't see how it helps us much, said Reba. It only holds two people. Maybe we can find a couple more of them around here, said Felix. Then what? We can crash through those creatures or something and get out of here, suggested Victoria. I doubt it, said Becker, who had been listening while leaning against a stone mausoleum. He angled toward them. That cart's too flimsy. And it doesn't have any windows to keep the creatures out. They'd knock it over in no time and grab us. Better than nothing, insisted Felix. Maybe now we have half a chance. We could use it to repel borders, said Halverson. If we see the fence giving way somewhere, we can get to it quickly in that cart and try to shore the fence up. With what? said Becker. We'll find something, said Victoria. 
Famous last words. I'm not going to just roll over and die, said Halverson. We'll think of something, said Victoria. I hope. Chapter 7 Lucky those things are stupid, Halverson heard Felix say. Felix was still sitting in the driver's seat of the motor cart. Halverson was trying to figure out their next move. What do you mean? asked Reba. I mean, said Felix, if they had any brains at all, they would mass themselves in one spot and knock down the fence with their combined weight. Spreading themselves out the way they're doing works in our favor, agreed Becker. They have reanimated dead brains, said Halverson. Their brains can tell them to do only one thing, eat. With his arm, Halverson wiped away the sweat that was beating on his forehead. In the excitement, he had forgotten how hot it was. Santa Ana winds were keeping the weather hot and arid. So what are we going to do? said Reba. Just stay here in this graveyard for the rest of our lives? What about food and drink? I could use some water right about now, said Becker. Halverson scouted the gently sloping hills of the cemetery. A shack in the northwest quadrant caught his eye. What about that shed, he said. There might be supplies in there for the grave diggers. I'll take a look, said Felix. He drove off in the motor cart toward the shack. If we stay here, we're just postponing the inevitable, said Victoria. It's hopeless if we stay here. If we leave here, those creatures will get us, said Becker. Halverson watched the sun setting, throwing shadows of gravestones and isolated palm trees across the cemetery. Even as the sun descended, the heat remained high. Can those things see in the dark? asked Victoria. No better than we can, answered Halverson. Are you sure of that? asked Becker. Halverson nodded. I've dealt with them before. Maybe we can sneak out of here after it gets dark, said Victoria. Problem is, we won't be able to see either, said Becker. Halverson clutched the night vision goggles that lolled from their leather strap around his neck. We have the edge with these. Are those what I think they are? asked Becker. And the gleaming orange disk of sun sank on the horizon beneath swatches of pink clouds that hovered above the orb, skewered by its golden rays. Why don't we toast marshmallows, too? said Becker, his face solemn as he grabbed a bag of pretzels from Felix. Why is everybody blaming me? said Felix. Nobody's blaming you, said Halverson. Like Reba, Halverson walked away from the group. He didn't want to become emotionally involved with these people. His recollections of his previous companions, none of whom had survived the onslaught of the plague-infected ghouls, were still fresh in his mind. On the other hand, he doubted he could go it alone. They needed each other. As a group, they might be able to survive. On their own, probably not. He recalled what Ben Franklin had said. We must all hang together, or assuredly, we shall all hang separately. It seemed to apply here. Still, he didn't want to get too close to these people. In any case, he could never allow himself to get too close to anyone on account of his profession as a secret agent for the CIA. Add the emotional aspect of having these people die on him to the brew, and he knew he had to remain aloof to maintain his sanity. There, but not there, if you will. Then again he wondered, did the CIA even exist anymore? He approached Victoria, who was watching the sunset. She seemed to be lost in a pleasurable trance. She reacted to his arrival with a brief turning of her head toward him. I used to like watching the sunset, she said. Now it looks like it might be the last one I ever see. We can't give up, he said. As long as we're alive, we have a chance. He watched the sunset with her. The gradual sinking of the sun seemed to soothe them somehow. The moment didn't last long. The jangling of the fence by the creatures became louder, as if they were becoming incited by the onset of twilight. If only those things would stop rattling that fence, said Victoria, annoyed that the creatures had broken the enchanting spell of tranquility cast by the setting sun. Halberson had to restrain his desire to start blasting the creatures with his block. There was no point in wasting ammunition on them, he knew. There were just too many of them. 
When the time came, he would have to make every shot count. Suddenly heat lightning flashed in the sky above the sunset. Halverson, who had been gazing in that direction, started. What was that? asked Victoria. Now the aliens from outer space are invading, said Felix, watching the skies. It was just heat lightning, said Halverson. I'm not so sure. With that battalion of zombies out there, how can we be sure of anything anymore? It sure feels like the world's ending, all right, said Reba. Maybe this plague stuff can infect the atmosphere somehow like it does people, said Victoria, watching the heat lightning flare up again over the horizon. That's a stretch, said Halverson. He was convinced it was merely heat lightning flashing in the sky. Whatever it was, it was making everybody edgy. Seems to be getting more hopeless by the minute, said Rila. She looked away from the sky and peered at the sneering, gaunt faces of the skunky creatures as they clawed at the fence with their putrescent fingers. I hate those things, she said. There seems to be more and more of them. Where are they all coming from? Fuck those things, said Felix. I wish I had my bodyguard here with me, said Becker. He'd know how to handle this kind of a situation. He saw action in the Iraq War. I wish he were here, too, snapped Reba. It was obvious to Halverson Becker didn't like Reba's tone. What do you mean by that? demanded Becker. I mean, I wish he was here instead of you, she said. Do you have any idea who you're talking to? I... Wait. We have to make our move. Reba screamed. Halverson looked at her. He wished he hadn't. Chapter 10 Reba's eyes were riveted on a section of the fence near the freeway, Halverson realized. He followed her gaze to a sickening sight. Somehow one of the ghouls had gotten its stomach hung up on a steel barb in a broken link on the fence. Trying to free itself, the creature was backing away from the fence, unspooling its suppurating intestines out of a gaping hole in its stomach as it shambled backward. In their frenzy to reach the fence, the creatures near the mutilated creature were swiping the length of intestines out of their way so they could get closer to the cemetery. Reba turned away and wretched. The creature with the uncoiling entrails was wearing a long, heavy black leather jacket, which looked in better shape than the thing that wore it. Halverson noticed. The ghoul had stoned out deep-set eyes and a short black beard. Trudging backward, watching its viscera uncoil, the ghoul had no idea why it could not free itself from the fence. The brunette ghoul beside Gutbuster had an erstwhile pretty face with a still intact hairdo done up on it. However, the lower half of her bee-stung lips was missing. In fact, the entire lower part of her jaw was missing. In its place were decomposing tissue and yellow snags in its discolored gums. Below the brunette's face, the sight was even more hideous, if that was possible, Halverson saw. Part of a car's engine was protruding from the brunette's ruptured stomach lining. The creature was plodding with its back hunched, thanks to the weight of the engine lodged in its belly. Even as the creature walked, oil leaked out of the engine onto the ground. Apparently, Halverson decided the woman had been killed in a car accident before her transformation into a ghoul. Can't stand looking at those things, said Reba. We have to get out of here. This is impossible, said Felix. We're fucked. We're hemmed in by those things from a freak show. Halverson wished he had a battery for his sat phone. Maybe then he could contact his boss, Deputy Director Mellers, at the National Clandestine Service at the CIA, and find out what was going on in the rest of the country, if there was a the rest of the country. For all Halverson knew, Mellers might already be dead from plague, and the entire agency staff wiped out as well. Halverson didn't get along well with the Yale-educated 46-year-old Andrew Mellers, who loved to flaunt his law degree in Halverson's face and put him down. Halverson was convinced the only one Mellers hated more than him was the director of the CIA, Ernest Slocum himself, no matter. The fact was, Halverson actually found himself longing to hear Miller's supercilious voice, anything to let Halverson know that the rest of the country still existed. 
Right now, Halverson couldn't feel more cut off from life as he used to know it. In the end, he wondered if having a battery for his sat phone would make one iota of difference. What good was a sat phone that worked if there was nobody left alive on earth to call? What if these plague-infested, grimacing creatures with thousand-yard stares were all that was left of humanity? The idea sent a frisson down his spine. He never felt more alone. Is anybody listening? said Victoria in a sonorous voice. We need to get moving. Her voice shook Halverson out of his black thoughts. Right you are, young lady, said Becker. We'll be permanent residents of this graveyard if we stay here much longer. Very funny, said Felix, not amused. We still need to create a diversion so those things won't bushwhack us when we leave through the gate, said Halverson. Diversion will just delay the inevitable, said Becker. They'll bushwhack us as soon as we drive down the sidewalk. How can they bushwhack us if they can't see us? What are you talking about? Why won't they be able to see us? We'll drive with our headlights off in the dark. Then how can we see where we're going? You need to think before you open your mouth. Becker's snide attitude was grating on Halverson's nerves. I've got these, said Halverson. He clutched his night vision goggles that dangled from his neck and jiggled them. Remember? Well, goody for you. What about the rest of us? We don't have special goggles. All of you follow me. I'll drive first. The rest of you stay close behind me. It's still dusk, said Victoria, stepping over to Halverson. We need to wait a little longer till it's night. I don't know if I can stand another minute in this place, said Reba. She wiped a thin stream of vomit off her fox-like chin. I hate the smell of puke. Smells almost as bad as those creatures. Me too, said Becker, screwing up his face. Just stay away from us so we don't have to smell it. I thought you were a politician, said Felix. Can't you think of a more diplomatic way of saying that? Why in the world would anybody vote for you? It would take a person with a certain amount of intelligence to vote for me. You don't fall into that category. A black look in his eyes, his arms straight out at his sides like two-by-fours, his fingers curled. Felix advanced on Becker. Halverson strode between them. Let's figure out what kind of diversion we're going to make. That guy needs to answer for what he said to me, said Felix. He's blowing hot air is all. That used to be his job in another life a million years ago. He needs to watch his mouth. You need to watch yours, said Becker. He was on the verge of jabbing his forefinger at Felix, but Halverson continued to stand between them. Becker lowered his hand. Felix took another step toward Becker. Halverson, Halverson. Flesh won't burn too well without an accelerant. You're giving me the creeps talking like that. You're not the only one, said Felix. I know what he wants to do, Victoria piped up. He wants to burn those creatures at the fence. Halverson nodded. Those things will flare up like torches. What we need is kerosene or gasoline. I think I saw some cans of gasoline in the shed, said Felix. Probably for the carts if they run out. Perfect. I'll check it out. Halverson clambered into a cart, fired the ignition, and started the vehicle. Instead of flicking on the headlights, he strapped the night vision goggles on his head. Cemetery took on an eerie green aspect as he viewed it through the goggles. He drove to the shed parked in front of it, and slid out of the cart. He entered the shed. As Felix had told him, there were four red metal gallon cans of gasoline in the shack. Halverson gathered the four cans and distributed them in the storage well in the back of the cart. In a span of five minutes, he was back with the others. He stopped his motor cart and doffed his NVGs from his head. He wasn't prepared for the sudden mood swing of his fellow survivors. A pall seemed to have fallen over everyone. What's the point, said Felix? If the whole country's wrecked, why go on? What are we trying to prove? If this is all we have to look forward to, what are we escaping to? Echoed Reba. If you can call it escaping. More of the same, like I said, why bother? We have to keep going, said Halverson. If we stay here... For sure, those things will crash through the fence and kill us. If the whole world's like this, we're just postponing the inevitable by going somewhere else, said Felix. We have to keep going.
Maybe the plague didn't infect everybody. Maybe we'll find survivors out there, chipped in Victoria. What if we don't, said the disgruntled Felix. Then we keep on looking somewhere else, said Halverson. We can't just stand here and wait to die. Why not? It's just as good as dying trying to escape here. What's eating you? asked Victoria. I'm just trying to look at this mess realistically. More like pessimistically, it sounds to me. We'll have a better chance of meeting other survivors if we head downtown, put in Becker. Not you again, said Reba. I thought we decided against that. Sure funeral. You're bumming me out worse than Felix is. Felix started yelling at the top of his lungs. Is there anybody else out there? The throbbing mass of undulating, sneering ghouls surrounding the fence moaned louder in response. Not you, dweebs, cried Felix. A ghoul in its eighties, it looked like to Halverson, swung a heavy wooden cane in its hand clumsily. The ghoul didn't seem to have a clue what to do with the walking stick. The creature clutched it in its hand as a habit from when it had been a man. Clad in grimy, blood-stained, torn blue jeans, the creature stood well over six feet tall and had stiff gray hair that looked like it belonged to a wire brush. Scowling, the creature glowered with its sickly, pale blue eyes at Felix. "'Looks like you made a friend,' Reba told Felix. "'Everybody can't be a zombie,' said Victoria. "'There must be other people out there, decent people.' Felix began making a weird sound. His head bowed on his chest. He clenched his head in both hands. Puzzled Halverson tried to figure out what Felix was doing. In moments it dawned on Halverson that while the guy was grasping his bowed head, he was erupting into laughter. "'This is so horrible, it's funny,' howled Felix, letting go of his head, tilting it upward, and staring into the indigo sky. Then Halverson realized Reba was laughing, too. In fact, everybody seemed amused, with the possible exception of Becker. The hilarity annoyed the zombies to no end. They shook the fence, clanging it, bending it to and fro— Impossible to describe their moans, became, well, and truly eldritch, racking everybody's nerves and dissipating whatever ambience of levity there had been moments earlier. Her face a mask of pain, Reba clasped her ears, trying to shut out the maddening clamor. It looked to Halverson like she was coming unglued. They had to get out of here. He knew before they all went nuts. If only those things would stop making that wretched dirge-like wail. Kill all zombies, he thought. Come on, he said. Let's douse those things with gasoline. Use your lights this time. We want to attract them. He hopped onto the motor cart, flicked on his headlights, and drove to the segment of the fence opposite the gate. Shaking in her funk, Reba drove after him. Felix and Victoria brought up the rear in the third cart. Becker hung back, his hands in his pockets. Where's Becker? Felix asked Victoria. She looked over her shoulder, out the back of the cart at Becker. He's staying back there, it looks like. Doesn't want to get his hands dirty like the rest of us, does he? After all, he might break into a sweat. I'm not surprised. Me either. I've always pegged politicians as free-loading bums. I wish those things would stop making that noise, Reba said, wincing. I'll make him stop, said Felix. He halted the cart in front of the fence. He grabbed his shotgun from the console in the middle of the cart and sprang to the asphalt. He trained the Mossberg on one of the lead ghouls, spread-eagled against the fence, squeezed the trigger and fired. A blast tore a gaping hole in the ghoul's stomach. Intral spilled out of the creature's bulging, shredded stomach. The creature was overweight to begin with and seemed to have an endless intestine that uncoiled onto the grass verge in a malodorous heap of putrescent necrotic tissue. But the creature kept pressing its mutilated body against the fence, exhibiting no signs of let-up. The creature had a bald head and an unkept thrust by the lights. Not all of the creatures, however, Halverson could see, were honing in on the headlights. The fence was still surrounded by ranks of the creatures, which looked to be at least three deep around its entire perimeter, though it was difficult for him to see in the twilight. The creatures didn't seem to be in any hurry to converge on the headlights. We need to burn them, he said. Felix cheered. Let's do it. Halverson heard scuffling behind him. He whirled around. He could make out a lone figure pegging toward them down the cemetery road. 
Felix belted to his cart and retrieved his shotgun. Christ, they're in the cemetery. Maybe it crawled out of a grave like that other one, said Victoria. Felix leveled his shotgun at the dark figure. Don't leave without me, cried Becker, hustling toward them, waving his hands. Felix lowered the shotgun. Gasping for breath, Becker charged up to them. He halted, leaned forward, and clutched his knees, trying to regain his breath. We weren't leaving, said Felix. Still gasping, Becker straightened up. You mean I ran all the way here for nothing? I thought you were running over to help us, said Felix. My talents don't run in that area. What talents? Halverson heard Reba mutter. He knew Becker was out of earshot. Then why'd you come over here? asked Felix. Question is, why did you all come over here? said Becker. We changed the venue of the diversion, said Halverson. Why does a journalist decide everything we do? Becker asked everyone. His plan sounds like a good idea to me, said Felix. What else can we do? That wasn't the answer Becker was looking for, Halverson could see. Don't answer a question with a question, said Becker. Halverson figured Becker was trying to sow the seeds of dissension among the group. Nobody was nibbling at his bait, Halverson was relieved to see. Not yet, anyway. Things could change rapidly, he knew, especially with the situation deteriorating among increasingly desperate individuals. You can help us burn these creatures, said Halverson. Becker didn't look interested in the prospect. Let's get moving. Who are you talking to? asked Reba. Becker said nothing. Nobody moved. Let's douse the ghouls with gas, said Halverson. He snagged one of the red metal cans of gasoline from his cart and strutted to the fence, which glinted in the headlight's beams. The grimacing, drawn faces of the creatures pressed closer to the fence as he approached. The rancid stench was overpowering. Agitated by the proximity of living human flesh, the creatures pressed harder against the fence, bending it inward toward the graveyard. A bare-chested, lean, twenty-something male, double amputee amongst the creatures, was biting a rusty chain link with its corroded chipped teeth. Tempting to tear a hole in the fence, it looked like to Halverson. The creature had inch-long stumps instead of arms connected to its shoulders. Halverson wondered if the thing had turned while it was in a hospital bed, as it had no means of bringing food to its mouth. It didn't matter whether you were healthy or handicapped, Halverson realized. The plague didn't play favorites. It took everyone exposed to it and turned them into ghouls. Halverson unscrewed the gas can's cap, glomming onto the can with both hands. Halverson swung the gas can toward the fence without releasing it. Gasoline spilled out of the can's opening and splashed onto the creature's nearest defense. The pungent, throat-constricting odor of the gasoline suffused the air, mixing with the sweetened sewage stench of the walking dead. Halverson kept swinging the gas can until he had emptied its contents onto the creature's. I need a gas mask, said Felix, and coughed as he followed Halverson's example and doused the creatures with gasoline from another can. Halverson spilled his last can of gas on a tawny, shirtless male, Hispanic ghoul, that was the handkerchief flammable. He held the makeshift torch toward Reba, who was still holding the flaming lighter. She applied the flame to the gasoline-impregnated handkerchief. The bald handkerchief ignited as Halverson held the eucalyptus sprig. He strode toward the fence and hurled the flaming clump of handkerchief over the chain-link fence into the rows of zombies. The gasoline-drenched creatures burst into flames. Bingo! cried Felix with glee, reflections of the flames gleaming in his eyes. Burn, baby, burn! yelled Reba. The creature nearest to Halverson went up in flames. It was a blonde female zombie. Its blazing hair turned black and stuck out in spikes from its burning head. The decomposing, parchment-colored flesh on its sneering face melted under the intensity of the fire's heat and resolved into a black slurry, which rilled down its skull. The stench of the creature's burning hair added to the cloying reek of death that issued from the ghouls. Ten-foot-high, crackling flames leapt from the burning creatures into the sky. The flames shot ever higher as the fire engulfed more zombies. Their bodies on fire, the creatures continued to plod heedlessly into the fence. Their flaming flesh liquefied and streamed off their skeletons to the ground. 
In minutes, nothing remained of these burning creatures except skeletons that continued traipsing forward until the very brains of the creatures were consumed in the flames and the skeletons crumpled. Halverson picked up on masses of the creatures shambling toward the bonfire as the zombies' dead flesh burned and the flames leapt higher into the night air. He realized with alarm that thanks to the increasing number of creatures attracted to the bonfire, the fence was bending further inward. It would only be a matter of minutes before the fence collapsed under the weight of the throngs of the creatures pressed against it, and they would trample it down on their way into the cemetery. We need to leave through the gate now, he said. He and the others piled into the motor carts. I hope those things aren't waiting for us there, said Victoria, who took the seat next to his. The three motor carts drove toward the gate at the east end of the graveyard. Halverson found out to his dismay that his cart could barely get up to a measly thirty-five miles per hour, even when he floored the accelerator. The other carts ran no faster, he saw. There was nothing for it. He kept driving. It turned out to be worse at the gate than he had expected. Chapter 13 a knot of zombies was still standing outside the gate, heads down. They shuffled about aimlessly. Damn, said Halverson, driving up to the gate and clapping eyes on them. The barbarians are at the gates, said Becker, pulling up behind Halverson. Seeing that the beams from his headlights were stimulating the creatures, Halverson doused his lights. He waved to the other carts behind him. Kill your lights, he told them. The other drivers followed his example. There was only one problem now. They couldn't see. How can we see where we're going? asked Felix in one of the carts. Stay close and follow me, answered Halverson. Reba watched with nodding consternation the clutch of zombies milling outside the gate. What do we do? she asked. If we go out there, we'll head straight into their arms. We have no choice, said Becker. We can't stay here. Do any of you play chess? asked Halverson. It's a great time to play chess, said Reba. Halverson ignored her sarcasm. This is what the Germans call being in Zugzwang in chess. The clock's ticking, said Felix, glancing at his wristwatch. Then he gazed anxiously at the bonfire blazing out of control at the north side of the cemetery. The chain-link fence was burning red-hot at the edge of the fire, searing the fly-bone decrepit flesh of any zombie that pressed against it. The zombie's flesh smoked as it burned, polluting the air with a stink worse than that of burning hair. "'Can we just figure out what we're going to do?' said Reba. At the end of her rope, she yanked a clump of hair out of her head. She screwed up her face at the pain in her scalp. "'Things are bad enough, Reba, without you torturing yourself,' Victoria said, biting her lower lip. "'Why are we playing chess at a time like this?' Her eyes popping out of her head, Reba inspected the bunch of hair in her hand, then tossed the hair out of the cart. To be in Zugzwang is when, no matter what move you make, it benefits your opponent, said Halverson. We're between a rock and a hard place, you mean, said Felix. Tell us something we don't know. Beautiful, said Becker. So what the hell do we do, said Reba, getting ready to tear out another clump of her hair. Halverson contemplated the gate. Standing immediately outside it was a short, thirtieth blonde female with wide hips, which made the creature look even shorter. The creature measured it the most five feet tall at that. It wore a gray blouse that had one of its long sleeves ripped off at the shoulder. At the lower extremity of the creature's putrefying exposed arm was a hand with three fingers missing. From what was left of the fingers, it looked to Halverson like the missing digits had been torn off the hand. For all Halverson knew, maybe the creature had tried to cannibalize itself and found out the hard way that necrosic, diseased flesh had no place in its diet. The ghoul had dyed blonde hair the better part of a foot long with two inches of brown hair visible at its roots. Despite the nightfall, the creature was wearing sunglasses with narrow black lenses ovoid in their length. It seemed to be sneering at Halverson with morbid, wizened lips. On account of the ghoul's shades, Halberson could not discern its eyes. He could not tell if the orbs were layered with white film like a pitchfork from his cart. I'll take care of it. Disappointed, Reba lowered her shotgun. Pitchfork in hand, 
Halverson clambered out of his cart. He angled toward the figure to confront it, his weapon poised. As Halverson came closer to the creature, he could make it out more clearly. Though after doing so, he wished he hadn't been able to. At least half of its flesh had disintegrated from its body, leaving the skeleton with its internal decomposing organs visible to the naked eye. Halverson gagged. The foogy odor of the decomposing corpse hit him like a wall of heat from an open furnace. The creature's teeth seemed to be chattering in its gaping maw. On closer inspection, Halverson observed that the teeth were in reality writhing maggots. He tried to figure out how to dispatch the creature with the pitchfork. Stalling for time, he jabbed the pitchfork's tines into the creature's half-exposed ribcage. The tines sank smoothly into the decaying organs. The thrust stymied the creature's advance as Halverson staved the thing off and decided on a method of extermination. The creature squirmed and thrashed its decomposing arms while the pitchfork impaled it. What are you waiting for? called Becker. Idiot, Halverson thought, but he didn't turn around to face him. Halverson figured the only way to kill the thing was by jamming the pitchfork through its eyes and into its reanimated brain. He wasn't sure the pitchfork's tines would penetrate the creature's skull. He would soon find out. He shoved the pitchfork farther into the creature's chest and hoiked the tool back, dislodging it from the creature. The creature stumbled backward a few steps, courtesy of Halverson's shove. Halverson took the opportunity to advance on the creature and thrust the pitchfork into the thing's poor excuse for a head, determined to direct one of the tines into the thing's eyes. He felt the tines make contact with the skull. He heard it crack. He felt it give under the impetus of the pitchfork. A small sphere popped out of the creature's head like a cork from the neck of a champagne bottle. The sphere must have been the creature's decaying eye, decided Halverson. In any case, the pitchfork proved a much better weapon than Halverson had expected. The tines penetrated the skull with relative ease, given enough thrust behind them. The creature dropped to the ground. The pitchfork, still embedded in the creature's skull, dragged Halverson toward the cadaver in its descent to the ground. Resisting a pull of the tool's haft, Halverson wrestled the pitchfork out of the skull. He retreated from the stiff. He heard a booming noise. He started, instantly alert. He squinted in the direction of the clamor. The fence near the bonfire was collapsing. A horde of creatures was trampling it to the ground as they stormed into the graveyard. Chapter 14 Halverson felt his mind fogging up. Faced with overwhelming odds, his mind seemed to be seizing up. He knew he had to do something, though. Staying here meant certain death. Once the creatures started spilling into the graveyard, they would be impossible to stop, he knew. There appeared to be thousands of them stumbling and falling all over each other in their dogged attempts to enter the graveyard. Throngs of hungry, flaming zombies trampled the chain-link fence into the ground and lumbered into the cemetery, bent on consumption. The creatures in the foremost ranks were still ablaze. The ones in subsequent ranks remained unscathed by the bonfire. It made no difference whether the creatures were burning or not, Halverson saw. They all just kept pouring through the breach in the fence willy-nilly. The severity of his and his companion's plight finally got through to Halverson's misting mind. He kicked himself into action. He pelted for his vehicle. He climbed into the driver's seat of the motor cart. Not with all these creatures swarming around them. Is it worth dying for? Who said anything about dying? said Becker. We take what we can, then scram before the things overrun us. Halverson shrugged. Sure neck. Does that mean you're not coming with us? I don't think it's worth the risk. Then count you out? Halverson thought it over. We need to stick together. I'm with you for now. As soon as I see too many creatures coming toward us, though, I'm splitting. Fair enough. We'll all be splitting. 
The commotion caused by the fence's collapse seemed to agitate the creatures roaming outside the gate. They gazed with their thousand-yard stares at the flaming zombies that were stampeding into the north end of the cemetery. Time to go, said Halverson, sliding into his motor cart's driver's seat beside Victoria. He laid the pitchfork on the center console alongside a spade and a shovel. I'm going first, he told the others. Why you, said Becker. Because I've got the NVGs. Why do you get them? Halverson didn't feel like arguing with Becker. Instead, Halverson waved dismissively at him. Becker waved in disgust back at him. Becker had a spade and two shovels in his cart, Halverson saw. In the third cart, Felix was driving and Reba was riding shotgun. They had a spade, a shovel, and a pitchfork in their vehicle, along with Felix's Glock and Reba's Mossberg shotgun. I'm going second, said Becker. Remember, said Halverson, no lights and no guns unless it's an emergency. He donned the night vision goggles on his head. What's causing this to happen? asked Victoria at her wit's end, checking out the creatures swarming over the crushed fence and heading their way. The steady tramping, shuffling of their dead feet, multiplied by their countless numbers, sent a chill down her spine. Plague, answered Halverson. But why is this plague happening now, ruined chest? Creature toppled to the side of the cart and hit the road on its side, transfixed on the spade. Once on the asphalt, the creature kept moving, kicking its legs and rotating like an uncoordinated brake dancer. Halverson could care less, as long as the thing was out of his way. Staying on the sidewalk, he drove past the wretched creature, the other two carts in tow. An eerie electronic green and black landscape unfolded before Halverson as he peered through the goggles, casting around for Felix's armored truck. He discerned isolated zombies scattered in the distance. They couldn't see him, and they seemed oblivious to the motor carts approaching them. Several of the creatures were mooching through the maze of wrecked vehicles parked on the road. Still others roamed the sidewalks that skirted the fence. Where the hell was the armored truck? wondered Halverson. Must be nearby. Where's the truck? asked Becker behind him, as if reading Halverson's mind. Halverson clapped eyes on it. There it is. Let's go, then. There's a problem. What? There's not enough room on the road for us to use these carts to reach the truck. So what? said Felix, overhearing Halverson and Becker. We park on the sidewalk, walk over to the truck unloaded, and bring the money bags over here. Except for one thing, said Halverson. Now what? said Becker. I count five of those things wandering around the truck. Chapter 15 Let's just forget it, said Victoria beside Halverson. Halverson slowed his vehicle to a halt. No, said Felix, we can still do it. We'll take our weapons with us. Hold down your voice, whispered Halverson. Those things will hear us and come over here. Felix halted his vehicle and dismounted from it. He hauled a pitchfork from the cart. I'm going, he said. Are any of you coming? I'm coming, said Reba. She withdrew a spade, knocking it loudly against the cart. Pitchfork penetrated the back of the creature's head lower than he had intended for it, into the neck and jawline, and angled upward but missed the brain. He felt the creature struggling at the end of the pitchfork. The wooden helve shook in his hands as the creature tried to free itself from the steel prongs embedded in the back of its neck and jaw. Halverson fought to retain his grasp on the pitchfork's handle. Impaled on the pitchfork, the creature could not turn around to face him. Halverson knew he had no other choice but to withdraw the trembling pitchfork from the creature's neck and try once again to transfix its brain. Halverson braced himself. He rent the pitchfork from the creature's neck. The prongs squelched as they slid out of the putrefied flesh and cartilage. The creature stumbled around to breast Halverson. The lower half of its decomposing face now had three gaping holes in it where the prongs had run it through. Halverson could not stand the sight of the thing any longer. Swearing, he reared back and thrust the pitchfork into the creature's head at eye level. Creature reeled back, its face impaled on the tines. 
He had just missed the eyes, Halverson realized. However, he saw that he had contrived to ram one prong between the eyes and in this fashion had destroyed the brain. He jabbed the pitchfork back and forth inside the creature's head to make sure the brain was pulverized. As the creature collapsed, Halverson withdrew the pitchfork's prongs from its head. He had to jigger the handle to free the prongs. They'd gotten stuck in the skull thanks to the angle of the tilting cadaver exerting pressure on them. Only three more of those things in the immediate vicinity to worry about, decided Halverson. But had any of the swarming mob from the cemetery reached Victoria and the carts on the sidewalk yet? He knew he and the others had no time to dilly-dally. Felix reached the back of the truck. He unlocked the door. He swung the door open, climbed into the truck, and rummaged through the gold-striped blue nylon money bags piled on the floor. Reba approached the tailgate. Felix left have vacated the area. He did a 360 and came up empty. Where the hell had it gone, he wondered. He watched the throngs of creatures lumbering through the cemetery, tripping over tombstones and trampling over each other in their eagerness to forage. It didn't look like they had spotted Victoria. At this point, they didn't seem to have any goal other than to explore the entire cemetery. We're almost at the carts, he said over his shoulder in a low voice to the others. The vanguard of the creatures would reach the open gate in this chain-link fence soon, Halverson realized, and then they would spill through it onto the sidewalk and street. He wanted the motor carts to be on the move before that happened. Halverson stepped onto the sidewalk, followed by the others. We need to pack up and get moving. Becker, Reba, and Felix loaded their money bags into the backs of their carts. Things aren't here yet, said Felix, dumping the last of his four money bags onto his cart. There's still more money in the truck. I'm going back. There isn't time, said Halverson. You don't have to come with me. I know the way. Those things will be here before you get back. We only got a couple million bucks so far, and there's millions more in the truck, and at least three more of those creatures prowling around the truck. They can't reach me. The way those things move, they couldn't even catch my grandma. Is anyone else coming with me? I think we should leave now, said Reba. She glanced apprehensively toward the graveyard. It'll only take me a couple of minutes. I could use help carrying the other money bags. We need to go, said Halverson. There's no telling what we're going to run into up ahead. We left our weapons behind at the truck, too, remember? We don't have time to get them. We still have some weapons left in the carts. There was no reasoning with him, Halverson realized. Felix bolted off the sidewalk into the hugger-mugger of car wreckage on the street. We'll wait for you, Becker called after he lost a step, but kept coming. Halverson realized he must have missed the brain. He yanked the pitchfork's prongs out of the creature's head, then thrust them back at its eyes, smashing through the lenses of its crazed spectacles. One of the prongs pierced the festering eye. Halverson jabbed the prongs to the hilt into the brain. Not knowing the creature was behind her, Reba let out a scream of shock and surprise as the ghoul crumpled to the sidewalk. As she screamed, Felix came barging onto the sidewalk, a money bag in his hand. "'Where's the rest of it?' demanded Becker. "'You said there was more than one bag. I had to leave them.' "'Why?' "'One of those things ambushed me at the truck,' said Felix, hurling the money bag into the back of his cart. "'Where are the rest of the bags?' He snapped, noticing that two of the money bags were missing from his cart. "'Put them in my cart. There's more room in my cart.' Felix glared at Becker. It's my money. It belongs to all of us. We're all in this together. We all helped you. Felix didn't look convinced of Becker's sincerity. As long as you don't have any plans of your own. What's that supposed to mean? We don't have time to argue about this, Halverson chimed in. What took you so long? he asked Felix. I told you not to use your gun. I didn't have any choice. One of those things ambushed me when I was leaving with the money bags. I had to drop the bags and fight the thing off. Why did you shoot it? You could have used your spade. A fucking dirty thing bit me. It wouldn't let go of me. I had to shoot it. I kept shooting it and shooting it. It wouldn't let go till I blew its brains out. Why did it bite you? asked Reba, dumbfounded. Haven't any of you been paying attention, said Halverson, growing impatient. Those things eat people. That's all they do. He faced Felix. You said it bit you? 
Yeah. Felix rubbed his arm in a bloody sleeve. Now I'll need a tetanus shot. Its teeth were filthy. You know, crammed against the chain-link fence and rattling irresistibly as he drove by them. Alverson ignored the racket. His immediate concern was the three creatures on his left who were closing ground on him. No matter how much he wanted to use his glock on them, he knew he could not without exacerbating the zombies in the cemetery. If they became agitated enough, they might be able to trample over the fence, pinning them in. With all those zombies converging on them, Halverson knew he and his group would have no chance. The three creatures on his left moving in on him were another story. They had to be dealt with, he knew. They were now approaching him in tandem. He snagged a shovel that lay on the console to his right. As he gripped the steering wheel in his left hand, he took aim at Juicehead with his right. Driving near Juicehead, Halverson jabbed the steel blade of the shovel into Juicehead's gawking mouth. The shovel in its mouth, Juicehead stumbled backward into its companions, Black Beret and Pinky. Propelled by the motion of the motor cart, the shovel continued shoving all three of the creatures until they toppled like ten pins. Victoria clapped her hands and cheered. Strike! she cried. He wrested the shovel from Juicehead's mouth as the creature fell. He knew the three weren't dead, but they would burn a lot of time trying to stand up, what with their lack of coordination. By then, Halverson and the other carts would be safely past them. But there was more trouble up ahead. Chapter 18 Two creatures had a woman pinned on the sidewalk. They were crouching over the massive hole in her stomach, plucking out internal organs and gobbling them down. One had a hold of a kidney, looked like to Halverson, and was raising it to its yawning mouth. The other creature was chewing on a bloody lung. He glanced at Victoria when he heard her gasp. White-faced, she looked like she was going to be sick. Wrapped in their meal, the creatures didn't even look up as Halverson drove toward them. They were blocking the sidewalk. He could not pass them. He stopped the cart, grabbed the pitchfork this time, hurled out of his seat, and charged the two feasting creatures. The first one was a male with a melon-shaped head, pitchfork in hand. Halverson lunged at the creature's head as it scarfed down the kidney. Halverson thrust the pitchfork's prongs through one of the creature's eyes, killing it. Halverson jerked the prongs out of the creature's brain and stormed toward the remaining creature, a female, who was tearing out chunks of the lung with its jagged, festering teeth said held the lung with two hands. The creature was a short, overweight teenager wearing a tattered red sweater. Its straight, thick black hair bracketed its sneering face like a window's drawn curtain. Aroused by disgust for the monster, Halverson plunged the pitchfork too abruptly at the thing and pierced its throat instead of his intended target, its head. The creature flinched from the blow. Other than that, the ghoul didn't care. Skewered by the pitchfork's prongs in its throat, the ghoul continued to chow down the lung that was oozing blood all over its mouth. Alverson hoiked the prongs out of the creature's throat and rammed them with such adrenaline-charged force into the creature's head that he split the skull in half at eye level and raised the pitchfork in the air with the top half of the creature's skull impaled on the prongs. Alverson had to climb out of his motor cart to clean the mass of carnage and gore off the sidewalk so he could resume driving. Becker pulled up behind Halverson's cart. What's the problem? We need to get these corpses off the sidewalk. Why? We don't have time for this. Three of those things are coming at us from behind. Let's go around this mess. Was Becker really as dense as he sounded, wondered Halverson. Can't you see there's no room? The remaining stump of arm on the old woman and helped him and Felix drag the body off the sidewalk and into the road. The way was clear. Felix and Reba darted back to their carts. Halverson caught sight of the pallid Victoria bowed over the road, her hands on her knees trying to collect herself. He gathered her and hustled her back to their cart. She managed to climb into her seat without his help. He fired the ignition. He put the cart into gear. He accelerated. He could not believe what he saw coming at him through the darkness on the sidewalk ahead. Chapter 19 
Wearing khaki Bermuda shorts and an Abercrombie and Fitch t-shirt, a teenager was rollerblading down the sidewalk toward Halverson. The youth was flailing his hands at his sides as if trying to maintain his balance. Halverson could not figure out if the teen was human or had turned. The characteristic stumbling of the creatures wasn't visible in the teen as he wasn't walking. Two, Halverson could not clearly discern the teenager's eyes. He could not tell if they were clouded with white film. Halverson did not know what to do. He didn't want to run into the teen if he was a living human being. Halverson had to make up his mind quickly. His mouth gaping, the teen was having trouble steering the rollerblades, Halverson noticed. In fact, the teen was rolling forward like a runaway train, it looked like to Halverson. To Halverson, it suggested the teen was a creature. Halverson needed to make sure, though, before he attempted to whack the teen. Hello, Halverson called out. Who are you talking to? asked Victoria, facing him. She returned to peering at the sidewalk up ahead, trying to discern somebody in the blackness as the wind rushed into her face through the open windshield. Somebody's coming toward us, Halverson told her. The teen didn't answer Halverson's salutation and continued to thrash with his arms as he skated on the sidewalk directly toward Halverson's cart. The teen wasn't actually. He turned his head to the left to see someone clambering over a sports car's roof making toward the sidewalk. Help! The man cried as he landed on the side of the sports car nearest Halverson. He waved in Halverson's direction. Halverson slowed his cart. His face a mask of terror. The thirtyish man barreled out from the crashed cars. He waved arms at Halverson to flag him down. Halverson figured the guy had to be human. Those things are coming after me, the man told Halverson, drawing up to Halverson's side. The guy had a bald head, large ears, and a flaxen mustache. His white button-down shirt was torn with the shirt tails hanging out of his dark trousers. But Halverson didn't detect any blood on it, leading Halverson to hope that the man hadn't been bitten and infected by a ghoul. There's room in the cart behind me, said Halverson. Thanks, said the man. Becker's cart pulled to a halt behind Halverson's. What's a delay? demanded Becker. The bald man dashed toward Becker's cart. He snatched the money bag that was in the car's passenger seat and tossed the bag into the back. Becker's eyes widened at the sight. He looked none too pleased to accept a passenger. What are you trying to do? asked Becker as the man sat next to him. They said I could ride with you, answered the man. I couldn't fit in the seat with that bag in it. He can help us, Halverson told Becker. Becker shook his head, but made no attempt to deny the man a seat. For that matter, he made no attempt to welcome the man either. The only concession Becker granted the new addition to the retinue was asking him his name. Hank Mannering, replied the man. He held out his hand for Becker to shake. Becker didn't take the cue. He continued driving. Irked at the slight, Mannering managed to shrug it off. You look familiar, he added, squinting at Becker. I'm Oliver Becker. Oh, yeah, you look like somebody on TV. Glad I didn't recognize you on account of seeing you in a mugshot. What's that supposed to mean? asked Becker, training a cursory glare at Mannering. Sort of an inside joke. I'm a police officer. Ah, said Becker, not amused. Why aren't you in uniform? I was off duty when this catastrophe, or whatever it is, happened. We believe it's the plague, chipped in Halverson, overhearing them. That's what he says, anyway, Becker told Mannering. Moments later, Halverson could see why Mannering had looked so terrified when he pelted out from the cars. Clad in a black jacket and black pants, a female ghoul about five three came lurching out between the fenders of two cars parked in tandem on Wilshire. Eerie in the extreme, the creature had black eyes with white film on them. It wore its brunette hair so tightly bound to its head that the hair looked like an Olympic swimmer's cap. To complete the intimidating and grotesque effect of its face, the ghoul had a long hooked nose that dominated its hatchet face that bore a get percha complexion. But that was nothing compared to the fearsome aspect of the lower portion of the face. Below the ghoul's nose was a mortifying mouth with wasted lips and yellow snaggle teeth that clamped an amputated hand. The creature was munching on the bleeding hand as it barged out of the road toward the sidewalk. Blood streamed out of the corners of the creature's mouth and down its desecrated neck. 
Christ, said Becker. Let's get out of here. Alverson didn't need to be told twice. He was already peeling off down the sidewalk when he heard Becker's voice screaming behind him. Becker shifted into first gear and sped after Halverson. Felix and Reba were right behind Becker. Chapter 20 Off to his left, out of the corner of his eye, Halverson could see scattered creatures worming through the maze of junked cars on Wilshire. As long as the creature Christ was all Becker could think of to say. When Mannering opened his eyes, he glimpsed the tools that lay in the middle of the cart. What are those for? Weapons. Mannering nodded. I wish I had my six sour, or my M-16. Could blow the crap out of those things. He ran his eyes along the hafts of the tools to the back of the cart and saw the money bags. What's in those bags? Becker didn't answer off the bat. He knew Mannering was a cop, and regardless, he didn't want to cut another partner in on the take. Dirty laundry, Becker said at last. Mannering snickered. Are we going to a laundromat? Halverson could hear them over the south purr of the motor carts. In fact, these carts were so quiet he wondered if they were half electric. It wouldn't surprise him if they were. That was the last thing they needed, he decided. Listening to Mannering, letting a cop in on the swag. He doubted Mannering believed the bags contained laundry. Halverson wasn't going to worry about it. The zombies demanded his immediate attention. Everything else was an afterthought. A spanking new, cream and brown Lincoln Continental was parked in the road up ahead. A middle-aged woman with short, brunette, curly hair was grappling with creatures in the front seat. She contrived to stick her head out the open passenger window. She wore smoke-tinted sunglasses whose lenses changed their hue depending on the amount of sunlight striking them. Short and pudgy, she wore a Gucci white blouse and a buttonless Versace black silk moire vest. At least three creatures that Halverson could see were sharing the spacious Lincoln with her. They were dividing her between them. The woman's black eyes bulged out of her face. Heavily made up with false eyelashes and mascara, she had a florid complexion and a carbuncled nose indicating her fondness for booze. Whether she was drunk now or not made no difference to the ghouls. They pawed at and tore her blouse, ripped it off, and started yanking her arms out of their sockets. One creature took a bite out of her wrist and spat her platinum diamond-encrusted Patek Philippe watch out of its bloody mouth. Sickened by the sight, Halverson felt his heartbeat accelerating and his blood pressure soaring. He told himself to keep cool. Terrified on the verge of passing out, the woman screamed as blood spurted from her shredded and now empty arm socket. Her head out the window, she screamed for help as another creature chomped her throat. Blood spurted out of her severed cartridge artery and gushed all over the Tiffany diamond necklace adorning her throat, splattering the dashboard and headliner, and the cream leather seats of her Lincoln with metallic crimson. Hysterical, she screamed for help. Two of the creatures acted like a tag team. The creature biting into her throat kept gnawing through it like a beaver gnawing a tree bowl, while the other creature snared the woman's head and hiked it off her blood-soaked neck that had been reduced to threads of tattered flesh and cartilage. Victoria heard the woman shriek. What's that? I can't see. The ghouls got her, said Halverson. He kept driving. He wondered how many more atrocities he would have to witness before the night was done. He didn't know how many more he could stomach. All he knew was he was still alive. For how much longer he didn't know. He floored the accelerator. He reached the Pulvoda de Boulevard, the eight lanes of Wilshire were still clogged with abandoned cars. He decided to head north on Sepulveda, which was a narrow street that contained less cars than Wilshire. He stayed on the congestion-free sidewalk for now. The cemetery fence skirted the eastern side of Sepulveda. Most of the zombies that had lined the outside of the chain-link fence were now shoehorned into the cemetery, having been attracted by the bonfire. They seemed to be driven by a herd instinct, decided Halverson. In any case, now but a few creatures roamed around the sidewalk outside the fence. Halverson reached a narrow street that was perpendicular to Sepulveda, and heading west underneath the freeway. On his right he noticed that the street issued from the gated cemetery. Victoria noticed the same thing. 
We could have come out this way and saved ourselves some time, she said. With these NVGs, Halverson could see that the cemetery gate had a padlock on it, except that the gate has a lock on it. Whereas once the zombies were lining the outside of the fence, trying to get inside it, they were now lining the inside of it, pressing against it to get out. Good, said Victoria. The cemetery can be their cage. That's where those things belong. Three of the creatures mooched along the sidewalk. They must have spotted the approaching motor cart, decided Halverson, because they began heading for him. Chapter 21 He hung a left onto the road that issued from the cemetery and drove west. Becker and the others followed him. The creature's halting lurches were no match for the motor carts, which easily outstripped the dead things. The narrow road that led into the Veterans Administration grounds was all but deserted. Looking lost, isolated creatures roamed around the grounds. Halverson kept bearing west. Do you know where we're going? asked Victoria. I'm heading west. What will we find there? I don't know, but we can't stay here, not with those things all over the place. We have to go somewhere. I hate those things, she said, noticing one staggering some ten feet away from them. He said nothing. It feels like we're going around in circles, she said. Maybe they were, he decided. It was difficult to tell where he was headed in the surreal green and black world he was trying to negotiate wearing his night vision goggles. We're okay, he said. We really don't have any chance at all, do we? Chance of what, he said, pretending not to understand her drift. Chance of getting out of this alive? Those creatures are everywhere. Halverson heard Becker toot his horn behind him. Halverson glanced in the rearview mirror and saw Becker waving at him. Halverson slowed his vehicle to a halt under the freeway overpass. Becker stopped next to him. Do you have any idea where you're going? demanded Becker. We're heading west, answered Halverson. We need some kind of plan, said Mannering. We're heading west to see if anyone else is still alive. We can get a boat on the ocean if everybody we run into is infected. We've got a problem, said Reba, who was sitting next to Felix in the third cart. Halverson looked at her. Felix's wound is infected, she went on. We need antibiotics for it. Indeed, Felix looked white-faced, Halverson could see. I'm okay, said Felix. Reba looked at Felix and back at Halverson. He's not okay. He needs meds. He's got the plague, said Halverson. Meds won't help him. How do you know? You're not a doctor, are you? No. Then you don't know. We can't just do nothing and let him die from a stupid bite. It's not like we have a choice. Reba shook her head. We need to get to a hospital or a pharmacy somewhere to get antibiotics. I'm not going to die from a little bite, said Felix. It's just a wound. Then why do you look like shit? Thank you very much. If the rest of the world is like this, then what's the point, said Manning? We might as well find the nearest gin mill and get tanked. We can't give up, said Halverson. If we give up, what's the point of anything? You sound like one of those self-motivational speakers that get all the megabucks. You sound like a rummy. Good you to knock it off, said Victoria. This isn't getting us anywhere. We need to stay focused on what we're doing. What are we doing? asked Becker. We need a plan, said Mannering. That's our problem. We don't have a plan. Told you already, said Halverson. We're going to the ocean. Not before we get meds, said Reba. Even if Felix is beyond help, said Becker. We don't know that. You wish I was beyond help, Felix snarled at Becker. Then you could try being the alpha male without me around. I don't have to try anything, said Becker. I already know it. You don't know Jack. You're out of your head. The disease is affecting your mind. The UCLA Medical Center is near here in Westwood, pointed out Mannering. Forget it, said Halverson. The whole complex is overrun with ghouls. How do you know? I just came from there. I was supposed to meet my brother there. It's infested. There's hospitals in Santa Monica, then. Pharmacies, too, said Reba. 
What kind of medicine are we looking for? asked Becker. I'd see anything with penicillin in it, said Mannering. That's still the antibiotic of choice. What makes you an expert? asked Weba. We had to take courses in emergency care in the LAPD, CPR, and stuff like that. They told us to treat infections with penicillin. What if you're allergic to penicillin like me? They recommend sulfur drugs if penicillin can't be used. Okay. Then that's what we do next. We round up penicillin and sulfur drugs and treat Felix's wound. Felix rolled up his sleeve and glanced at his wound. He winced. It was turning black and festering. He wrinkled his nose in disgust at the stench emanating from the discolored flesh. Drugs aren't going to save him, said Halverson. We already had this argument, said Reba. We're not going to give up on him. All he needs is meds. Which way do we go to get them? There's a drugstore on Wilshire near Federal, said Mannering. Then let's get going. I don't know about you guys, but a cold beer would hit the spot right about now after what I've been through. Mannering licked his lips. We don't have time, said Halverson. We need to make contact with other people and try to find out what flesh of its now deformed leg. On closer inspection, Halverson realized the creature wasn't wearing shorts. It was wearing shredded slacks whose legs had torn off at mid-thigh somewhere along the line. Supine, the creature squirmed on the road as it tried to lever itself up with spasmatic jerks of its arms. Its bootless thrashing reminded Halverson of a bug on its back, trying to right itself. The better part of five feet away, another creature thudded on the asphalt after plummeting from the overpass. Halverson darted back to his vehicle. He put the cart in gear and steered around the creature in his path. Halverson knew the cart was too small and didn't have big enough wheels to run over the thing. What he had to do now was to get out from under the overpass before too many of the ghouls dropped off the bridge and blocked the road. Just another obstacle, decided Halverson. That was what life gave you. Obstacles. As he drove out from under the bridge, a creature crashed not more than a foot away from the cart's right front fender. He was so close to the creature he could feel a rush of wind stirred by the creature's fall. Victoria jumped in her seat and let out a cry of alarm. Halverson kept driving, the other two carts in tow. He drove along the narrow winding roads through the hilly Veterans Administration complex. Hardly any traffic dotted the roads here. The VA buildings looked like dark behemoths beached on the sweeping grounds. He wondered if anybody was alive in them. Or were they infested with ghouls? He could see no movement in the darkened windows. He wondered if any of the buildings had medicine. They must, since there was a VA hospital here somewhere. He stopped his cart. Where are you stopping? asked Victoria. The other carts pulled up behind him. That's a problem, demanded Becker. They might have meds here at the VA hospital, said Halverson. Yes, yeah, said Mannering. But where is that? This place has a maze, especially in the dark. He could not see the baby either. Why wasn't the baby crying, he wondered. Wouldn't it be upset, riding around in the pitch-dark night? Then again, maybe the baby was asleep. In mid-stride, Halverson realized he hadn't taken a weapon other than his automatic with him. If he used the pistol, the gunshots would attract ghouls from pillar to post. He belted back to the cart to collect the pitchfork, just in case the woman was infected. His hand on the pitchfork's haft, he heard Victoria scream. Chapter 23 The hood had fallen from the young mother's face, Halverson could see. He could also see why Victoria had screamed. The young mother was one of the walking dead. Its twisted, decomposing face looked like it had less than half its flesh remaining on the skull. A toothy rictus with blood seeping out its corners gaped where once the mouth was. The creature had released its grasp on the pram and was shambling toward Victoria, who had stopped dead in her tracks. Meanwhile, the blue baby carriage was kept trundling down the sidewalk. Victoria looked as if she wanted to rescue the errant pram, but in a funk she could not move as she watched the creature in the stained, mottled pink hoodie closing in on her. Halverson figured the brown stains were probably dried blood. Pitchfork in hand, he barreled at the ghoul to intercept it before it reached Victoria. 
who continued to stand staring blankly like a deer caught in headlights. The thing grabbed her arm with one of its withered hands. Its dirty, claw-like fingers circled Victoria's wrist. The creature widened its decrepit mouth, fixing to bury its broken yellow fang-like teeth into Victoria's neck. Nearing her, the creature lowered its head toward her to take a bite out of the pulsing white flesh of her throat. Still, Victoria stood her ground as if transfixed, in a small clump of gray brain matter. Halverson had thrust the pitchfork with such force that it took off the back of the pram after it skewered the tiny creature's head. He jerked the pitchfork free from the carnage. He brought his hand down over his goggles. He didn't know how much more of this he could take. Was there no end to this nightmare, he wondered. How many more of these god-awful things were out there? Even as he removed his hand from his goggles, he glimpsed a knot of the creature staggering toward him, across the grassy knoll that bordered the sidewalk. He snagged Victoria's arm and pegged toward the motor car. We have to get out of here. Her face ashen, she was still trying to recover from the shock of seeing the baby that had been transformed into a ghoul. Are you two finally through playing house? cried Becker. Halverson needed to muster all his willpower to constrain his urge to tear Becker's head off. How about giving us a hand, said Halverson. Becker sneered. What are you doing, groping her after you played house with her? Again, Halverson had to restrain himself from planting a fist upside Becker's head. Instead of punching Becker, Halverson had to console himself with saying, That's more up your alley, according to the papers. Yeah, chirped in Reba, turning on Becker. You ought to know all about groping and sicker stuff like that. The only thing Becker wanted to grope was Reba's ass. It was the first thing he had noticed about her when he met her. She had an ass on her that wouldn't quit. How could he help but notice it with those skin-tight stretch pants she was wearing? He could clearly see her panty lines. What happened? Felix asked Halverson. The mother and the baby were both infected, answered Halverson, walking past him. Is she okay? Felix asked, indicating Victoria, noticing her pallor. She's fine, considering what we just saw, answered Halverson. Felix didn't look too good himself, noted Halverson. Halverson and Victoria returned to their vehicle and climbed into it. Could we all get a move on before we end up being zombie food, said Becker. Halverson ignored Becker, fired the ignition, and put the motor cart in gear. We're just wasting time going to the pharmacy, Halverson confided to Victoria. We need to treat Felix's wound, she said. Won't do him any good. We're going to have to kill him. Are you crazy? Victoria said appalled. He's going to turn into one of those things. Not if we get some penicillin for him. I'm just letting you know what's going to have to be done eventually, like it or not. I can't believe you can just sit there, coldly plotting to kill him, like you're a judge, jury, and executioner. This has nothing to do with justice. Victoria screwed up her face in puzzlement. Then why? It can't be helped. We're not killing anybody, she said with finality. Halverson knew better, but he didn't press the point. You want a bigger share of the money, that's what it is, she added with reproach. Without Felix, you get more for yourself. It's not what it is. Ask yourself, what good is that money now that society's collapsed and everybody's infected? We don't know that. This plague could be isolated to this area. That money is more of a burden to us than anything. It slows us down. It still doesn't give you the right to kill Felix. I'm letting you know what's going to happen, that's all. If you want to live in denial, that's up to you. She looked at him like he had flipped out. They reached Wilshire Boulevard five odd minutes later. They drove onto the sidewalk and made for Federal Avenue. Halverson reached Federal. He stopped the cart. He could see the pharmacy building across the intersection. There was only one problem. The intersection was crammed with derelict cars. From here, they couldn't drive to the pharmacy. Chapter 24 Becker and Felix drove up to Halverson's motor cart. 
Where's the pharmacy? asked Felix, squinting in the dark, surveying the environs. I don't see any pharmacy, said Becker. Halverson pointed across the intersection to the fifteen-story high-rise that housed the pharmacy on its first floor. He didn't know if they could see the building without NVGs. We can't drive through that mess in the intersection, said Felix. Halverson twigged a twenty-something clean-cut male trying to find his way out of the car-congested intersection toward the sidewalk Halverson was parked on. Clad in a bespoke gray two-button cotton and linen jacket, by Bottega Venata and Charcoal Gray, silk and cotton trousers by Dolson Garbana. He looked like a fashion model that had walked straight out of the advert pages of Esquire magazine, except for one thing. The flesh on the left side of his handsome face was missing. Where the flesh had once been, there were now suppurating jelly-like strings dangling from the guy's skull. Halverson didn't even want to think about what those strings were made of. The thing managed to find its way out of the obstacle course of motor vehicles and lurched onto the sidewalk in its suede monk-strapped Santani shoes. Halverson could now see that the creature's jacket was wrinkled and streaked with grime. Its trousers were soaked with motor oil. Its tongue was sticking out of its sneering mouth. What was left of its tongue, anyway? Only half the tongue remained, and it was leathery and blue, and shredded at the end. Some time ago, when it was feeding on human flesh, the creature must have devoured the other half of its poor excuse for a tongue. A fashionista zombie was the last thing Halverson wanted to see. All dressed up with no place to go, said Becker. The sight of the thing revolted Halverson. He snagged a spade from his cart, charged the creature, and thrust the spade's steel blade into the creature's cranium at a dead run. The force of the blow blew out the back of the creature's skull. Along with the skull, a nearly severed blob of brain matter the size of half a grapefruit soared through the air into the street and landed on a maroon jaguar's windshield. Wearing an aqua pinafore, a six-year-old girl who wore her blonde tresses in a page boy cut screamed as a creature ripped one of her arms out of its socket while she stood near the jaguar. The girl relapsed into shock. She fell to the asphalt in a puddle of fresh blood that was gushing from her dismembered trunk. The creature crouched over her and began tearing apart her dress and disemboweling her. Luckily, decided Halverson, Victoria and Reba couldn't see the atrocity being committed in the intersection. Unluckily, he could, because he was wearing the NVGs. It was too late to save the girl, he knew. Even now, the thing was feeding on the hapless girl's entrails, stuffing them into its face like there was no tomorrow. Excuse me, said Becker. Can somebody tell me how we're going to drive across the street to the pharmacy? I could do with the Tums after seeing that zombie clothes horse. We'll have to drive around, said Halverson. We could leave the carts here and walk through the intersection, suggested Mannering. But we're going to have to get on the other side of the Federal and keep going down Wilshire, no matter what we do. Want to vote on it? I'm not leaving my cart anywhere, said Felix. If you want to leave your cart, be my guest. Take it easy, said Manning. It's just a cart. It's a big deal. Right now it's the only means of escape we had, said Felix, careful to avoid telling Mannering about the sacks of money stashed on the carts. Halverson picked up on another creature, plodding through the wreckage of cars toward him. To complement its swarthy complexion, the middle-aged creature had black hair and a salt-and-pepper beard about half an inch in length, clinging to its face like moss. The creature wore silver-framed spectacles, black shoes, and a Tommy Bahama Aloha shirt, with saucer-sized canary yellow and glacious flower patterns on it. But the creature had no sense of style. Its Aloha shirt was tucked in. The thing ought to be shot for its dearth of fashion sense alone, decided Halverson. Another male creature popped up behind Aloha shirt. This thirty-something creature wore an olive drab T-shirt and blue jeans. A protuberant bent aquiline nose seemed to weigh so much that it dragged the creature's head down. A slug-like gob of spit was lolling out of the corner of the undead thing's sneering, fungus-riddled mouth. 
Halverson couldn't imagine what jobs these creatures had as human beings. The bearded guy could have passed for a shrink. In the end, it didn't matter. They had to be killed or avoided. Mannering snagged a spade from Becker's cart. Let me handle these clowns. Be my guest, said Halverson. Spade in hand, Mannering confronted a Aloha shirt as it mounted the sidewalk. Mannering thrust the spade into Aloha shirt's throat with such vehemence that the spade beheaded the creature. The bearded head went flying through the air and thumped on the sedan's hood, rolling along the metal and fell off onto the ground. The creature's body collapsed. Halverson could see the head opening and closing its jaws as it lay on the asphalt. The head was still alive, Halverson realized, but what harm could it do without a body? To hell with it, he decided, and ignored it. Mannering made the mistake of going for an upper body blow and stabbing the spade into the second creature's chest. The creature jerked backwards but wasn't dead. Mannering withdrew the spade's blade and jammed it into the creature's heart. No soap. The creature stepped back and kept coming toward Mannering. Aim for the head, said Halverson. That was a direct blow to its heart, said Mannering in frustration. You have to destroy the brain. It's the only part of them that's reanimated. Mannering shook his head and shrugged. He thrust his spade into the creature's forehead. The creature dropped dead. What's the point of staying here? asked Victoria. Let's go. Where to? said Becker. We can't get across the intersection. We'll drive north on Federal, cross Federal, and double back to Wilshire and the pharmacy, said Halverson, climbing into his motor cart. Mannering bucketed down the sidewalk and managed to climb into his seat before Becker could drive off without him. Gripped in Mannering's hand was the spade, which had bone splinters, gore, and lumps of brain smeared on its blade. You're going to leave without me, said Mannering. I was going to drive over to you and pick you up, said Becker. Mannering didn't buy it. Whatever. Becker steered to his right to avoid a one-legged zombie that was crawling off the road and onto the sidewalk. Phew, said Becker. Those things stink to high heaven. They seem to bring flies with them, too, said Mannering, swatting the flies buzzing around his head. One flew into his mouth as he was speaking. Mannering gagged and spat out the invading insect. He commenced coughing. It's all good, said Becker. His eyes bloodshot and tearing from his coughing fit. Mannering gave Becker a look. Anything that makes us strong is good, explained Becker. Mannering coughed. I see an opening in a traffic jam where we can cross, hollered Halverson in the lead cart. Chapter 25 Halverson drove left at the intersection up ahead where a narrow street from the VA center met Federal. He found the carts could squeeze through the tiny intersection, which wasn't really an intersection but a lane for a left turn on Federal. An eighteen-wheeler had jackknifed up ahead, and it prevented traffic from passing it, leaving Federal clear in its southbound lanes for some twenty feet, after which the traffic clogged up again. To avoid the jam-up, Halverson drove onto the cement sidewalk that was inclined for handicapped access and headed back to Wilshire in the pharmacy. "'Can we turn our lights on now?' said Becker in the cart behind Halverson's. "'No,' Halverson called back to him. "'Those things gravitate toward lights and noise. Just follow me.' Victoria shifted in her seat beside Halverson. "'I can't believe you want to kill Felix.' "'I don't want to kill anyone,' said Halverson. We're going to have to kill him when he turns. You don't want him walking around like one of those creatures, do you? He'll attack us when he turns. Victoria didn't answer. Halverson drove to Wilshire and stopped. Becker and Felix braked their vehicles behind him. You see a way across? Felix asked Halverson. No, answered Halverson. We're going to have to walk across from here to get to the pharmacy. The high-rise that housed the pharmacy was in a lot better shape than the buildings around it, Halverson could see. Most of the neighboring buildings had burned down to piles of smoldering, soot-blackened rubble. Perhaps the steel-and-glass construction of the high-rise had saved it, or maybe the overhead sprinkling system had been triggered to scotch the fire. In any case, the building remained in overall good condition, save for several scorch marks on its sides. "'I'm not leaving this cart,' insisted Felix. 
Why do we all have to go? said Becker. Some of us can go, the rest can stay here. Works for me, said Halverson. So who goes? Felix is the one who needs the meds, he should go. No way, said Felix. I told you I'm not leaving this cart. Felix clutched his steering wheel harder, as if to emphasize the point. If you won't get your own meds, why do you think any of us should bother? All I know is I'm not leaving this cart. What you do is up to you. Why should we care if you don't even care? It's just a little bite. Whoever died from a bite from a human. Sitting beside Felix, Reba rolled up his sleeve and inspected his wound. She winced and shook her head. His wound's getting worse, she said. It's turning black with pus oozing out of it. Shit, said Mannering. Too much information. Reba glowered at him. He needs antibiotics. He isn't going to make it without them. He isn't going to make it anyway, muttered Halverson. Hell, I'll go if all of you are a bunch of chickens, said Reba, sliding out of her seat. Mannering reached under his armpits and started beating his arms up and down, clucking. Very funny, said Reba irritably. I'll go with you, said Halverson. I have the goggles. He climbed out of his cart. How long will this take? asked Becker. I don't exactly feel safe waiting here on the sidewalk. I'll protect you, said Felix dryly. You against thousands of ghouls. That's not very reassuring. Next time I'll bring a tank. Mannering chortled. Becker wasn't amused. Halverson picked up on someone walking on the sidewalk toward them from the west. It was a dark-complected twentyish woman with a long mane of brown hair that was fastened with a scrunchie and hanging down the front of her shoulder. Clad in a pink string bikini, she had a voluptuous figure he couldn't help but notice. "'That's what I'm talking about,' said Mannering as he set his eyes on her, too, giving her the once-over. "'I want a piece of that,' said Becker, leering at her. Felix managed the wolf whistle, even though he wasn't feeling but in the end it was effective. Mannering kept battering the thing's head. First he swung at it like the shovel was a baseball bat. Clobbered several times on the side of the head, the creature toppled to the sidewalk, wounded but not dead. Once the thing was on the cement, Mannering sledgehammered the shovel's blade down on the thing's head again and again until the head was reduced to pulp. "'Are you married?' asked Reba. "'I used to be,' answered Mannering. He faced her. "'How could you tell?' Reba shook her head. You look like you were enjoying yourself. Mannering turned back toward the creature and pounded it a couple more times on its ruined head with a shovel. Save your energy, said Halverson. There are more of those things where that one came from. Mannering pounded the creature's head a few more times for good measure. Enough already, said Reba, watching him. Let's get out of here, Halverson told her. He sneered a pitchfork from his motor cart and approached Reba, who was retrieving a shovel from her cart. We don't have all day to wait for you, said Becker. A mob of those things could be just around the corner for all we know. Halverson and Reba waded into the junkyard of cars on Wilshire. They could still hear Mannering's shovel thudding against the creature's shattered skull. Don't leave without us, Reba told the others over the din. We'll honk if we see the slew of those things heading our way, said Felix, winching at the pain in his wounded arm. Becker sneezed. As smoky air gets to my sinuses. I'm thirsty, said Victoria. Yeah, the smoke irritates my throat, said Mannering. I could do with a cold beer. Just keep an eye out for those things, Halverson called back to them, over his shoulder as he led Reba between the junkers toward the pharmacy. Chapter 26 do you think they'll wait for us? Reba asked Halverson in the middle of Wilshire. I don't know, answered Halverson. Let's get this over with fast before they decide to split. They're not going to hang around if hundreds of those things attack them, that's for sure. Halverson spotted bloody corpses sprawled in several of the cars. The corpses weren't moving, he noted with relief. But that could change any moment. It was impossible to predict how long it would take for a corpse to reanimate. 
A tan plastic Ralph's grocery bag blew past them, borne by the gusting offshore Santa Ana winds. Halverson took in Reba's orange supermarket cashier's uniform. Yes, we're not in Santa Monica yet, said Halverson. Reba gave him a blank look. Plastic bags are outlawed in Santa Monica, he explained. Where do you work? In L.A., we still use plastic bags in L.A. It's what I do all day, scan food and bag groceries, she said warily. That's what you used to do. Compared to this, that was paradise. Anything would be better than this, even kissing up to his boss, T.C.I. Slocum, at the agency, decided Halverson. How do you know so much about this area? I thought you were from back east. I used to live here in California, and I came back here frequently because of my job. As a journalist? Yeah. That was his cover story, and he would stick to it, decided Halverson. He wasn't about to tell her that he worked for the CIA. I get the feeling you're not telling me something, said Reba, scrutinizing his face. Halverson had no time to answer. A middle-aged, bald man with a brown goatee and mustache staggered down the sidewalk toward them as Halverson stepped out of the road onto the red-painted curb. Wearing a brown sweater vest, the figure shambled toward Halverson and sneered. Hollow eyes, clotted with white film, gazed blindly out of the figure's withered visage. Halverson pegged him for a zombie. The telltale white eyes sealed the deal, as far as Halverson was concerned. The creature moaned and reached for Halverson. Halverson thrust his pitchfork under the creature's chin, through its palate, and deep into its brain. Halverson withdrew his pitchfork as the creature doubled over and crashed to the sidewalk. How did you know he was one of them? asked Reba. He attacked me, answered Halverson. He didn't attack. He just raised his arms. Maybe he was waving hello. His eyes have white film on them. All of the infected have that film on their eyes. Maybe he's a regular guy who happens to have wall eyes. That was possible, decided Halverson. He hadn't thought of that. But he was staggering, too, like a zombie, he said, suddenly unsure of himself. Christ, Halverson thought, did I kill a man? He stepped toward the lifeless body. It was doubled over so he couldn't see the face. With a pitchfork, Halverson prodded the body so that it now lay supine on the sidewalk. He stooped down over the cadaver to get a better look at its face. He let out a sigh of relief when he remarked distinct evidence of decomposition already in progress on the cadaver's face. The skin was ulcerous and suppurating, too. Patches of black rot dappled the desiccated, rucked face. Zombie, he said. He may have been infected, but he's still a person, said Reba. No, he's not. This is a corpse. This is a thing, not a person. It may look like us, but the resemblance ends there. Okay, Mr. Know-it-all. Halverson strode across the sidewalk to the drugstore. At once he could see that its picture windows were shattered and shards of glass were strewn all over the sidewalk in the store's interior. Not good, he decided. Looks like somebody's beat us to the punch, said Reba. Looters, maybe. They entered the pharmacy, crunching fragments of glass underfoot. Sundries lay scattered all over the aisles between half-empty rifled shelves. He stepped up to the Judas to get a better view. Somebody in the room saw his face and charged the window. It was a berserk woman pushing thirty. She had shoulder-length, unkept, curly brown hair. Wild-eyed, her face contorted with fear, she screamed at him. Help! she cried, crashing her gaping mouth against the glass. Chapter 27 Startled, Halverson flinched. Reflexively, he drew back from the glass as the woman jostled the door. He tried to open the door. It was locked. He heard footsteps running behind him. He wheeled around. It was Reba. What's happening? she asked anxiously. I'm not sure, answered Halverson. A woman inside this room needs help. Why? Halverson could now make out the reason for the woman's panic. As she stepped away from the window, he could see three haggard creatures shambling toward her. Terrified, the woman fled from the door and scooted behind a metal desk to escape her assailants. Things are in there with her, trying to get her, said Halverson. 
Let's open the door and help her, said Reba. Reba grabbed the doorknob, tried to turn it, but couldn't. She yanked on the doorknob in frustration. How? he asked. Tell her to unlock the door. Unlock the door, he hollered toward the woman through the judas. The woman didn't respond. Maybe you can't unlock it from the inside, said Reba. Looks like some kind of supply room. I see rows of shelves in there. After they trashed the store, she may have tried to hide in there, not realizing those things were already in there. Who knows? Halverson didn't know if the poor woman could hear him. In any case, she had her hands full, eluding the zombies. Break down the door, said Reba. Halverson examined the door. It's made of steel. It was worth a try. He reared back his foot and kicked the door underneath the metal doorknob. The door juddered, but didn't give. Try again, she said. It's not budging. It's steel in a steel frame. He launched another kick with no results other than that of sending shooting pain through his right foot. Ow, he said. Cursing, he started limping around on his left foot, favoring his right. There must be something we can do, said Reba. Can you shoot those things through the window? He peeked through the window. He drew his pistol from his waistband. The woman had disappeared from view. I can't see her, he said. I can still hear her screaming. Help! The woman wailed out of Halverson's line of sight. Please, someone, help me! This is horrible, just standing here doing nothing, said Reba. We have to help her. Halverson grabbed the locked doorknob and tried to wrench the door open, nothing doing. A feeling of helplessness swept over Halverson. Through the window he picked up on a stream of blood jetting across the room. The woman staggered into his line of vision, blood gushing from the socket, where her left arm used to be. Her hazel eyes popping out of her head, she tried to reach the door. A trio of ghouls converged on her, tearing at her with their trowel-like hands. Shoot them, cried Reba. Halverson hammered the glass in the window with the butt of his automatic. He managed to shatter the glass on his side of the wire mesh, but couldn't break the glass pane on the other side. He ceased pounding on the glass and commenced shooting through it, leveling his pistol on one of the creatures that was ripping the woman's abdomen open. He fired once. The bullet went wide, deflected by the glass remaining in the window, or by the wire mesh, or by both. In any case, he could not take the chance of firing through the glass again. He might hit the woman by accident. One of the ghouls turned around to check on the bullet-punctured window. Maybe he had hit the creature after all, decided Halverson. The thing was, he hadn't hit the creature in the head. No headshot, no kill shot. With these things, you either killed them or you didn't kill them. There was no middle ground. A bullet in any other place but the brain was amiss. We've got to do something, said Reba through gnashing teeth. She and Halverson stood rooted to the spot, staring through the fractured window at the creatures tearing the woman apart piece by piece. Halverson felt sick watching them slaughter her. He had never felt so helpless. What else can we do, he said. Shoot the lock off the door. Halverson shook his head. It's a steel door and a steel frame, and it's got a deadbolt lock. At least try. That only works in the movies. Nevertheless, he brought his pistol to bear on the door latch. He fired. The bullet slammed into the steel and ricocheted off it, whining through the air. As luck would have it, the bullet didn't hit him or Reba. Through the window he saw the woman fall to the floor on her back. The creatures hunkered over her and ripped her stomach open from her sternum down to her loins. Reba shut her eyes in anguish. She turned away from the butchery. Halverson heard a clamor emanating from his left at the other end of the corridor in the vicinity of the staircase. The stairwell's metal fire door was crashing open, and a nest of zombies was issuing from the landing into the corridor. This is getting worse by the minute, he said. They must have heard my gunshots. Now what are we going to do? said Reba. We have to beat it. The trapped woman was beyond help at this point anyway, Halverson knew. Those things are everywhere, said Reba, her gaping eyes fixed on the mob of creatures lurching down the hall toward them. Halverson bolted into the drugstore, Reba on his heels. Halverson barreled through the drugstore, out onto the sidewalk, half expecting another pack of zombies to be waiting there for them. Reba was right behind him. Halverson came to an abrupt halt as he remembered why they had come here in the first place. 
Did you get the drugs? Yeah, said Reba. She passed. This creature wasn't as lucky as the previous jumpers. It landed on its head, cracking it and pulverizing its brain. What was left of the creature lay in a motionless heap of broken bones and ragged flesh. We gotta get out of here, said Halverson, as another creature took a nosedive into the sidewalk from above. Halverson and Reba dashed toward the road, scrunching their shoulders in anticipation of being hit by a corpse plunging onto them. What are those things doing? asked Reba, flummoxed. Killing themselves? They're trying to get us. They'll do anything to get their teeth into living flesh. Even if they kill themselves in the attempt, they have no fear. Halverson and Reba sprang onto Wilshire and negotiated a way past the crashed cars. Halverson led the way, peering through his night vision goggles for a clear path through the car wreckage. He heard more creatures thudding into the sidewalk behind him. Where's your shovel? Halverson asked, checking out her empty hands. Damn, I left it behind in the pharmacy when I was looking for pills. Halverson still had his pitchfork. He hoped he wouldn't need it. In front of him he could make out the three motor carts parked on the sidewalk. When Halverson stepped onto the sidewalks, Felix was there to meet him pistol in hand. Halverson glanced over his shoulder to see if any of the creatures were pursuing him. He saw none behind him. You don't need that, said Halverson, nodding at Felix's gun. None of those things came across the road with us, yet, that is. Halverson wasn't prepared for what happened next. Give me your gun, said Felix, turning his glock on Halverson. What are you talking about? Just give me your gun, Felix said, his empty hand out. Why? We're taking you prisoner. For what? Give me your gun or I'll shoot you, Felix cocked his semi-automatic. Halverson had no idea what was going on. He knew he wasn't going to go up against a loaded gun, though. He reached for his pistol. Slowly, said Felix. Halverson followed instructions, withdrew his semi-automatic, and handed it butt first to Felix. Felix took the gun and wedged it inside his waistband. He continued training his clock on Halverson. What happened? asked Reba. This guy's plotting to kill me, said Felix, indicating Halverson. Who told you that, said Halverson. Victoria and the senator. I said you would have to be killed when you got the plague. I already have it, according to you. That means my life's on the line as long as you're walking around free. This is crazy. We're tying you up, Felix turned to the others. Anyone got something we can tie him up with? Nobody answered. Felix spotted Becker's tie. How about your tie, Senator? Becker shrugged. He unfastened his forehand hand and handed the silk moire tie to Felix. That guy's a menace to all of us, said Becker, eyeing Halverson suspiciously. There is something mysterious about him, like he's not telling us something, agreed Reba. That story about being a journalist just doesn't wash. Why is a journalist walking around with his own pair of night vision goggles? Halverson didn't know why they had all suddenly turned on him. He figured it was Becker who had turned Felix against him somehow while they were waiting for him to return from the drugstore. How does he know so much about this plague anyway? asked Reba. Tie his hands behind his back, Felix told Reba, handing her the necktie. Reba did so. I never trusted him. Halverson realized Victoria wasn't saying anything. Maybe he could enlist her to help later, he decided. On the other hand, she was the one he had told about the need to kill Felix. And she must have told Becker, and Becker had told Felix. Halverson got the impression Becker wanted to be in charge. Getting Halverson out of the way may have been part and parcel of Becker's scheme to take over. Now you've got one less man to fight the creatures with, said Halverson. Shut up, said Felix. I'm not going to let a killer run around loose among us, especially if he's got my name on his bullet. He stepped toward Halverson and reached for the NBGs. I'm taking those goggles, too. You're going to be in the rear cart from now on. Felix roughly removed the NBGs from Halverson's head. I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel a whole lot better with him tied up, said Becker. Felix donned the goggles. His wounded arm hurt, but he could still use it. That's more like it, he said, wearing the goggles. 
What a mess the city is, he added, surveying the vicinity. Do you see any of those things coming? asked Becker. There's a passel of them roaming around the drugstore. They haven't figured out we're over here yet. Well, they can't see us. That's as near as I want them to get to me. Did you get the antibiotics? Felix asked Reba. Yeah. She dug the meds out of her pockets. She handed the bottle of amoxicillin to him. Take one of these. She opened the package of sulpa. I'll put this on your wound. Felix struggled to open the plastic cap. I hate these childproof caps. He pressed down on it and twisted it. He jockeyed it around. At last it gave. He poured several white tablets out of the orange plastic container into his palm and tossed the tablets into his open mouth. Anybody got some water? he asked, at mouthful. Wish I had a beer, said Mannering. You're a big help. Reba retrieved a can of Coke from their cart. Here's a soda I got at the cemetery. Best I can do. Felix curled his forefinger under the can's pop-top. He tugged the aluminum ring, gulped soda, and washed down the pills with it. You're only supposed to take one, said Reba. This thing hurts like a bastard, said Felix, grimacing at the pain in his wound. Roll up your sleeve. Felix peeled the pus-soaked sleeve off his wound. Reba gasped. The wound looked worse than ever. In fact, the black necrotic flesh had spread up to his elbow. Not only that, the wound was secreting more than more pus. Looks like gangrene, she said, wincing. Not surprising, considering it's a human bite, said Mannering, looking on. The human mouth has more bacteria in it than a dog's mouth. I could tell you stories about some of the bums I've rousted that would turn your stomach. Reba rolled Felix's sleeve up higher. The entire length of his upper arm had turned black and blue. She ripped open a packet of sulfa and poured the antibiotic on the wound. The wound was so large now that she needed to tear open another packet to fully cover the wound with sulfa. Will I be okay now? asked Felix. No, said Halverson. Felix cocked the fist on his good arm and socked Halverson in the jaw. Halverson reeled back from the sucker punch. Didn't ask you, said Felix. Screwing up his face, Halverson worked his aching jaw. One of his teeth felt loose. Does it feel any better? Reba asked Felix. Not really. There was no cure for the plague, Halverson knew. But he wasn't going to tell Felix again and risk another punch to the face. It was just a matter of time now before Felix turned into one of the walking dead. The longer that took, the worse it would be for Halverson. As long as Felix remained human, he wouldn't release Halverson lest Halverson might kill him. I know why you really want to kill me, Felix told Halverson. It's not because of this plague crap you've been feeding everyone. You and I both know I'll get over this infection. Then why? He lowered his voice so only Halverson could hear him. Because you want a bigger cut of the cash. The less people there are to share it, the more we each get. Felix poked his head with his forefinger and tapped his temple like he had Halverson all figured out. Except he didn't, Halverson knew. God was a fool who, like most fools, thought he was smarter than everybody else. Soon he would be a walking dead fool. Felix patted Halverson down. You got any more goodies on you? Felix felt the satellite phone in Halverson's trouser pocket. Felix stopped patting. His face assumed an inquisitive expression. He withdrew the phone from Halverson's pocket. Where'd you get this fancy Dan phone? asked Felix. The satellite phone for my journalism job, lied Halverson. I filed reports from all over the world. It was a half-truth he knew. He did file reports from all over the world, but for the CIA and did not for his professional journalism job. It should work, then, even if the cell towers around here are all out. The battery's dead. Then we'll get a new battery. Felix pocketed the sat phone. I don't want you calling for help. We could all use help now. Chapter 29 no signs of life, no sounds, no planes flying overhead. Nothing. 
just darkness and a fragment of moon veiled by the murky, hazy sky. "'What do we do now?' asked Veronica, shifting her legs in her cart's passenger seat. First off, you're going to have to drive,' answered Felix. "'Halverson can't drive you any more.' She got up and climbed into the driver's seat. "'But where? Are we still heading for the beach?' Halverson slid into Victoria's recently vacated seat and sat uncomfortably with his tied arms sandwiched between his back in the seat. "'We need more weapons first, said Felix. "'Good idea,' said Halverson. "'Those gardening tools aren't much use as weapons,' Felix glanced with dissatisfaction at the tools in his cart. "'We could do with some silencers, too, so we won't attract more creatures when we shoot.' "'You're not shooting off anything except your mouth.' "'Where are we going to get weapons?' asked Victoria. "'That's the problem,' answered Felix. "'I know where you can get weapons,' said Manning, walking up to Felix. "'Where?' "'The local police department.' "'You sound like a cop.' "'I am a cop, and the police department has plenty of guns.' "'Great. But where is it?' "'It's over on Butler Avenue. I know where it is. "'That's where I work. How far away is it?' "'Not far. A couple of miles.' It's all set, then. That's where we're going. But first we need food. I'm with him, said Becker. My stomach's doing somersaults. He patted his conspicuous belly. I think there's a phone store on the next block, said Felix. Let's check it out before we do anything else. If I can get this satellite phone to work, we might be able to contact somebody who knows what's really going on. Call for some help, too, while you're at it. They climbed into the motor carts. With Reba sitting beside him, Felix drove to the front of their small convoy and headed west down the sidewalk to the next block. Becker followed with Mannering. Victoria fell in line at the rear. Halverson sat beside her. Halverson realized nobody was guarding him, but what difference did it make, he wondered. Where was he going to go with his hands bound? He stood a better chance staying with the rest of them. He didn't think Felix would try to kill him unless Felix started losing his marbles on account of his infection, which was a distinct possibility Halverson knew. Still, as of now, he felt safer remaining with the group. Who, who did you tell that I thought we should kill Felix? he asked Victoria. What makes you think I told anyone? Felix wouldn't have pulled a gun on me unless you told someone. Blackened husks of fire-gutted edifices that lined the street. Some of the buildings had escaped the flames, but such buildings were in the minority. I don't care about any of this, said Victoria. I just want to find my child. I want to find my brother, but I don't know where to look, said Halverson. He was supposed to be at UCLA, but UCLA is infested with zombies. We live near here on 26th Street. I think Shauna must be close by. Maybe one of your neighbors is taking care of her. They might all be dead the way things look. We didn't really have any close friends in my neighborhood. What about your husband? Maybe he has your daughter. I'm divorced. I haven't seen him in years. He lives in New York, the last I heard. Oh, said Halverson. He couldn't think of what else to say. We just didn't get along. Now you know all about me. What about you? What? Are you married? No, I don't have a life. All I do is work. It was difficult to have relationships when you were a spy, Halverson had found out the hard way. He could never confide in anyone, including women. How could a spy have any kind of personal life unless he was James Bond? Victoria was a very attractive blonde with luminous blue eyes. Why was he thinking about this? He and she could both be dead at the hands of zombies within minutes. Halverson changed the subject. Felix and those other guys don't care about your daughter. They have no intention of looking for her. Maybe she returned home after I left it, she said, not listening to him. She wouldn't have any other place to go if the shelter had closed. That's a thought. She set her face with resolve. I'm going home. You'll have to convince the others to go with you. I don't care if they come or not. I'll go with you. She glanced at his bound figure sitting next to her. You don't have much choice. Problem isn't me, it's Felix and the others. I don't think they're going to let you go off by yourself. Why wouldn't they? He shot a look over his shoulder. The money in the back? 
I forgot about that. The others aren't going to forget about it. Then I'll walk. That wouldn't be a good idea with these creatures all over the place. What do you think I should do then? Maybe you should take off without telling them. Halverson shifted in his seat, trying to reduce the pressure on his aching arms. His bindings were cutting off his circulation. That's an idea, she said. But they'd probably come after you because of the money. I'll leave the money with them, she said huffily. They have nowhere to put it. They need this cart to transport it. She turned on him. Why do you keep making suggestions that aren't any good? Just thinking out loud. Well, stop. If you untie me, I might be better able to help you. She thought about it. I don't trust you. You wanted to kill Felix. How do I know you won't try to kill me? You're not infected like Felix. Why would I try to kill you? I don't know. I don't know what's going through your mind. Actually, he didn't trust her either, not after she had sold him out to Becker. On the other hand, he trusted the others even less. Felix? No. Becker? The politician? No way. Reba? She was a tad too chummy with Felix. Halverson couldn't help but notice. That left the beer-craving cop Mannering. Halverson figured he would rather throw in his lot with Victoria than with Mannering. Though that could change, Halverson didn't know where Mannering was coming from at this point. Mannering was too new to the equation. Mannering, so far, was in the dark concerning the money. His ignorance about the money might make him more trustworthy than the others. I see a phone store up ahead, announced Felix loud enough for everyone to hear. Halverson knew it, said Mannering. Felix gave him the phone. Mannering snapped open the battery compartment and removed the battery. He compared the battery to the batteries for sale to find a similar one. Do you see one of these anywhere? he said, holding up that battery. Studying the batteries, Felix selected one. This one says lithium-ion. He offered it to Mannering, who inserted it into the sat phone and handed the phone back to him. Felix turned the sat phone on. He smiled. Looks like it's working. He read the message on the phone's display screen. His expression turned to one of annoyance. You gotta be kidding. What? said Mannering. This thing wants an access code. Felix turned to Halverson. What's the code? Why is it doing that? asked Mattering. Is that normal? It's a new one on me, said Felix. My cell doesn't need an access code. He asked Halverson, What gives? My boss doesn't want a phone like that falling into the wrong hands. Why not? Felix asked suspiciously. Somebody could rack up a huge bill on that phone. You can call all over the world. So let's have it. Felix stood with his fingers poised over the sat phone. Ready to punch in the numbers. What's the code? Halverson hung fire. He was of two minds. He hadn't told Felix everything about his sat phone. It was a digitally encrypted CIA phone that could reach the director of the CIA himself. Standard agency operative protocol dictated that operatives should never reveal the access code to anybody. On the other hand, Halverson knew that if he didn't tell Felix the code... How could they hope to reach somebody still alive who might know the extent of the plague's progress throughout the world? Halverson decided it best to use the phone by himself. Now all he had to do was get it back from Felix. We don't have all day, said Felix. I'm not allowed to give it to anyone. We don't have time to dick around. We need to contact the authorities to find out what's going on. Halverson said nothing. Felix strode over to Halverson and clouded him in the solar plexus with his fist. Unable to defend himself with his arms bound, Halverson absorbed the full impact of the blow. He groaned and doubled over, exhaling forcibly. Just tell him, Mannering told Halverson. Halverson said nothing. There aren't any secrets anymore, Mannering went on. The whole damn world could be falling apart. We need to find out if anybody else is left alive. Halverson said nothing, his face screwed up in pain. Felix kneed Halverson in the face while Halverson was bowed forward. Halverson managed to avert his face in the nick of time to elude the blow that, no doubt, would have slammed into and broken his nose. Instead, Felix's knee connected with the side of Halverson's jaw, 
sending shock waves of pain through Halverson's face. Felix grabbed Halverson by the hair and yanked up Halverson's smarting, flushed face. What's the code? Felix demanded. I can do this all day if I have to. At that moment, Reba burst into the store from the sidewalk. There's a nest of those things coming this way, she cried flustered. She looked puzzled as she noticed Halverson in obvious pain, his hazel eyes watering, his dark hair mussed up. We'll sort this out later, Felix told Halverson. The four of them hastened out of the store. Still trying to catch his breath, Halverson lagged behind. When he emerged onto the sidewalk, he could make out a slew of creatures lumbering down the sidewalk toward the motor carts from the direction of the cemetery. I'm sick of those things, burst Reba. In a fit of anger, clenching her teeth, she snagged the shotgun from her cart and fired around at the undulating mass of creatures. The charge ripped into a zombie at the head of the pack. The thirtieth creature was six-four and wore a crumpled white stringy brim fedora. The creature's chest blew apart, exposing its shattered ribs and shredded lungs. The creature jerked backwards from the blow, then, shoved by the creatures behind it, kept coming inexorably forward at one with a sea of dead flesh that rolled down the sidewalk. We can't fight him here, hollered Felix. We don't have any protection. We gotta go. Chapter 31 Bound and in pain, Halverson stumbled into his motor cart and sat awkwardly beside Victoria. He straightened himself in his seat and adjusted his body so his tired arms felt less uncomfortable behind his back. She looked at him in confusion. Don't ask, he said, working his sore jaw, checking it out to, to see if it was still in one piece. He picked up on two female zombies, barging past the tall male with the ruined chest toward the front of the pack. The two females were a tad over five feet tall. The forty-something Asian brunette had shoulder-length bangs parted in the middle of her forehead. The creature's gray sweater and white blouse were in shambles. What was left of them dangled in jagged strips down her chest. One of her white filmed brown eyeballs dangled on a bloody stalk out of its gaping socket. The eyeball was swiveling on the stalk, trying to see all around it. The other female was a teenager with thin dyed blonde hair pulled so tightly about her forehead and locked in place with bobby pins that it looked painful. She was clutching a battered pink cell phone in her hand as if it was part of her. She wore a blood-stained robin's egg blue sweatshirt and faded blue jeans with holes torn in the knees. Blundering toward the motor cars, the creature reached for her nose like she was going to pick it. Instead, the nose was in such an extreme state of decomposition that it crumbled into dust in her hand when she touched it. She sneered with withered lips. Lacking a nose, her face looked even more grotesque than it had moments earlier. That was possible, decided Halverson. Somebody kill those things, cried Reba, appalled at the sight of them. Mannering snatched the persuader from her hand. He pumped a shotgun, trained it on the blonde creature, and fired at its chest. The creature reeled backwards. The zombies behind it immediately manhandled it forward. Shoot for the head, said Halverson. Mannering pumped his shotgun again, trained it on the blonde's head, and blew its head to smithereens. The blonde zombie crumpled on the sidewalk. The creatures behind the ghoul trampled it into slurry. Kill the other one, barked Reba. Mannering pumped his shotgun, took aim at the brunette with its rotating eyeball lolling out of its head, and squeezed off a round that atomized the brunette's head. The eyeball went flying through the air, bounced off a car's hood, and rolled into the street. We gotta move it, Felix called out from the first cart, driving off. Shotgun in hand, Mannering barreled into Reba's cart. She put the cart in gear and peeled off behind Felix. Victoria followed suit, bringing up the rear. I don't know how much more of this I can stand, said Victoria. We either keep going or give up and die, said Halverson. That's the only choice we've got left. I hope we get out of this nightmare before I go nuts. Don't even think about hope. There's no hope. Just keep going. She gave him a look. 
Is it that bad? Can't you see for yourself? It's chaos out there. By rights, all of us should be dead. They drove for two blocks on the sidewalk, then Felix pulled to a halt at the sound of a man screaming for help. Halverson could see a commotion brewing in the intersection. Three ghouls were pulling somebody out of a crashed car by his head. The passenger side window was down less than halfway, and the creatures were yanking on the man's head, trying to squeeze the guy's body through the opening. The head would fit, but not the guy's body, Halverson saw. Agitated and groaning, the creatures tugged harder on the guy's head. The guy let loose with a blood-curdling scream that rent the air. We need to help him, said Victoria. There are a lot of creatures wandering around on the street near him, said Halverson warily. He could see Felix up ahead, debating what to do in his lead cart. We can't just sit here and watch, said Victoria. I can't help anyone tied up like this, said Halverson. Before they could do anything, they watched in horror as the three creatures yanked the man's head off his neck. Blood fountained out of the guy's mutilated throat, soaking the zombies. They lapped it up like if it was water, and they were dying from thirst. Victoria gasped and held her hands over her eyes. Out of morbid curiosity, Halverson watched the creature that possessed the blood-splashed head. The thirtyish male creature was wearing a khaki flat cap and tan plastic-framed spectacles. The creature flung the head on the pavement, trying to crack open the skull and get to the brains. The head rolled under an SUV. Frustrated, flat cap followed the errant head. The creature got down on its hands and knees to retrieve it. Realizing it could not fit beneath the vehicle on its knees, flat cap flattened itself on its belly, squirmed under the chassis, and latched onto the head. When Flat Cap stood up with the head in its hands, the other zombie of company. What? Where? Halverson nodded toward the opposite end of the store. A five-seven, twenty-something man was emerging from the storage room there. He had unruly, curly black hair about two inches long sprouting from his head and four days' growth of black stubble on his face. He wore filthy blue jeans and a navy blue button-down shirt that had its buttons torn off and was hanging open to reveal a hairy, caved-in chest. "'Is he one of them?' asked Victoria. "'I can't tell from here, but we better get our food and scram.' The guy was just standing there for a moment, Halverson saw. Halverson took the opportunity to help Victoria gather food. Not that he was much of a help, considering his hands were tied. She snared an abandoned canvas carry-all off the floor, paraded down aisles, and tossed items into the basket. When she realized the carry-all was too small, she said, We need a bigger basket. I'll get one, said Halverson. He found a metal cart on wheels at the front of the store near the cash registers. Without the use of his hands, he had to steer the cart with his feet, which wasn't easy. The wayward cart kept crashing into the shelves and knocking items down onto the floor, creating a mess and a racket. At last he reached Victoria. She deposited the carry-all's contents into the cart and resumed collecting more items. She dumped a red cardboard twenty-four pack of Cokes into the cart. Seeing that he was having difficulty managing the cart, she grasped its red plastic handle and pushed the cart herself. Halverson struck off for the end of the aisle to take another look at the uninvited guest standing in front of the storage room. His eyes staring blankly ahead, the guy was shambling into the store now, Halverson could see. Halverson pegged him for a ghoul. Where there was one ghoul, there were usually more not far behind. Halverson had learned from his earlier experiences with them. As if on cue, another twenty-something creature shuffled out of the dim storeroom. Smaller than its cohort, by four-odd inches, this creature had a short, scraggly black beard, a round, putty-like nose, and a sneering, half-open mouth that secreted saliva. On its head, the creature wore a raked back and white checkered ascot cap. Behind this creature was yet another creature, traipsing out of the storeroom. This one was a black, portly female with a rope of black, conked hair 
draped over her gore-coated primrose-yellow blouse. Gazing up at the ceiling with gibbous brown eyes coated with white film, the creature waddled into the store. Halverson saw Felix pick up on the zombie infestation as the third one entered the store. Felix hurried, gorging on another gamey raw steak. He withdrew his glock from his waistband, aimed the pistol at the fat creature, and seemed to pause in thought, as if reluctant to fire. His demural did not last long. He fired. Three rounds ripped into the creature's chest, slowing its advance for no more than a few seconds at the most. "'Shoot it to head,' said Halverson. "'How many times did he have to keep telling them?' he wondered. Felix blasted the fat creature's head. The ghoul dropped like an overstuffed bag of potatoes. Assorted scavenger insects crawled out of the thing's mouth and scuttled across its bloated belly. Felix fired more rounds at the other two zombies, dropping one of them with a headshot that blew the creature's occipital bone off. Fragments of skull crashed into the wall behind the creature and smeared it with gobbets of brain matter. Felix scooped up a bunch of steaks from the meat locker, cradled his haul in his arms, and bucketed back toward the motor carts in the parking lot can of Coke from the back of the cart. He struggled to pop open the can, which he had trouble grasping with his sore arms hand. At last he opened the can, spilling Coke on his pants as he did so. He took a pull of the Coke and washed down the pills. "'You're taking too many,' said Reba. She felt his forehead. "'My God, you're burning up!' "'It hurts,' said Felix, lifting his wounded arm up in front of him. "'Maybe we should amputate the thing,' said Manning." Hank's right, Reba told Felix. The gangrene is spreading throughout your entire body. We need to stop it from spreading. Halverson watched a six-six bespeckled creature in a criminally tailored brown suit stagger out of the supermarket's entrance. Over an inch of the ghoul's white shirt projected beyond its silken wool jacket sleeve. Not only that, the ghoul's trouser cuffs reached all the way to the bottoms of its scuffed leather shoe heels. Drooling, the creature was hanging its mouth open, flaunting its jagged, rotting teeth. The creature raised its arm, displaying a stainless steel Tog Hoyer chronograph on its wrist. Get a load of Bo Brummel, cracked Mannering. Isn't anyone paying attention, said Reba, visibly upset. We need to amputate Felix's arm. Wait a minute, said Manning, his body stiffening, flabbergasted. I know that guy. He's a fucking lawyer for dope dealers. Not any more, said Halverson. Mannering shook his fist at the creature. Fucking shyster. His mouth hanging open wider. Bo Brummel stumbled toward Mannering, gravitating toward Mannering, shouting. You're making too much noise, Halverson told Mannering. You're going to bring an army of them down on us yelling like that. Listen up, people, cried Reba. We need to amputate Felix's arm. We can't do it now, said Halverson glancing towards Bo Brummel, shambling towards them. We gotta go. Give me a gun so I can kill it, Manring told Felix. No phone. They drove two blocks. Then Felix's vehicle ground to a halt. Why are we stopping? Halverson asked Victoria. I don't know. This isn't 26th Street. Along with Becker and Manring, Victoria and Halverson pulled up behind Felix's vehicle. What's going on? Victoria asked Becker. Your guess is as good as mine, answered Becker. There could be creatures lurking around here, said Halverson, surveying the gloomy cityscape. Most of the buildings here were smoldering as they were elsewhere in the city, he saw. Threads of gray smoke unraveled from the scorched ruins into the night sky. It's not like we're on a sightseeing tour where we make stops to take in the view, said Becker. Halverson noticed that Felix's seat in the front cart was vacant. Where's Felix? He told me to stop, said Reba. Then he upped and left. He muttered something about needing to use a restroom. That figures, said Victoria. He probably got sick from all that spoiled meat he ate at the store. Not to mention his infected arm. I need that sat phone, Halverson confided to Victoria. Which way did he go? Victoria asked Reba. 
Riva pointed north toward the smoking remains of buildings in a strip mall. We can't let him wander off by himself, Halverson told Riva. He'll be back, said Riva. How do you know? Riva glanced over her shoulder back at the money bag stashed in the rear of her motor cart. He won't leave those behind for long. What if the ghouls ambush him, said Halverson. He clambered out of his seat, twisting his bound arms painfully in the process. What are you doing? asked Reba. We need to find him and help him. What kind of help can you give him with your hands tied? I'll go with him, said Victoria. Felix is the one with the guns, said Reba. He can take care of himself. But what if he passes out from his infected arm? We need to check up on him. Victoria climbed out of her cart and took the pitchfork with her. Anyone else coming? asked Halverson. Nobody moved. I'll watch the carts, said Becker. Just as well, muttered Halverson. As soon as he and Victoria were alone, he would take the first opportunity to cut his bonds with the knife he had cribbed in the supermarket. I'll go, said Mannering. He grabbed a shovel and trotted up to Halverson. You're not going to be much good to anyone with your arms trussed. Me too, said Reba. She seized the Mossberg persuader and met up with them. Gang's all here, thought Halverson. So much for plan A, he decided. Then again, he might still be able to free himself while the others were preoccupied. He would just have to wait and see. I'm still guarding the carts, said Becker. I'll honk if I see any of those things coming. Chapter 34 How are we going to find him in this darkness? asked Victoria as she, Reba, Halverson, and Mannering set out north. I don't know, said Mannering. We sure could use those MVGs of Felix's right now. Where would the nearest restroom be located? Any of these stores in the strip mall will have restrooms. What if he didn't go to a restroom, said Halverson. What are you talking about, said Mannering. Reba said he did. Maybe he lied. Why would he lie about going to the bathroom? They reached the first store in the mall, which happened to be a fire-gutted stationery store. Let's try here, said Victoria. She walked into the charred rubble of the building. The restroom is still intact. You didn't answer my question, Mannering told Halverson. Why would Felix lie about going to the head? Why didn't he just go in the street, said Halverson. It's not like we have to obey social amenities now that the world's falling apart. Maybe he had to take a dump. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to do that on the street. I agree with Hank, said Victoria. Felix probably has some kind of diarrhea after eating that rotten meat. You're all forgetting one thing, said Halverson. Felix has the plague, and he's turning into one of those things. So he lied about finding a restroom, and in reality went off to turn into the Wolfman or whatever on his own, Manning scoffed. I don't know how he stayed alive as long as he has with that infection eating through his system. Mannering shook his head incredulously. Halverson, Mannering, and Reba followed Victoria into the stationery store. They found the bathroom in the back, what was left of it anyway. Burnt rafters in the roof had caved in, and now canted against the walls and the two stalls. Otherwise, the stalls both looked in working order, decided Halverson. The metal door on one of the stalls hung ajar. Halverson peeked inside. The stall was empty. The other stall's door was closed. He kicked the door lightly with his foot. Felix, he said. No answer. Mannering crouched and looked under the stall door. He didn't see any feet, no sign of him. So he's in another restroom, said Reba. This could take all night, especially if he isn't even in a restroom in the first place, said Halverson. There was no telling where Felix had gone if he went somewhere to turn into a creature, Halverson decided. Halverson had no idea what thoughts were running through Felix's feverish, plague-infected brain. How could Halverson predict where Felix would go? For all Halverson knew, Felix may have already turned. If he had, there was only one thought going through Felix's mind at this moment. Eat. In that case, Felix would be acting now in accordance with his single prime directive running through his reanimated brain. Halverson needed his sat phone. He had no choice but to find Felix whether he was a zombie or not. How do you track a zombie, wondered Halverson. 
Let's try to get inside Felix's head, said Halverson. He went to take a leak or dump, said Mannering. He shrugged. Where does that get us? How many restrooms do we have to check? He may not even be using a restroom. You just don't get it. Felix has the plague. He's going to die. What's that got to do with taking a leak? You're hopeless, Hank, said Victoria. I need a drink. Mannering rubbed his face with his hand. Don't you understand? This isn't business as usual. Look around you. Victoria gestured at the incinerated hulk of a building they were standing in. You mean we're fucked? I already know that, honey. Why do you think I want to get drunk? You're no good to us drunk. Like we're going to get out of this or something? Halverson ignored Mannering. If you knew you were going to die, what would you do? Where would you go? We all know we're going to die, said Victoria. Let me rephrase that. If you knew you were going to die soon, what would you do? Victoria thought about it. I'd go home, I think. I don't really know. I've never thought about it. I don't dwell on morbid thoughts. I'd drink a couple of six-packs of beer, said Mannering. I'd drink myself senseless. That's your answer to everything, isn't it? Do you have any idea what it's like being a cop? Victoria said nothing. Of course not, Mannering went on. I get to deal with all the sickos, rapists, murderers, and whatever every day of the week. You think all these scumbags get caught, don't you? Well, I have news for you. They don't. Most of these creeps get away with it. You don't want to know even half of what I know. It would make you sick. This isn't a referendum on your job, said Halverson. We all have problems, said Victoria. We don't all get drunk because of it. Yeah, said Reba. We don't all go around. We don't have any choice, said Halverson. We have to find him. To find him, said Reba. I have no idea where he went. I only know what he told me. She turned to leave. I'm heading back to the carts. Mannering rose to his feet. He was going to follow Reba, but on second thought hung back, rubbing his bald pate. Maybe Felix crawled into some corner to die, Victoria told Halverson. All we can do is keep searching, said Halverson. If he's turned into a creature, he wouldn't hide somewhere. He'd be coming after us to feed on us, right? Halverson frowned and thought. Those things don't shy from human contact, that's for sure. Just the opposite. If he has already turned, he won't be running away from us. To be foraging for the nearest living human being to eat, which is probably us. Chapter 35 Halverson pricked up his ears when he heard scuffling behind the broken, disarrayed shelves in the store. Mannering heard it, too. What was that? He said under his breath. Maybe it's Felix, whispered Victoria. Halverson, Victoria, and Mannering left the bathroom and headed down the short hallway to the store's interior to investigate the source of the sound. Shovel at the ready, Mannering stole down an aisle to canvas the rest of the store. As Mannering was pattering down the aisle, a tall guy with tousled white hair and a nicotine-stained white shaving brush mustache halted into view at the other end of the aisle. The guy was wearing jeans and a blood-stained ruby shirt. The guy screwed up his sixty-ish face into a grimace as he set his white-filmed eyes on Mannering. Wielding a shovel with both hands now, Mannering closed in on the creature. Halverson wanted to help him, but his hands were tied. At that moment, a short, wiry male Vietnamese creature with bandy legs lurched into view behind its companion. The Vietnamese creature's hatchet face scowled as the creature bared its fragmented yellow bloody teeth. The thing was still chewing a piece of human flesh in its mouth, Halverson could see. Maybe the thing had just made a fresh kill, decided Halverson. Hopefully the creature's victim hadn't been Felix. Blood trickled down the creature's chin. Sons of bitches, growled Mannering and went at the two ghouls, brandishing his shovel. Untie me so I can help him, Halverson told Victoria. Victoria appeared loath to obey him. She glanced at Mannering, then exchanged looks with Halverson. She fudged, undecided. The only reason you tied me up was so I wouldn't kill Felix, right? said Halverson. Wasn't my idea to tie you up. It was Felix's. 
Well, he's not here anymore. So what's the point? I'm on your side. I can help Hank. Halverson knew he had the knife in his rear waistband, but by the time he managed to cut himself free, it would be too late to help Mannering. It might even be too late to help himself if there were more of these things lurking in the store. Victoria dithered a moment longer, then worked to unfasten the necktie that bound Halverson's wrists as she heard Mannering pound the head of the tall ghoul with the back of the shovel's steel blade. Mannering was experiencing difficulty swinging the shovel in such close confines. The proximity of the shelves on either side of him was curtailing his swing and hence lessening the impact of the blow to the creature's head. In such close quarters a shovel made a lousy weapon, Mannering realized. In any quarters, for that matter, it was virtually useless here as a killing weapon. He could not get any power behind his swing. He started hammering down on the thing's head from above, but he doubted that the impact of such blows would kill the thing. The fact of the matter was that a shovel just wasn't designed for killing people. His hands free, Halverson snatched Victoria's pitchfork and waded into the war Manning was waging with the two ghouls. Whose bright idea was it to use shovels as weapons, said Mannering in frustration. We took anything we could find in the shed, said Halverson. We didn't have a whole lot of choices. He came up to Mannering and raised a pitchfork in his hands. Let me try this. I've had some luck with it before. Be my guest, said Mannering, who stepped aside. Shaving brush stumbled forward toward Halverson. Halverson thrust the pitchfork upward from waist level and drove the prongs under the chin and upward into Shaving Brush's head. Halverson could feel the impetus of Shaving Brush, who continued to try to walk forward. The only thing that impeded the creature's progress was the length of the pitchfork that Halverson grasped. Halverson figured he had missed the creature's brain. He kicked Shaving Brush in the chest, and shoving the creature away, yanked out the pitchfork at the same time to dislodge the prongs from the thing's head. Shaving Brush reeled backwards a few steps. Poke his damn eyes out, said Mannering. That had worked for him before, Halverson knew. It wasn't the easiest thing in the world to aim the pitchfork, so that one of the prongs would directly penetrate an eye. In any case, it was his best bet. He reared back, and holding the pitchfork as steady as he could manage, thrust it at Shaving Brush's head. The prongs missed the eyes, but didn't miss the head. In fact, one of the prongs impaled Shaving Brush's head, flush between the eyes. The prong transfixed the brain, and Shaving Brush dropped. Good shot, said Mannering. Except I wasn't aiming there, thought Halverson. He hadn't been trained in the use of pitchforks as weapons at Camp Perry when he was training for the agency. However, agents were trained to be able to kill with just about any object in Mantia. It's not, it's one of those things. When Victoria beheld the girl's contorted, sneering face, she froze in her tracks. The girl opened her mouth, exposing jagged teeth and dribbling. Get away from it, Halverson told Victoria. Its arms raised, the thing shambled toward Victoria, groping the air. Victoria stood in a funk, paralyzed at the sight of the little girl's wretched face. The girl creature grabbed Victoria's arm with its grubby, emaciated fingers. Don't let it touch you, said Halverson. He speared the ghoul in the back with the pitchfork prongs, which drove clear through the ghoul's chest and jutted three inches out from it. Then he lifted the creature off the floor and pulled the little monster away from Victoria. Airborne, the thing squirmed on the pitchfork and flailed its arms and legs. Halverson reversed the angle of his grip on the pitchfork and, aiming downward, pinned the creature face down on the floor with the prongs embedded in its back. He stamped on the creature's spine. The creature continued writhing. Halverson wrestled the prongs from the thing's back, raised the pitchfork half over his head, then jammed the prongs into the back of the thing's skull. With a sickening feeling, he heard the muffled crunch of the skull cracking open. The ghoul lay motionless under Halverson's foot. The pitchfork squelched as Halverson removed it from the ghoul's cracked skull and punctured brains. Halverson approached Victoria. She was trembling as she stared wide-eyed at the ghoul. Was it Shauna? Halverson asked. Victoria shook her head. No, she looked like her from the back, same hair and height, but it's not her. 
brain splattered shovel in hand, Mannering rounded the end of the shelf. Did I miss all the fun? His cop's gallows humor fell on deaf ears. Mannering shrugged apologetically. Let's get out of here, said Halverson. I hear you, said Mannering. Halverson, Victoria, and Mannering headed for the front door. Before they were halfway there, they started as they heard the horn on one of the motor cars honking. The trio broke into a run. Chapter 36 All Felix knew was he wanted to be alone. He felt closed off from the others. He wanted to escape their presence. They were getting on his nerves, especially Halverson and Becker. The pair of them were dickheads. Felix was certain Halverson was going to try to kill him. As for Becker, Felix trusted him as far as he could throw him. Becker wasn't the type of guy you wanted guarding your back. Mannering could spell trouble somewhere down the line, too, Felix decided. After all, Mannering was a cop, and Felix had robbed an armored truck. To hell with all of them, thought Felix, walking behind a strip mall. He felt more and more isolated from the others, as though he couldn't communicate with them any more. He wanted to be by himself. He felt sick. His stomach was flipping somersaults. Even so, he was starving. He wished he had stayed at the supermarket and was still devouring fresh meat there. The craving for fresh meat overpowered him. What was happening to him, he wondered. He didn't feel like himself. He felt out of whack. Could it be that his wound or his fever was going to his head? Maybe Halverson had been right, decided Felix grudgingly. Maybe Felix did contract the disease. Felix told himself not to go there. He couldn't afford to think like that. He cast a furtive glance at his wounded arm. He was appalled to see that his arm had turned green. Maybe that was why they called it gangrene. In any case, no matter how revolting it looked, his arm didn't hurt anymore. He tried to move it. He could hardly feel it, let alone move it. Too, it was getting harder for him to walk, he noticed. It was getting harder for him to do anything. He left behind the dumpster and sat down on the asphalt. He doubted the others would find him here. He had lied to Reba about going to the head. He didn't really need to take a leak. He liked Reba. She had a hot body. Ordinarily, he would be lusting after her voluptuous flesh. But he felt no desire for her whatsoever. All he could think about was eating. What was happening to him? He wondered in consternation. All he wanted to do was eat. The problem was, he could hardly move. If he couldn't move, how could he go foraging? Nevertheless, life was becoming simpler. No extraneous desires that only served to get in the way of the one desire that counted. To eat. He didn't care about his girlfriend Shirley anymore, or his mother or father or two sisters. None of them mattered. It was obvious to him now that they were redundant and obfuscated the one true meaning of life, to feed. He didn't care about his job. What job? He didn't even have a job. Nobody had jobs. His job didn't matter. It was so blindingly clear and simple, he wondered why he had never realized it before. The only thing that really did matter was eating. It was all about eating. Chapter 37 Maybe Felix is back, said Mannering, as they burst out of the stationery store, making a beeline for the horns blaring. Mannering, Halverson, and Victoria dashed to the sidewalk. They found Reba frantically leaning on the lead motor cart's horn. They didn't even have to ask what was wrong. They could see for themselves. There were only two motor carts parked on the sidewalk. Where the hell is Becker? said Mannering. He was already gone when I came back, said Reba, laying off the horn. Halverson and Mannering cased the area. No sign of Becker. When did he take off? asked Mannering. Halverson realized the money bag was missing from the back of his cart. Now he knew why Becker had split, but he didn't fill Mannering in. The less Mannering knew about the money, the better. It would just complicate matters. Becker had dumped the extra money bag on the cart's empty passenger seat to increase his take, then absconded, Halverson figured. He couldn't have gotten very far, said Reba. He hasn't been gone that long. 
At least he could have told us he was vamoosing, said Mannering. Did you find Felix? No, said Halverson. If he was using a restroom, he should have been back by now. He wasn't using any restroom. What happened with you? Reba asked, noting with concern that Halverson's hands were now untied. Halverson rubbed his sore, raw wrist, for the necktie chafed him. I can't be of any help with my hands tied. He nailed a couple of those things in there, said Mannering, nodding in agreement. Well, Felix isn't here, so I guess we don't have to worry about you killing him, said Reba. Problem is, Felix has the night vision goggles, said Halverson. Makes our job of seeing where we're going harder, said Mannering. And it makes him more dangerous than the other ghouls because he can see better than any of us. I don't understand. He's one of them by now, I bet. There you go, said Reba, shaking her head. You can't get it through your thick head that Felix isn't one of those things. The words were barely out of her mouth when a thirty-something male with an ash-blonde, scraggly beard just under an inch long lurched out of Wilshire Boulevard toward them. The creature had mussed-up long hair that matched the color of his beard. Wearing a hoodie with blue and red horizontal stripes and a white fall cap, the ghoul snarled and grimaced. The creature's bloodshot, white-filmed eyes squinted and glared at Reba as it closed in on her with groping desiccated hands curling into claws. Hank, said Halverson. He tossed his pitchfork to Mannering, who was standing closer to the ghoul than was Halverson. My pleasure, said Mannering, catching the pitchfork's wooden haft, one-handed. He dropped the shovel from his other hand and gripped the pitchfork with both hands. He thrust the prongs at the creature's head, split open its skull, and skewed its brains. The thing crumpled on the sidewalk. But I can't get over how those things look just like us, said Mannering, jerking the pitchfork free of the ghoul's ruined head and giving the corpse a goodbye kick. They look like us, but they're not us, said Halverson. They're already dead. They're things now, nothing more. Mannering brandished the pitchfork. This is a better weapon than a shovel any day. He handed it back toward Halverson. Halverson shook his head. You keep it. Are you sure? Halverson glanced back at his motor cart. I still have a spade in my cart. Thanks. We ought to be using this, said Reba, and hefted the persuader from her cart. Makes too much noise, said Halverson. Those things will be swarming all over us if they hear a shotgun blast. Speak of the devil, Reba nodded down the street. Halverson turned to look in the direction she had indicated. A horde of creatures were staggering down the sidewalk less than a block away toward them. "'Looks like we've worn out our welcome here,' said Victoria. Halverson, Mannering, and Victoria piled into their carts. "'I can't get my head around why Becker split,' said Mannering. "'He doesn't even have a gun. There's safety in numbers. Why go off alone?' "'He ran off with the—' Reba started to say— he probably didn't like our company, Halverson cut in. And it goes double for me, said Mannering. Didn't he have to resign from office because he was some kind of a deviant? A bunch of underage girls accused him of sexually harassing them with naked pictures of himself, said Reba. He's a disgrace. And? There's more? And then it really got sick when he started sending them videos of himself mass. Too much information, inserted Victoria. He can't have gotten far away, said Halverson. He hasn't been gone that long. We should be able to catch up with him. Question is, do we want to catch up with him, said Mannering. Yeah, we do, said Reba, sneaking a glance at the money bags in the rear of her cart. We definitely do. Mannering, who was sitting next to her but not looking at her, jacked up his eyebrows in surprise at her response. I heard he was a ladies' man. I guess that explains it. Reba shot him a look. No, it doesn't explain it. Mannering shook his head in bafflement. Then I don't get it. Let's get moving, said Halverson in the second cart. Those things are getting closer. Reba fired her ignition. She put her motor cart in gear. She peeled off, pulling away from the mob of creatures bumbling after them. Driving the second cart, Victoria followed suit. 
"'What's going to happen with Felix when he finds out we left without him?' asked Mannering. "'He's going to be pissed for sure. He needs to learn to shit or get off the pot,' answered Reba. Mannering chortled. "'He's learning that the hard way.' He hung fire. "'And I thought you liked the guy. I do. You have a strange way of showing it.' He caught sight of a delicatessen on his right. "'Stop a second. Are you crazy? Those things are right behind us.' I need a real weapon, not a bunch of gardening tools. What kind of weapon can you get into a delicatessen? Just stop a second, I'll show you. Against her better judgment, Reba hit the brakes. Mannering clambered out of his seat. I'll be back in three shakes, he belted into the delicatessen. What's going on? Big Mannering, gazing blankly ahead. That's what he said, said Reba. We better get going, said Halverson. Maybe we can find Becker. Why? said Mannering. Why should we care about him? He ditched us. Let him wander off somewhere and die. He's a fool and a perv. I care, said Reba. The nerve of that guy. Halverson knew she wanted the money back. He doubted she could care less about Becker. Unaware of the contents of the sacks, Mannering looked puzzled. A bespectacled fifty-something woman with auburn hair piled on her head in a beehive hairdo lurched out of the alley to his right. Her equine-wizened face was frozen into a grimace, her mouth hung open, exposing her green gums, as drool streamed out of the corners of her mouth. Moaning, she groped toward Mannering. Crap, not another one, he said. Enough is enough. He reared back and angrily kicked the creature in the waist. Stumbling backward, the haggard creature tried to grab Mannering's foot but was unable to get a hold of it, and lost her spectacles in the attempt. Reba put her car in gear and drove west. Victoria followed. We need to find Felix, Halverson told Victoria. Why do you keep harping on Felix? He has my sat phone. I may be able to find out what's going on in the rest of the country if I can get it back. Why is this happening? That's what I want to know. Why is what happening? These things roaming around eating people. The things are infected with plague. Then where did this plague come from? I've traced it back to China. China? How did you find that out? Through my research as a reporter, Halverson lied. He couldn't very well tell her he was working for the CIA. She searched his face and looked straight ahead again to see where she was driving. Why did it break out in China? I haven't found that out yet, he paused. I might be able to find out if I could get my hands on my sat phone. I don't know what you expect to find. The point is, we have to make contact with somebody who knows what's going on. Otherwise, we're merely wandering around blind. But does anybody know what's going on? That's what we have to find out. The agency was still his best bet, Halverson decided and the only way he could contact them was with his sat phone. He watched Victoria yawn. He, too, felt beat. They could all use some rest. Their adrenaline-cranked metabolisms were burning them out. But how could they sack out knowing thousands of zombies were massing around them? Halverson knew he and the rest of his crew needed to find a safe place before they would be able to get any shut-eye. So much for sleep. Chapter 39 This is hopeless, said Mannering. What are we trying to prove? He produced a can of beer he had bagged at the grocery store. He popped open the can and guzzled the beer. He pulled a face. Ugh, warm beer. Oh, well. It's better than no beer. He took another swig of the beer. Just don't get drunk, said Reba, her hands on the motor cart steering wheel, her eyes on the sidewalk she was navigating. Then what's the point? I don't want to be driving around with a juice head while those creatures are surrounding us. Manning chug-a-lugged the beer and crushed the aluminum can in his hand. He tossed a crumpled can onto the sidewalk to his right. The can clattered to a halt on the cement. I guess we don't have to worry about littering or recycling anymore, he said, and snagged another can of beer from the back of the cart. And you a cop. Reba squinted ahead. What's that? He followed her gaze. 
Looks like firemen standing around a motor cart. Joan of ours. Must be Becker. He's found some firemen. Maybe there's some kind of emergency government like Homeland Security still functioning after all. Reba drove to the next block to meet up with the three firemen gathered around Becker's cart. What's he doing? she said. It looks like he's arguing with them. Maybe they're trying to steal his cart. Reba drove closer to them. Hell, said Mannering. Those aren't firemen. Cleaver in hand, Mannering jumped out of its cart even as it was still moving and joined the melee. Indeed, Becker was driving off the firemen with his shovel, shoving them away when they got too close to him. The ravenous creatures kept scrabbling toward him. Terrified, he had his hands full, battling all three of the zombies at the same time. As soon as he pushed one away, another one came at him from a different direction. And he had to wheel around to defend himself from that onslaught. Manwing waded into the fracas, holding his cleaver raised over his head. He yelled, charged a shaggy-haired, six-foot-tall creature from behind, swung the cleaver, and decollated the creature in one fell swoop. The severed head flew off toward the road, bounced off a sports car roof, and dribbled onto the asphalt. The headless body collapsed on the sidewalk. One of the creatures stumbled around to face Manwing's assault. This creature Manwing punished with a vicious blow from the cleaver to the top of the creature's skull. The skull split in half as well as the brain inside it, sliced neatly in half by the cleaver's blade, which cut all the way through the skull to the throat. The two halves of the skull fell away from each other. The head bisected, the creature wobbled at its knees, then toppled to the sidewalk, as Mannering lifted the cleaver free from the thing's throat. Mannering let out a war hoop, brandishing the cleaver above his head. The cleaver's blade was smeared with the creature's oozing brain matter and shards of skull. The remaining creature groaned at the sight of Mannering and lumbered after him, clawing the air. This creature was well over six feet. Its navy blue uniform was stripped to shreds, revealing a blood-stained white T-shirt underneath it. The creature's clouded eyes glowered at Mannering. It grimaced and opened its huge jaws, lined with rotting green teeth. Mannering swiped at the creature. The cleaver's blade whistled through the air, and Mannering cut clean through the throat. The creature's sneering head plopped into Becker's lap. Shying in the driver's seat, Becker flung the head off his thighs and out of the cart. The head rolled onto the sidewalk. The head was still alive because its brain had not been destroyed, but Mannering figured the thing was harmless, lacking mobility. The head rolled to a halt, working its jaws. Fuck that thing, said Mannering, waving at the head in disgust. The head's body dropped to the sidewalk and sprawled motionless. Glad you guys showed up, said Becker. Sighing with relief, he wiped his sweaty brow with the back of his hand. We should have let those things tear you apart, said Reba, pulling her motor cart to a halt beside him. What are you talking about? You took something that doesn't belong to you. Reba eyed the money bag that sat in the passenger seat of Becker's cart. That belongs to me as much as it does to you. Mannering stood by and listened to the discussion with curiosity. Victoria drove up. Why do you take off without us? demanded Halverson, riding shotgun. I saw things coming down the sidewalk, answered Becker. Then why didn't you signal us? said Victoria. Becker hemmed and hawed. I panicked and ran for my life. Couldn't have panicked very much, said Reba. You took the time to take the extra sack with you. Nonpulsed, Becker gazed at her. At last he said, I didn't know what I was doing. You know exactly what you were doing, said Halverson. You don't give a damn about the rest of us, Reba told Becker. I was coming back to help you when those things attacked me, said Becker. Oh, sure. Then why is your cart pointed away from us? I was just about to turn around when the things bushwhacked me. The more lies you tell, the bigger they get. I should have let you get eaten by those things, said Mannering. Would have served you right. I admit I made an error in judgment, said Becker. I lost my head and fled. I made the wrong decision, I admit that. 
What more do you want from me? For starters, give us back that bag in your front seat, said Victoria. You swiped it from our vehicle. Becker hoisted the money bag and returned it to the back of Victoria's motor cart. That's a big deal. You know. You people sound like the media that tarred my reputation and forced me out of office with all the lies they told about me, he huffed. And what about all those girls that accused you of sexually harassing them, said Reba. Don't forget them. Can I help it if women are attracted to me? Power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. Everyone knows that. Ask Henry Kissinger. It wasn't his ugly face that turned women on. Henry Kissinger didn't harass women. Neither did I. Can I help it if women fantasize about becoming romantically involved with me? Rita sniggered. They had mass hallucinations, huh? You're too naive to know what it's like to be in the power hub of Washington, D.C. It's not your fault. I can't blame you. Not everyone can be rich or powerful or both. You just can't have any idea what it's like. Well, excuse me for not being rich. Said it's not your fault. Reba rolled her eyes. You are painting yourself into a corner every time you open your mouth, brother. He showed the photo to Victoria. Here's a picture of my brother Dan, he said. I hardly ever see him. It's my fault. My job keeps me busy twenty-four-seven. I should visit him more often. Don't hold it against yourself. She glanced over at the photo. You look similar. I don't think so. We're not at all alike. I wouldn't know. He's my only living relative. I really should make a point of seeing him more often or, at the very least, talking to him on the phone once in a while. It's too late now, probably, with the end in sight. You're bumming me out. Yeah, let's talk about something else. Where are your parents? They're both dead. Oh, Victoria paused. I guess I didn't choose the right subject, did I? That's okay. I don't mind talking about it. They died on 9-11, Victoria gasped. Oh, no. She held her hand to her cheek. They were both at the World Trade Center at the time it was attacked. How awful. That's the main reason I got into my profession. Journalism, I don't see the connection. Halverson realized he was running off at the mouth, revealing too much about himself. He couldn't tell her about his job with the agency. He had to extemporize with a believable lie. I wanted to make sense of what happened that day, he explained. I thought if I found out all that I could about why it happened, that would somehow make it easier to bear. That was indeed part of it, decided Halverson. Also, he wanted to make the perpetrators pay for their terrorist atrocity. So he joined the CIA. A fraught silence hung in the air between them. Victoria changed the subject. There's a picture of Shauna in my wallet, in my purse. Take a look. Halverson was only too glad to think of something else. He lifted her tan purse from the footwell. He rummaged through the purse and plucked out her white leather wallet. He opened the wallet and flicked through it till he noticed the photograph of a little blonde girl's smiling face. She wore her hair and pigtails. This must be Shauna, he said. Nobody's going to take her away from me. Not those creatures, not anyone ever. Halverson deposited Victoria's wallet back into her purse. He had no idea where Dan was. Dan had been injured in a car accident and hospitalized. How could Dan move around in his condition? Wondered Halverson. Could Dan somehow have returned to his residence? Dan had been bedridden at the UCLA Medical Center. How could he move around? Why are they doing that? Asked Victoria, hunching over the steering wheel with concern as she gazed ahead through her bloodshot blue eyes. What? They're heading in the wrong direction. Reba's turning left off Wilshire with Hank. I don't see those things around. What's the problem now? Chapter 41 why are you turning? Halverson called ahead to Reba and Mannering. It was Mannering who craned his neck around in the motor cart and answered, We're heading toward the police department for ordinance. We don't have time, said Victoria, steering wheel in hand. 
We need decent weapons to protect ourselves. Felix took both our pistols, Halverson reminded Victoria at his side. We already have a shotgun, but we don't ever use it, she said. Gunshots would attract the things. Then why get more guns if we're not even going to use them? I need to find my daughter ASAP. She could be in danger. Reba pulled to a halt. Victoria caught up with her. What about silencers? Halverson asked Mannering. We need silencers, too. We have sound suppressors at the department, said Mannering. We have everything. Glocks, six hours, h and Ks, stun grenades, flashbangs, you name it. Halverson thought about gunshots. There might be another way to find Felix, decided Halverson. You have any MP7s? he asked. He felt naked going into battle without an MP7. You betcha. All sorts of H and Ks. Mannering winked at Halverson. On full auto, too. Great. Mannering cocked an eyebrow at Halverson. Where'd you learn how to shoot an MP7? Not many people know how to handle one of those babies. Halverson stuck to his cover story. I wrote a magazine article about them once. The only guys I know that use MP7s are Navy SEALs. We have MP7s for our SWAT team, but those guys hardly ever use them. Manning scratched his bald head. I can't imagine who would want to read about MP7s. It was a, an article for a military magazine, Halverson ad-libbed. What's the problem? Reba asked Victoria. Why did you guys call out to me? My child. She might be at my house, answered Victoria. I need to find her. You don't know she's there. Halverson started thinking about gunshots again. He spotted a sixtieth male creature with tufts of white hair blooming around his bald pate, gimping through the intersection chock-a-block with parked vehicles. Halverson slid out of his seat, strode over to Reba's cart, commandeered the shotgun, and blasted the creature in the head. The creature's head burst like a melon. Blobs of brain matter huddled through the intersection and plastered windshields and hoods. "'What'd you do that for?' demanded Becker from his cart. Noise will bring those things from all around. That's the idea, said Halverson. You lost your mind. Reba, Victoria, and Mannering were all staring at Halverson in bewilderment. We need to find Felix, explained Halverson. If we can't go to Felix, maybe we can get him to come to us. You mean he might hear the shot and come here to investigate, said Reba. He'll come with the rest of the walking dead to investigate sure what Felix was wearing when he purportedly went to a restroom, and there was also the possibility that a ghoul had ripped off Felix's NVGs. But Halverson doubted that scenario. The ghoul couldn't eat it. A ghoul didn't want it. I think I see him, said Halverson. Where? asked Manring. In the third row. He's the only one wearing NVGs. Oh, yeah, I see him. You sure it's Felix? can't see his face. Who else would be wearing NVGs? One of these creatures could have flinched them from Felix. Halverson shook his head no. I doubt it. Why would they? They can't think. They don't know what NVGs are. Now, well, now, what do we do? said Becker. We go get him and get all his equipment. Felix! Reba hollered at the approaching creatures, waving at Felix. Over here! Creatures keyed on the sound of her voice and headed toward her. Why did you yell to him? Where to get us? demanded Becker. That's the whole point. We want him to know where we are, so he can rejoin us. Or am I missing something? I hate to disabuse you, Reba, said Mannering, but I think Felix is one of them now. No, he's not. He's hiding among those things, hiding in plain sight. He'll run toward us and join us as soon as he sees his opportunity. He's one of them, said Halverson. We're going to have to kill him. He cleared his throat. It, I mean. He can't be one of them, insisted Reba. He simply got lost back there and now he's found us, that's all. He'll be here any minute. If we wait for him to get here, we'll be surrounded by those things. We have to attack them now and get all of Felix's equipment. He'll come running over here any second. Just wait. Shotgun in hand, Halverson slid out of the motor cart's seat. I'm going after him. Anyone coming with me? 
Don't look at me, said Becker. He scratched the tip of his nose. This is your bright idea. Man, this is all about, isn't it? The plague is wiping out humanity. We have to fight it, or we'll turn into one of those things. Halverson pointed at the juggernaut of zombies, scrabbling arms and jerking legs, inching toward them, like a colossal centipede from hell. Chapter 43 How do you know Felix is one of them? asked Reba. He's with them, isn't he? answered Halverson. He's faking being one of them. Halverson chewed over her words. She could be right, said Mannering. He couldn't pull it off. They'd turn on him. They would sense he's alive and tear him to pieces. Maybe he's found some way of doing it, said Reba. The point is, you don't know for certain. Halverson didn't buy it. If he's faking it, why doesn't he run over here to us right now and join us? What's he waiting for? I don't know. I can't read his mind. She massaged her frowning brow and thought, We have to wait for him. We can't wait for him. At this rate, if we wait for him, we'll be surrounded by creatures when he gets here. Felix! Reba called out again and waved at him. Several of the zombies groaned at the sound of her voice, their diseased mouths watering at the prospect of a fresh morsel of living human flesh. Eyes fixed on nothing, the creatures kept plodding ahead inexorably. I say we attack and get Felix before we're surrounded and can't escape, said Halverson. Let's do it, said Mannering, hefting his cleaver. You can't kill him, pleaded Reba. We'll take off his goggles to make sure he's one of them before we kill him. Mannering turned to Halverson. How's that? Tired of arguing, Halverson nodded. We're not going to have a whole lot of time to screw around once we start killing those things. We have to hit them hard and get out of there in a New York minute. I hear you. There's hundreds of those things there. The longer we prolong the fight, the less chance of his crouch swatting his Mossberg at the nearest creatures. Go for it, he told Mannering. Mannering completed severing a large black male ghoul's throat and hunkered down over Felix's body. Lifting Felix by one arm, Mannering contrived to flip his cadaver over as a legion of zombie feet shambled ever closer to him. Mannering immediately spotted the two Glock pistols wedged inside Felix's rear waistband. He extricated one pistol at a time. He inserted the first one into his front waistband and rose with the second one clutched in his hand, firing at the oncoming throng of creatures and dropping two of them in their tracks. Got the Glocks, he said. Let's go, said Halverson. Halverson discharged another shotgun blast into a reeking, decomposing, overweight creature thrashing toward him. Halverson fell to backing away, covering his retreat with shots from his persuader. Mannering scragged the nearest two zombie heads that were leaning forward to take a bite out of his throat. At first the targeted creatures reeled back, but their corpses were then borne forward by the surging wave of creatures behind them. Mannering backtracked, wielding his cleaver in one hand and firing his pistol in the other, as the creatures kept coming relentlessly after him. He could see no end to the swarm of creatures that pursued him. "'These things are crawling out of the woodwork,' he said. "'Let's run for it,' said Halverson. Mannering squeezed his Glock's trigger one more time. The gun clicked empty. Mannering pulled the trigger again. The hammer snicked. Nothing doing. He and Halverson spun around and made a beeline for the motorcarts at speed. This is Suck City, said Mannering, breathing hard as he sprinted. Look at it this way. Can things get any worse than they are now? Mannering shrugged. I guess not. But they were both wrong. King lot across from it, full of black and whites. Wonderful. She pulled to a halt. Reba parked behind them. What's up? asked Reba. Victoria told her. Damn, growled Mannering. Those things got my buddies there. I hate those things. Let me see. Alverson handed the goggles to Mannering. Mannering placed them on his head. He shook his head discontentedly at the sight of the rampaging ghouls. He could see three ghouls tearing the throat out of a police officer who was blasting them in their hearts with his pistol to no avail. Other than that, Mannering saw no signs of life. 
Scores of ghouls were staggering in and out of the police department at will. Doesn't look like there's anyone in there beside those things, he said. Mannering handed the goggles back to Halverson. What should we do? asked Reva. We should check out the department just to make sure, answered Mannering. There are too many of those things over there, said Halverson. I hate leaving my buddies in there to get torn apart. Mannering's voice cracked. A straggling female creature in its thirties lurched down the sidewalk toward them. When Mannering clapped eyes on it, he lost it. In an access of rage, he leapt out of his seat, charging the thing, and loped its rotting head off with one powerful stroke of the cleaver. The head dribbled down the sidewalk, Mannering rabbing after the bobbing skull. The head was still alive. It grimaced at him with its foul, decaying mouth. Mannering snatched one of his glocks out of his waistband and blew a hole in the middle of the skull's forehead. The head stopped grimacing. Mannering grabbed the head by its black hair and hauled it back to the carts. Halverson watched Mannering carrying the head toward him. With its thick black hair and broad features, it had the face of a female Eskimo it looked like to Halverson. The face's cheekbones were exposed due to the disintegration and putrefaction of the flesh that had once enveloped them. As well, half of its thick gray lips had been eaten away by the ravaging effects of the plague. Don't bring that thing back here, said Reba in disgust. Get rid of it. Mannering kept his own counsel. He put the head in the footwell. In silence, he retrieved a shovel, sat down, and started sharpening the end of its wooden handle with his cleaver. He whittled the handle to a point. He laid his cleaver down. Steadying the upside-down head in the footwell with his feet squeezing the skull in place. Plunged the sharpened end of the handle into the bottom of the severed head through the throat and into the brain. He lifted the impaled head above the cart. He flourished the head, waving it at the creatures, trying to inflame them. You think they're bad? he snarled. We're ten times worse. Get rid of that thing, said Reba. Manwing ignored her. He twisted around in his seat and manhandled the money bags forward. Send these bags anyway, he said, straining to ship them. Reba said nothing. Mannering took the blade of the shovel and inserted it behind one of the money bags. Shoved the money bag against the blade to hold the shovel in place with the ghastly head looming over the motor cart. Reba climbed out of the driver's seat. I'm not driving with that thing leering over me. Mannering exchanged seats with her, nothing loath. Fine with me. He raised a war hoop and drove toward the creature-infested one-story brick police department. What are you doing? cried Reba in terror. There's only one thing these ghouls understand. Attack. Mannering flicked on his headlights. The lights will attract the things, said Reba. Good. He turned on the high beams. When the streeling ghouls saw the beams thrown by the headlights, they faced the lights and shambled toward the onrushing motor cart. Mannering leaned on his horn. Take a look at your friend's head on the end of a stake, Mannering hollered at the creatures. One hand on the steering wheel, Mannering opened fire with a glock in his other, cutting down the two near schools on a dime. These two especially scragglers there, I don't know. Does anybody else have a better idea? We need to get out of here, said Becker, who had, up to this point, remained silent. It ain't safe here with all those things milling around, said Mannering, that's for sure. Halverson and the others drove back to Wilshire. Halverson figured this was as good a time as any to put his call through to the agency. He pulled his sat phone out of his trouser pocket. He switched the phone on, punched in the access code, and put in a call to the agency. He listened intently to the phone ring four times, hoping beyond hope that somebody would answer. Somebody picked up. Hello? Halverson clenched the phone in eagerness at the sound of another voice, his knuckles turning white. Hello, said Halverson. Could I speak to Scott Mellers, the deputy director of the NCS? He kept his voice low so Victoria wouldn't be tempted to eavesdrop. Who is this? said the man at the other end of the line. Halverson. Halverson. We've been trying to contact you for days. Where have you been? I'm in L.A. Who is this? Halverson thought he recognized the man's voice, but he couldn't place it. This is Greg Coogan. Coogan? Halverson knew Coogan. 
They were both about the same age and were in the Black Ops Division of the National Clandestine Service. We've been trying to contact all our agents to get a sit rep from wherever they are, said Coogan. Tried to phone in earlier, but my phone wasn't working. What's it like in Los Angeles? It's a disaster. The whole city's either burning or already burned. The plague hit here. Infected people are attacking and eating whatever is left alive. Yeah, those are the kinds of reports we're getting from everywhere. Is the whole country infected? As far as we know, this plague is worldwide. Where's the president? What's left of the government is holed up in the Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center, just outside Bluemont, Virginia. It's bomb-proof, and we've got our own air supply to protect us from breathing permit from the Ministry of Infrastructure and the Environment. The Erasmus facilities have the highest level of security to prevent anyone from stealing the virus. Also, there's an isolation room if somebody by some remote chance does get infected. Somebody stole this bird flu virus from Erasmus? Is that what you're saying? Worse than that. Alverson shook his head in confusion, trying to digest Coogan's news. Bird flu doesn't cause zombies, not that I ever heard of. This isn't H5N1, or bird flu, as it's popularly called. H5N1 spreads between people only in very rare cases. When it does spread, it's 60% fatal. It's one of the deadliest microbes known to man. The Spanish flu back in 1918 killed 50 million people, but it had a kill ratio of only 3%. Can you imagine what would happen if H5N1 could spread as easily as the Spanish flu did between people? I don't see how this ties in with these flesh-eating creatures that are rising from the dead. The researchers were working on a man-made version of H5N1, one that is highly infectious and spreads rapidly between people. Why? Were they making it for germ warfare? They were making it to help invent a vaccination for H5N1. To make a long story short, they were able to mutate the H5N1 in their Erasmus labs into a highly infectious disease that has no known cure, is 100% fatal, and causes reanimation in the infected victims. I don't understand. We made this synthetic disease and infected ourselves with it? Alverson shook his head in confusion. The U.S. National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity told the Erasmus Center not to publicize the results of their findings lest terrorists might create the disease in their own labs and use it in biological warfare. No, if what you're telling us isn't bullshit, said Reba. You have to trust me. Famous last words, said Becker. I went to the Columbia School of Journalism. I know about the ethical rights of journalists. Halverson did actually attend Columbia on a scholarship to the renowned School of Journalism. That was also where the CIA had recruited him. Balderdash, huffed Becker. I always get ticked off when I hear reporters talking about ethics. You people have the mores of snakes. You overstep the bounds of privacy every day in your jobs as high-paid hacks. Then you have the gall to say you're ethical. People have the right to know the truth. They don't have the right to inspect my anus. I think I'm going to be sick, said Reba, forming a mental image of Becker's words. You're a public figure, Halverson told Becker. You must have known when you got into that line of work that you would lead a fishbowl life that would be scrutinized, publicized, and dissected, whether you liked it or not. Not to the point where you reporters trump up charges against me just to sell copy. Whatever, said Reba. The fact is, if we don't know the IDs of this source, why should we put any stock in what he says? I'm just relating to you what I was told, said Halverson. You can believe whatever you want. I know firsthand how you hacks devoid of ethics operate, said Becker. You'll turn over every rock to see what crawls out in the name of truth, and people's supposed right to know. I'm not telling you what to think. If JFK was alive today, I can't imagine what kind of trick about him you guys would be digging up and exposing in the name of truth. 
You guys weren't so self-serving and full of yourselves back in the day. I don't care about any of this, burst Victoria. I just want to find Shauna. But if the whole world's infected... Do you want to join up with us? asked Halverson. I don't want that stinking bum sitting next to me, said Becker. He's probably covered with lice and bugs. No, said the man in the bin, his voice echoing in the plastic chamber. Thank goodness, Becker heaved a sigh of relief. He's totally out of it, said Reba, gazing at the transient. Let's beat it, said Mannering. Something fell out of the sky and thudded on the sidewalk in front of Halverson. He started. The six-foot-four blonde creature now sprawled on the sidewalk in a yellow and green flowered print dress. It had broken at least one of its legs when it landed and was encountering difficulty trying to stand up. It looked like to Halverson. Halverson craned his neck upward. A three-story avocado stucco apartment house boarded the sprung sidewalk. Another creature was preparing to take a hike off a third-story balcony. A black, forty-something male in an ill-fitting off-the-rack suit. This creature was even taller than the blonde. The creature's black jacket hung open, and its glossy gold lining was torn and dangling over the creature's trousers. The bespeckled creature had black hair and a black mustache, both tinged with white. The ghoul was climbing over the wrought iron balustrade that bordered the balcony. Mannering didn't wait for the thing to jump. He drove his cart to the blonde creature on the sidewalk, snapped up his cleaver from the footwell, and whacked off the blonde's grimacing head. Driving forward, he narrowly missed being crushed by the second creature, which chose to take a dive off the balcony at that moment. Halverson and the others rode back to Wilshire. Chapter 47 When they reached Wilshire, they saw two teenagers bashing in the display window of a computer store with two metal waste baskets they had procured from the sidewalk. The window shattered, the teenagers banged out the remaining glass jags that protruded from the window stiles, tossed away the waste baskets, and bolted into the store. Looks like looters up ahead, said Victoria. At least they're not creatures, said Becker. I suppose I should bust the punks, said Mannering. Aren't you forgetting something? What? What are you going to do with them after you bust them? The creatures control the jailhouse. Ah, I could shoot the punks. I'm within my rights as a police officer to shoot looters. They're just kids, said Reba. And besides, we did the same thing. What do you mean? Mannering asked suspiciously. Reba hemmed and hawed, wary of informing him about the money in the sacks they were carrying. Oh, he stole the phone battery from the phone store. Mannering poo-pooed the notion. That was just petty theft. Those boys are jacking laptops, it looks like. What about the food we stole? That was petty theft, too. Reba rolled her eyes. You're blind to your own faults. I don't see why they're ripping off the laptops, said Halverson. What do they plan on doing with them? The Internet's down. They're not going to use them, said Mannering. They're going to sell them. So who's going to want to buy them with the Internet down? The fact of the matter is, they're robbing the store. That's all I know. Oh, the store is probably dead by now. That may be. That's not my call. I don't make the law. I enforce it. Looting is illegal. Those kids can't buy the laptops legally. How can they? If there's nobody there to buy the laptops from, asked Reba. That's true. Mannering scratched his bald pate. Never thought of that. We need to save our ammunition for the creatures, said Halverson. Maybe the kids want to join up with us, said Reba. The two teenagers burst out of the store. Each of them cradled a foot-high stack of laptops in their arms. They took one look at Halverson and the others and bailed out in the opposite direction. Eh, I guess not, said Halverson. Are you going after them? Becker asked Mannering. If this was any other time, I would. But not the way the things are now, answered Mannering. We're just like those kids, no different. You finally realize that, said Reba. Mannering turned to her. I've been wondering, where'd you guys get those sacks you've been carrying around with you? Halverson, Reba, Victoria, and Becker said nothing. Maybe you guys did a little shoplifting yourselves, huh? said Mannering. He shifted around in his seat and pulled the nearest money bag in the back of the cart toward him. 
Her eyes wide, Reba exchanged looks with Halverson. Manning unfastened a rope tied around the neck of the money bag. He peeked inside. Looky, looky what I found, he said. Whose money is this? Ours, said Becker. What are you going to do? Reba asked Mannering timidly. Bust us? If it really is your money, why would I bust you? Answered Mannering. He dug around in the sack with his hand. He withdrew a stack of hundred-dollar bills secured by a rubber band and flipped through them. This ain't exactly chump change. He stuffed the stack of C-notes back into the sack. I suppose you want in, said Becker. Being a police officer isn't the highest-paid job in the world. That's what I thought. You can have Felix's share, Reba told Mannering. You're all forgetting one thing, said Halverson. The others looked at him. That money's useless if nobody's left alive, he went on. We're seeing people here and there, said Mannering. I'm sure we'll find more. In any case, it's better to have money than not to have it, said Becker. Who said that? asked Victoria. Shaw? It was Hemingway, into have and have not, answered Mannering. Wasn't either of them, said Becker. It was me. You never know when we're going to need money. We always need money, said Mannering. You're not going to bust us? asked Reba. For what? For guarding our money? Mannering shook his head. No. Hank, I like the way you think, said Becker. Times they are changing. The more they change, the more they stay the same, like the French say. This calls for celebration. Mannering popped open a can of beer. How can you fight those things if you get soused? said Halverson. You mean, how can I fight those things if I stay sober? He's got a point, Becker told Halverson. It's hard enough on the eyes just looking at those monsters when you're sober. Mannering shotgunned warm beer. He pulled a face and wiped suds off his mouth with the back of his hand. The stuff's getting warmer by the minute, he said. Oh, well, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Belching, he crumpled and tossed away the empty beer can. I hope you're wrong about that, said Becker. Do you really think we've got much longer to live, Senator? Mannering's words put a chill in the air. An uneasy silence followed. That reminds me, said Becker. I need to catch some Z's. I'm beat. I thought you were hungry, said Halverson. Becker scooped up an open plastic bag of Fritos from the rear of the motor cart. I've been eating these things. They're not very filling, though. Halverson gazed up at the sky. It was still hazy with smoke borne by the offshore breeze. We're not going to be able to sneak in any rack time, he said. Looks like it's getting lighter. Dawn must be right around the corner. Becker looked up. Two seagulls gyred and cried overhead on the lookout for food, gliding in the currents of gusting Santa Ana winds. At least there's some sort of life still left on this planet, said Becker, watching the swooping gulls. The plague must not affect all living things, said Halverson. Maybe it doesn't spread between species. I don't have a problem sleeping in the daytime, said Mannering. You could get used to it when you work a lot of graveyard shifts like I do. We don't have time to sleep, said Victoria. I have to find my child before it's too late. Reba yawned and stretched her arms over her head. I'm beat, too. Halverson picked up on a herd of the living dead, massing about a block away to the east. We can't sleep here, he said. We've got guests. Not again, said Reba. Victoria put her motor cart in gear and drove west on the sidewalk. They had to keep driving on the sidewalks because the streets were still chock full of abandoned motor vehicles. I miss the smell of cooking, sighed Becker. Right about now, the aroma of bacon and eggs frying in a pan would be heavenly. All I can smell is smoke, said Mannering from his seat beside Reba in the cart behind Becker's. And stinging my eyes. Is there anything more mouth-watering than the pungent order of bacon frying in the morning? Fat steak sizzling on a barbecue is pretty damn mouth-watering, too, said Halverson. Just the image of the steak he was conjuring in his mind was tantalizing, decided Halverson. 
Out of the corner of his eye, he glimpsed the curve of Victoria's cleavage exposed now that the top three buttons of her blouse were undone, as she sat in the driver's seat beside him. Had they always been undone? He could not recall. All he knew was this was the first time he had become aware of her prominent breasts. Happy days are over, said Reba. We have to fight the plague. Every day now will be a battle for this planet. Reba was right, Halverson knew. They couldn't waste their time daydreaming about succulent steaks and open blouses and the way things used to be. They all had to get their heads around the fact that things had changed for the worse and it didn't look like things were going to improve any time soon. What was he thinking of anyway, he wondered. His life was a train wreck when it came to personal relationships. It was one of the hazards of his profession. How could he confide in anyone when he was a professional spy? There was always a wall between him and other people, including women. The life of a spy was a lonely one. Neither the plague nor anything else was going to change that. He had no time to think of Victoria. He had to focus on surviving one more day, as did they all. While they drove across the street to the next block, Halverson discerned two figures walking on the sidewalk out of the west toward them. Didn't look good, he decided. Creatures not only behind them, but now in front of them as well, could spell a debacle. The creatures could whipsaw Halverson and his crew. Chapter 48 Alverson raised his night vision goggles to his head. They had been hanging around his neck. Do you see what I see? asked Victoria. Trying to get a better look at them, answered Alverson, peering through his goggles. Friend or foe? In the electric green landscape, Alverson made out two males. One looked about six feet tall. The other looked a tad shy of it. The shorter one was rangy and sixty-something with a gray crew cut. He was holding something to his throat and talking to his companion. Halverson was too far away to hear him. Likewise, the guy was too far away for Halverson to identify the object in the guy's hand, especially with the greenish tint the NVGs afforded the object. Whatever it was appeared to be about half a foot long. The guy's tall companion looked to Halverson like he was pushing thirty. He was wearing an Aloha shirt, khaki Rubina shorts, and leather sandals. It was a large object perched on his right shoulder and appeared to be moving. We need to get closer, said Halverson. Victoria shrugged. Sure, swan song. I think they're okay. They're not lurching. They're walking purposefully. They don't have that thousand-yard stare of the creatures, but... But what? We need to get closer so I can see what they're carrying. He removed the goggles. What's wrong? These things aren't helping much, said Halverson, glancing down at his goggles. As the two figures came closer into view, Halverson could see that he was right. There was something alive sitting on the tall man's shoulder. What's that on his shoulder? asked Victoria. It's like a giant lizard of some sort. Maybe it's a Gila monster. No, I bet I know what it is. It looks like an iguana. A friend of mine has one for a pet. Hers is much smaller. I guess hers is a baby. That one looks like it's at least two feet long. Aren't they poisonous? A Gila monster is venomous, not iguanas. Iguanas might bite, though. I don't know. She watched the iguana. It has pretty colors. The iguana was a bright green with fluorescent orange and lavender splotches. Those guys must be okay, said Halverson. I can't imagine zombies keeping an iguana for a pet. What's that old guy have in his hand? Been trying to figure that out. Now that the guy was closer, Halverson got a better view of the object. It looks like a microphone. Yeah. Circumspectly, Victoria drove to a halt in front of them. She wasn't a hundred percent convinced they were human. Hello, Halverson greeted them. Hi, said the tall man with the iguana. I'm Sean. That's Ron. And this is Newton the iguana. Sean nodded toward the pet, sitting on his shoulder. Glad to meet you. I'm Chad, and that's Victoria. Isn't he dangerous? Victoria asked, gesturing toward the iguana. No, not at all. He's a green iguana. He's a herbivore. He eats plants. He's very laid back. He'll sit on my shoulder for hours at a time. Sean glanced at the iguana on his shoulder and smiled. 
doesn't want to move unless he absolutely has to. With its serrated dorsal crest and expansive dewlap, it looked ominous like a small dinosaur, decided Halverson. You don't see many of those round here, he said. They have to be kept warm, said Sean. Iguanas need to live in a tropical environment. Then he should love these Santa Ana winds. Isn't it kind of a hassle carrying him around with you? asked Victoria. Actually, he helps me, both Ron and me, that is. How? Oh. He's a watchdog. Victoria looked puzzled. I don't get it. He has excellent vision, better than ours in the daytime. He can see those flesh-eaters sooner than we can. Manring, Reba, and Becker drove up. What is this? asked Becker, sizing up Sean and Ron and their pet. Traveling circus? Sean didn't look amused. Not only can he see better than us in the daytime, Newton also has a third eye. Becker scrutinized the iguana. Whatever that thing is, I see only two eyes on it. It's on the top of his head. It's a pineal eye. It's white. It doesn't see images, but it senses motion. Comes in handy when the flesh eaters start diving off the roofs of buildings. Do you know about that? We found out about it firsthand, said Halverson. Newton can see those things above us before we can. Anything that gives you an edge, said Mannering. Excuse me, Becker told Halverson. But why are we stopping to have a coffee glance here? I hate to remind you, there's a mob of those starving things following us. Halverson wondered if Becker had any redeeming values. Ron put the microphone against his throat. Where are you headed? he asked Halverson in a metallic purr. He had an operation on his vocal cords, explained Sean, glancing at the mic. Cancer, you know. We're heading west, said Halverson. What about you? We're from Culver City. We're going north. We heard Washington might not be infected. There's a rumor going around to that effect. How's Culver City? asked Victoria. Sean shook his head. It's infested with cannibals. They're not really cannibals. They're dead. For dead things, they sure get around. They contracted the plague and are now the living dead, said Halverson. Whatever they are, they're all over the place. They bit my wife, said Ron, with the help of his mic. She was on her deathbed when she got up and attacked me. She came within inches of biting me. I had to run for my life. Sorry to hear that, said Victoria. She was already dead when she came after you, if that's any consolation, said Halverson. You can't imagine what it was like. Ron hung fire, waxing gloomy at the memory. Whole life's been turned upside down. None of us is getting off easy, said Halverson. I'm trying to find my brother. I don't know if he's infected or not. I'm trying to find my little girl, said Victoria. We need to suck it up and keep going. But I saw my wife literally torn apart by those ghouls, said Ron. It happened right in front of my eyes in my own living room. I snatched her out of their hands and ran. I thought I could staunch her bleeding and save her, but like I already told you. Victoria started trembling, fretting that Shauna might have met with the same fate. We ran into a pack of those creatures maybe ten blocks south of here, said Sean. There must have been thousands of them. They seem to hunt in packs, said Halverson. That's what makes them so dangerous. There are so many of them. Sean nodded. It's easy to kill the stranglers. They're lousy fighters because they're so slow and uncoordinated. We've been walking all night and we're wiped out, said Ron. We haven't got any sleep either, said Halverson. How can anyone sleep knowing those things are roaming around? Maybe there's safety in numbers, said Sean. Maybe we should join you guys. Victoria was about to say something when Mannering cut her off. We don't have room for any more, he said. That's true, added Becker. Mannering was gazing at a money bag in his cart. It was obvious to Halverson that Mannering didn't want any more partners to share the money with and thereby diminish his cut. The same went for Becker. After all, he was the guy who had tried to steal the loot and increase his share earlier, Halverson knew. Don't you guys have any luggage? Victoria asked Sean. We were fleeing for our lives, Sean answered. We didn't have time to take anything with us. 
We don't have any money, said Ron in his electronically modulated voice. Why do you need money if the population is wiped out everywhere, said Halverson. Money only matters if you live in some... Newton knew it wouldn't be dark much longer. He sensed that dawn would break soon, and he would be able to luxuriate in the SoCal sunshine. All told, he would rather be in hot, sultry Columbia, but SoCal wasn't bad. The food here wasn't as good as it was in his hometown of Medellin, Colombia. Newton didn't mind as long as he ate his full share of leaves, flowers, and fruits. Wild plums were a favorite of his Medellin. Here in SoCal, he liked Bougavilla leaves to munch on. Just thinking about flowers and leaves made his mouth water. He ached to nosh on flowers and leaves in the near future. He didn't like the animal life here. Back in Colombia, they didn't have two-legged creatures that dropped out of the sky without warning. Luckily, his white penny lie in the top of his head could detect them above him and warn him of their presence. He had no doubt these two-legged creatures that dropped out of the sky would eat him without the slightest reluctance. Their body heat was even lower than his. He had no idea what that meant, except it probably boded ill for him. He certainly wouldn't want to sit on one of their shoulders like he was doing now on Sean's. With his pineal eye, he twigged movement above him. Not good. A hawk? He wondered. No. He hated hawks. If it was a hawk, Newton would have frozen in order not to be seen. But it wasn't a hawk. It was bigger than a hawk. It was bigger, and it was descending. Not good at all. He had no desire to be in the flight path of one of those two-legged, frigid things that couldn't even fly. Newton fell to hissing and bobbing his head. Chapter 50 Those things are near, said Sean, glancing askance at Newton's antics. I don't see any, said Mannering, scanning the vicinity. Before the words were out of his mouth, one of the creatures fell out of the air and thudded onto the sidewalk the better part of three feet in front of Victoria's motor cart. She let out a scream of surprise. Halverson startled in his seat beside her. We need to move away from here, he said. There's probably more where that one came from. He craned his neck upward and searched the top of the six-story corporate building that loomed above him on his right. Another creature was on its way down even as Halverson looked up. It thudded next to the first creature and started squirming on the sidewalk. Both of its decomposing legs had suffered compound fractures in the fall. Victoria lost no time in putting the cart in gear and driving forward around the writhing creatures. The first creature was a female with a short brunette beehive hairdo. The middle-aged creature wore spectacles with clear plastic frames. The pockmarked face with livid, slowing skin. The creature had contrived to stand up, but was struggling to remain upright since both of its feet had been fractured in its fall. The creature was attempting to walk on the sides of its broken feet, but with little success. Nevertheless, it took a swipe at Halverson with its gnarled, deteriorating fingers as he rode in his cart past it. Halverson shied away from the hand before it could make contact with his flesh. At that moment, the display window of the shoe store behind Sean and Ron exploded outward. Lumbering ghouls crashed through the glass, showering both the sidewalk and the two men with slivers of glass. Ghouls pawed and elbowed the glass in the display window, shattering it even as jagged shards of it sliced through their clothing and limbs. Creatures used their heads, too, to bash through the window, ignorant of the edged fragments of glass that slit their faces and throats. As the creatures stomped through the display case, they kicked new shoes out onto the grass-strewn sidewalk. A sixty-something white-haired female ghoul, with a particularly twisted and rotting face, had both her ears sheared off by the glass as she plowed through the display window head first. One ear remained pinned on a tooth of glass that projected from a window stile. Ghouls continued piling through the broken window and onto the sidewalk, heedless of the shoes they stumbled on and the glass fragments that littered the cement. Sean and Ron had been standing the closest to the window when it had burst out of the shoe store. It had happened so suddenly that they had not had time to react. They stood nonpulsed as shivers of glass flew over them. At last their bodies kicked into gear. They cringed as the glass pelted them. Newton the Iguana dug his claws into Sean's shoulder to gain purchase as Sean hunched to shield himself from the hurtling glass. 
One of the ghouls reached for Newton's tail. Newton felt the ghoul's cold flesh as it grabbed his tail. Newton let his tail break off in the ghoul's hand and sprang off Sean's shoulder. Newton hit the sidewalk unhurt and scampered underneath a Cadillac parked on Wilshire. Sean wasn't so fortunate. A ghoul snared Sean's neck, sank its sallow teeth into his throat, and ripped out the juggler, along with a blob of bloody flesh. Sean screamed in pain and horror. Ron tried to rend the creature away from Sean and staunch the blood fountaining from Sean's throat. A stocky ghoul, traipsing up to Ron's side, had other ideas. The creature collared Ron's throat, clamped its teeth round Ron's nose, and tore the nose off his face, splashing Ron's face with blood. The creature stood in front of Ron and chewed his nose. Ron's eyes bugged out of his head on account of the pain that shot through his mutilated face. Victoria reversed her motor cart and drove towards the melee. Halverson whipped out his Mossberg and fired blasts at the creatures mobbing Sean and Ron. Scores of ragged creatures were now piling out of the broken display window. As soon as they stepped onto the sidewalk, they surrounded Sean and Ron. Ron continued to try to fight free of the ghouls. Meanwhile, Sean sank to the sidewalk in a heap, unconscious from loss of blood that still flowed from his wounded neck. The gutter ran with his blood. Ghouls crouched over him, sealing his fate. Halverson discharged more rounds into the ghouls. Mannering entered the fracas, firing both of his glocks as Reba drove him toward Halverson's cart. There were simply too many of the creatures, and Halverson and Mannering both knew it. Halverson also knew that Sean was beyond help and that Ron had been infected when the ghoul had bitten his nose off. Nevertheless, Halverson and Manning tried to barge their way through the ghouls to free Ron from the grasps of the creatures. But the sidewalk was thick with creatures that kept pouring out of the shoe store. Any moment now, the creatures would polish off Sean and Ron and turn their attentions to Halverson and the others, Halverson knew. We better pull out of here, he said as he fired another blast at the creatures with his shotgun. Manning heard one of the glocks click empty. We don't have much choice. There's no way we can mow down all those things without more firepower. And all this racket we're making will attract more of those things. We may end up getting hemmed in, said Mannering, craning his neck around, making sure the coast was clear behind them. Where'd Newton go? asked Victoria. I think he got away. He ran into the road somewhere. We'll never find him. He can take care of himself. Becker drove up to them after a hanging back on the sidelines. We don't have time to worry about a stupid iguana, for Christ's sake. We need to get out of here. And thanks for your help, said Mannering. I was guarding the money. Oh, yeah. I guess that's why you didn't run away. You wanted to make sure all of the money's safe. Stop it, said Reba. Let's just get out of here while we still can. The road remained. To avoid them, they kept on the sidewalks. As long as they didn't run into any ghouls shambling around... They should arrive at Victoria's house soon, decided Halverson. He heard a rumbling overhead like that of a plane. Eagerly he looked up. It might be a passenger jet, he hoped, meaning there were more survivors of the plague. Is that a jet? asked Victoria, pricking up her ears at the roaring. It was flying awful low for a passenger's jet, decided Halverson. In fact, it wasn't a passenger jet. No, he answered. Then what is it? It's a drone. He recognized it. It had the gawky, unmistakable shape of an MQ-1 predator. Besides using them for recon, the agency used them to take out al-Qaeda terrorists in the Middle East. The federal government wasn't allowed by law to use armed drones domestically. The question was, what was it doing here? Halverson heard honking behind him. He turned his head around. It was Reba. She was waving at the drone. That's a plane, she said. It can't hear you honking from here. Only those creatures will hear you. Reba brought her car to a halt. She ceased honking. She and Mannering gazed into the smoky, hazy sky and waved excitedly at the drone. Victoria stopped her cart. Becker followed suit. Likewise, he commenced waving at the aircraft. They're coming to rescue us, exclaimed Reba, smiling. They can't see us, said Halverson. Why not? They're not flying very high not a plane. What do you think it is, a bird? It's a drone, said Mannering, less exuberant now, and lowered his hands. The government flies those things over Afghanistan. They don't have pilots. 
Still has a camera, said Becker, who continued waving at the aircraft. They use drones for surveillance. The government's probably searching for survivors of the plague. Drones are also used to attack people, said Halverson. They could have traced his call, but why send the drone to keep tabs on him? The drone kept flying in the same direction through the smoky sky without altering its course. There was no indication the craft had registered the presence of human life, decided Halverson. They didn't see us, said Reba crestfallen. They can't see through the smoke, maybe, said Mannering. It might turn back any minute now, said Becker. I'm not waiting, said Victoria. My house is just ahead. Chapter 52 Victoria drove two blocks down 26th Street to her compact, Spanish-style, yellow-painted stucco bungalow that had a pitched red, pan-tiled roof. She didn't care if the others were following or not. The sooner she found Shauna, the better. Her house hadn't burned, she saw with relief. That in itself was miraculous. She turned into the driveway and parked in front of the garage door. Nice crib, said Halverson, admiring the cozy bungalow with its red-tiled roof and small windows with black wrought-iron grills. I like it. You're lucky it didn't burn down, said Halverson. I know. If only Sean is all right. A terracotta footpath led from the driveway to the varnished wooden, chased front door of the bungalow. I hope she's here, said Halverson. If she's not, I don't know where else to look. I know what you mean. I don't know where to look for Dan. Your brother? Yeah. Maybe he's at home. Halverson had never thought of that. It was so obvious that he had glossed over it. But it didn't help. The problem is he moved recently and didn't get a chance to tell me his new address, he said. They don't see each other very often. He lives here and I live in Virginia. Reba and Mannering pulled into the driveway behind Victoria. I thought you were waiting for the drone to return, Victoria told Reba. We can wait here, said Reba. We figured you might need help, said Mannering. Becker pulled into the driveway. Look who the cat dragged in, said Reba. I used to hate my job, dealing with all the riffraff and morally challenged scumbags of the world, said Mannering. Compared to this plague shit, that was heaven. Morally challenged, said Becker, pretending to be impressed with Mannering's selection of words. You act surprised that a cop would have gone to college and gotten a degree. I thought you spent all your leisure time getting soused. It came after college. When you had to deal with the riffraff. And don't forget the morally challenged scumbags, said Mannering, staring pointedly at Becker. Are you trying to insinuate something? Mannering said nothing. If the shoe fits, chirped in Reba. Becca shot her a dirty look. Halverson and Victoria clambered out of their motor cart. Mannering followed them as they trod the curved path to the door. A foot-high green ceramic planter with pink begonias bracketed either side of the door jam on the terracotta patio. When they reached the door, Halverson and Victoria noticed it was hanging ajar some two inches. Not good, decided Halverson. Victoria took another view of it. Shauna must be here. She shoved open the door and strode eagerly into the living room. Halverson and Mannering exchanged looks. Halverson raised his weapon, and Mannering did likewise. Guns at the ready. They slipped into the living room. Shauna, called Victoria. A foreboding silence filled the house. A white lace curtain stirred at the behest of a breeze that stole through the open window into the living room. Halverson didn't hear anything other than rippling and gentle slapping of the curtain's fabric in the wind. A brightly colored throw rug lay in front of a fawn leather sofa that faced a fifty-inch flat-panel high-definition plasma TV mounted on the wall. Halverson, cast around the room, saw no signs of life. Victoria headed down the hallway into Shauna's bedroom. Victoria couldn't restrain herself. She sprang into the bedroom and searched for Shauna. A little girl was sitting on a wooden stool, watching a blank TV screen, her back toward Victoria. Victoria was beside herself with joy. Overcome, she just stood there watching Shauna for a moment. Victoria came to her senses. 
She decided she wanted to capture this moment for eternity. She withdrew her cell phone from her purse, trained the video recorder on Shauna and said, Shauna? Shauna turned around slowly. Victoria had the video recorder on and was watching Shauna through the lens as Shauna turned her head. It's me, sweetie, said Victoria. Her face drawn, her eyes hollow. Shauna was hanging her mouth open as she turned around, got to her feet, and approached Victoria. She was wearing a pink pinafore that reached her knees. Shauna looked terrible, decided Victoria, as she lowered her cell phone. She decided she didn't want to record this moment for posterity. Her hair a mass of snarls, Shauna trudged towards Victoria with outstretched arms. Halverson burst into the bedroom. He shoved Shauna away from Victoria with his shotgun's muscle. Shauna tripped over her feet and fell to the floor. She landed on her knees. What are you doing? cried Victoria. She's one of them, said Halverson. Shauna struggled to her feet, her face livid. She continued to hang her mouth open, exposing yellow and black cracked teeth. She's just suffering from stress and exhaustion, said Victoria, holding out her arms, beckoning Shauna. Shauna gazed at Victoria through clouded eyes and trudged toward her. Shauna's dead, said Halverson. That's not Shauna. Shauna clasped Victoria's outstretched arm and drew it toward her gaping mouth in order to bite it. Halverson could not bring plugged it twice in the chest with his pistol. The suit jerked back a step but didn't fall. It wasn't dead. It wasn't even wounded. But the creature's retreating permitted Mannering enough time to bring his pistol to bear on the thing's forehead. Mannering squeezed his Glock's trigger. The round drove into the thing's forehead and tore a tennis ball-sized hole out of the back of the thing's skull. Taking with it bone spalls and blobs of brains that slammed into the wall behind it and dribbled down the echo print. We gotta get out of here, he said. The creature fell back against the wall and slid down it until it sat dead on the floor. The creature's head dropped forward on its white shirted chest. Halverston snagged Victoria's wrist and wrenched her off the bed. We have to go. There may be more of those things in here, said Mannering. He craned his neck around, checking to make sure no creatures were sneaking up on him from behind. An Amazon staggered out of the bedroom and groped for Mannering just as he entered the corridor outside Shauna's bedroom. The creature had spiky gray hair that stuck out of its head like it had stuck its finger in an electric socket. Its face looked like it had gone through a meat grinder. Maggots were now writhing out of the suffocating flesh. Mannering dodged the creature's hand, wincing in disgust at the sight of the creature. Mannering squeezed off a round into one of the creature's white-coated eyes. The nine-millimeter slug made short shrift of the creature's brain. Mannering, Halverson, and Victoria stormed out of the front door of the bungalow. They piled into their motor carts. Since Victoria was in no condition to drive, Halverson climbed into the driver's seat of their cart. Mannering sat beside Reba in her cart. Another ghoul lumbered out of the bungalow's front door and stumbled toward Halverson. Halverson blew the creature's head off. Becker backed out of the driveway first, followed by Reba, and then lastly Halverson. They headed back towards Wilshire. Third gunshot, said Victoria, glancing at the creature stumbling toward them. Drones have infrared sensors, said Mannering, putting away his Glock. They should be able to key on our body heat. The fires burning around us are emitting heat, too, said Halverson. Too many sources of heat may be confusing the sensors. If we only had a flag we could wave, said Becker, or something like a flag. Halverson noticed a tiny red dot appear on his chest. Chapter 54 on the spot, adrenaline surging through his system, Halverson took stock of the neighboring buildings, searching for the most durable one. Eyes wild, he slammed on his brakes, throwing Victoria forward in her seat. Flabbergasted, she sat straight upright. She stared at him like he had lost his mind. "'Everybody into the bank!' he screamed and bolted out of his cart. He scrammed for the bank on his right. "'What the hell's going on?' yelled Becker. "'Run for cover!' Baffled, the others decided to run after Halverson into the bank. They piled into the bank in a mass of confusion. "'What's this all about?' said Mannering. 
The plane's not going to see us if we're in here, said Reba, put out. Halverson's eyes flickered around the bank's interior. We need to get behind the safe. That's our only chance. Why are you having a cow? demanded Becker. Are you losing it? Pull yourself together, man. The vault's behind the teller's windows, said Mannering. And those windows are bulletproof, said Halverson. That'll help. But we can't get into the teller's office without a key card. Halverson dashed toward the back door. Let's get outside the building, so we're behind the vault. Becker shook his head in confusion. First you want us inside the building, now you want us outside it. You've got to be nuts. They heard a shrieking whistle in the sky above. Everybody out, hollered Halverson. What's that sound? said Becker, his eyes popping out of his head. They scrambled through the back door. A split second later, the bank exploded. A screaming missile tore into the bank from the side of the building that faced they thought he was still alive. If they tracked his phone moving again after the missile attack, they would figure out that he was still alive and attack again. He struggled to his feet. His knees were sore. He had to bark them when he had dived onto the asphalt. He looked around. He spotted a pack of zombies shambling on the other side of the street. He removed his sat phone from his pocket and hurled the device at them. The sat phone landed at their feet and skidded to a halt on the cement sidewalk. The creatures paid no attention to it. Only living things had arrested them. "'What did you do that for?' asked Victoria, standing up beside him. She brushed dirt off her blouse and arms. "'It's broken,' he lied. "'Not much of a weapon, is it?' she said, watching the creatures ignore it at their feet. "'I'm totally confused,' said Reba, standing up. "'Did the drone just try to kill us, or what?' Becker was lucky to be alive. He had barely squeezed through the bank's back door when the missile had slammed into the bank. The force of the blast had blown him the rest of the way through the door and sent him somersaulting into the parking lot. Uh, all over, he groaned, sitting on the asphalt beside a black BMW sedan. Mannering sat on the hood of a silver Mustang GT, his hands gripping the front of the hood. Can't get my head around it. Why did that plane try to kill us? It wasn't a plane, said Halverson. It was the people operating it. Same question. Why? I'd say the government is operating that drone, said Becker, adjusting his disheveled jacket as he sat. Who else would have access to a drone, especially a predator armed with a missile? Sounds right to me. The question remains, though, why? Maybe they thought we were zombies, said Victoria. How could they mistake us for zombies, said Becker. I don't know. None of it makes any sense to me. Why is the government trying to kill their own people? Don't look at me, said Reba. I stupidly thought they were going to rescue us. Becker managed to stand up, levering himself off the ground with the help of the BMW front bumper. He smoothed his jacket. Then he faced Halverson. Something's bothering me about this whole affair, said Becker. Only one thing, said Mannering. How did you know before the fact that that drone was going to attack us? Becker asked Halverson. If it wasn't for him, we'd be dead, said Mannering. I wouldn't complain about it if I was you. I'm trying to find out what's what, Becker returned his attention to Halverson. How did you know? Halverson figured he should level with them on that score. Saw a red laser dot on my chest. I figured the laser was coming from the drone. Maybe it was simply sensing you. How did you know it was targeting you? A red laser dot aimed at your chest is not a good sign. I wouldn't want one on mine, agreed Mannering. Can we stop with the twenty questions, said Reba. We need to regroup and take stock of our situation. Not until somebody answers my question said Becker. Why does our own government want us dead? Chapter 55 Nobody answered right away. Beats me, said Mannering. I'm not sure of anything anymore. I'm not even sure if we have any government left. Somebody's operating that drone, said Becker, shooting his cuffs. My bet is it's the government. You won't get any argument out of me. Becker addressed Halverson again. Why did the government try to kill us? Becker paused and thought, then added, Or was the government trying to kill you, specifically? 
Becker was uncomfortably close to the truth, decided Halverson. Halverson figured the missile had indeed been meant for him and him alone. The death of the others would have been mere collateral damage as far as Mellorus and the agency were concerned, said Becker. It was your cart that got busted, said Mannering. It could just as easily have been yours. Victoria put into words what everybody else was thinking but didn't want to say. We could dump out some of the money bags and put somebody in the back of the cart. No way, said Becker. Absolutely not, said Mannering. Hell no, said Reba. That money's not going to do us much good if everybody in the world is dead, said Halverson. We don't know that everybody's dead, said Becker. Frankly, it's hard for me to swallow. It's a big world out there. The idea that a single virus could wipe out the entire population of Earth is flat-out nonsense. The Black Death nearly did it back in the Middle Ages. Fact is, it didn't do it. Then who wants to stay behind? Nobody answered. We don't have a whole lot of time here, people, to figure this out, said Mannering. Those things are getting nearer every minute. A throng of the creatures shuffled relentlessly down the sidewalk toward them. I say we leave Halverson behind, said Becker. Why, said Mannering. He's the one that caused the missile attack in the first place. If it wasn't for him, we'd still have three carts. If it wasn't for him, we'd all be lying dead here beside these motor carts. But we wouldn't even have been attacked if it wasn't for him. I say Halverson stays behind. That's funny. I was thinking of nominating you to stay behind. Becker did a double take. He couldn't believe his ears. You're my second choice. You know why I picked you? Because all you care about is your own skin? No. Because all you care about is your own skin. Remember when you tried to abscond with the money? He has a point, said Reba. Yeah, said Victoria. She faced Becker. Why should we do you any favors? You couldn't even save your own daughter, said Becker. What gives you the right to decide who stays behind? Victoria's face drained of blood. She looked ill at the mention of Shauna. You ought to watch your mouth, Halverson told Becker, grabbing Becker by the lapels of his jacket. You ought to do the right thing and stay behind because you're the one causing all of the problems, said Becker, trying to disengage himself from Halverson's grip. Sneering, Halverson shoved Becker away from him. Becker stumbled backward. Recovering his balance, he smoothed his jacket as though it had been contaminated. If we all kill each other, we'll have plenty of room in the carts, said Mannering. I'm the only one here fit to make a decision. I'm an ex-senator. I know how to lead. None of you do. You've all proven yourselves unfit for leadership. And I say Halverson stays behind. Becker walked over to his upended cart, retrieved one of the money bags that had spilled into the cracked cement sidewalk, and hauled the sack to Victoria's motor cart. He proceeded to hike the sack into the back of the cart with a grunt. Now get out of the cart, he told Halverson. What about the other money bag on the sidewalk? put in Mannering. That's Halverson's cut. We're not greedy. We'll leave it for him. We're not monsters here. Mannering snickered. And besides, our not being monsters, it won't fit in the remaining carts anyway. Becker gave Mannering a look. Halverson didn't budge from his seat. He was damned if he was going to take orders from Becker. Becker confronted Halverson. Well, what's taking you so long? The zombies directly behind them crept closer, lurching and scrabbling down the sidewalk, while the creatures on the other side of the street tried to blaze a trail through the labyrinth of cars parked on the street. Somehow a tall, reedy, black, twenty-something male creature had gotten further through the cars than his companions. The creature had a hatchet face and wore faded blue jeans. A white rope, instead of a belt, held his jeans up. Creature screwed up its face, extended its scraggy, bony hands, and closed in on Victoria. Halverson whipped the Mossberg persuader around, squeezed the trigger, and blew the creature's face off. We're running out of time, said Halverson. Chapter 56 You mean you're running out of time, said Becker? 
Your money bag is over there waiting for you. He pointed at the money bag lying on the sidewalk next to the disabled motor cart. I said, we're running out of time, reiterated Halverson. Then I suggest you get out of that cart and start running, because you're the one who doesn't have a ride, said Becker. He has a gun, though, said Mannering, watching them with interest. He'll need one to fight off the ghouls. You missed my point. What are you trying to say? Don't beat around the bush. Spit it out. I'm saying he has a gun, and you don't. Why should he take orders from you? Because I'm the leader now. Who the hell put you in charge? demanded Riva. I'm the only one here with any experience in leadership. And you're the one who tried to steal our money. Fuck him. Manwing told Reba. Let's beat it. Reba and Manwing climbed into the motor cart. Reba took the wheel. Halverson and Victoria followed suit. Victoria took the driver's seat. Zombies started groping at Becker's sleeves. Terrified, he fought them off, punching and kicking them. He couldn't stand the sensation of their decomposing faces on his fists, which sank into the gunky rot and slid around before hitting bone. He knew nothing about fighting anyway. The only fighting he knew about was political infighting. Still, he punched and kicked for all he was worth. He knew he was dead meat if those things got a hold of him. Victoria fired her motor cart's engine. She and Halverson pulled away. Reba twisted the key in her motor cart's ignition. The battery wheezed. The engine didn't turn over. Do it again, Mannering urged her, his expression tense. Frantically, Reba turned the key again. A zombie swiped it, meant help her, she decided. She couldn't think of anything else to do. She felt trapped. It was getting even worse as she realized zombies all around the car were crouching down and reaching under the car to pull her out. She felt gnarly hands picking at her from all sides. Her heart in her mouth, she twisted her head to and fro, seeking for a space on either side of the car where she could slide out and escape. But there wasn't any space. The creatures were packed everywhere around the vehicle. Her predicament reminded her of the time when she was a little girl and she and her brother had run away from a bully in their neighborhood one night. They fled to their car, parked in front of their house. She couldn't think of anywhere else to go, so she rolled under their car. Her brother hid behind the car. The bully ran up to their car, found her brother, and demanded to know where his sister was. Reva was terrified her brother would tell the bully where she was hiding. She thought she was going to die then under the car. She feared her brother would tell the bully, and then the bully would either drag her out from under the car and beat her up, or jump up and down on the car's hood and crush her underneath. Her brother said he didn't know where she was. She heard the bully shove her brother against the car, her chest heaving. She waited for the bully to peek under the car. The bully must not have thought of it. In the end, the bully stalked off. Only it was worse this time with the zombie she knew. There wasn't just one bully out there. There were dozens of flesh-eating ghouls bent on devouring her. Where was Hank? She wondered frantically. Hadn't he heard her scream? And what about Victoria and Chad? Why weren't they coming to help her? She felt at least four hands trying to grab her feet. She slid on her back toward the front of the car to escape their clutches. Then hands reached under the front of the car and grabbed her hair to hoik her out. Oh, my God, she thought. She grabbed the chassis above her to prevent them from pulling her out from under the car. Now she could feel them hauling on her hair and her feet at the same time. They were tearing her hair out of her head, sending shooting pain through her scalp. At her lower extremities, it felt like they were going to tear her legs off. She didn't let go of the chassis above her. She heard a gunshot. Maybe somebody would try to help her now. If she could last any longer, she screamed again. Her eyes bugged out of her head when she saw a small creature pushing tin roll under the car and nestle beside her. The creature moaned, took a bite out of one of her arms that was holding on to the chassis for purchase. Reba was so petrified, her scream caught in her throat. Chapter 57 
On the sidewalk, when Becker climbed into the driver's seat vacated by Reba, Mannering tried to shove him off the cart. Becker held on for dear life. The creatures were converging all around them, and he knew if he let go, it would be the end of him. He wouldn't stand a chance outside of the cart. "'Get out of here, you bastard!' Mannering yelled at him. Becker would have none of it. He fought to maintain his grasp on the steering wheel as Mannering continued to try to shove him out of the cart. "'I'll die if you leave me behind!' Becker cried. "'I hope so,' snarled Mannering, grappling with him. "'You don't deserve to live.' I have as much right as anybody else. What gives you the right to decide? Becker's face flushed with effort as he struggled to hang onto the wheel. What gave you the right to throw Reba out of the cart? demanded Mannering. I'll say it again. What gives you the right to decide who lives or dies? This, said Mannering. He pulled out his Glock and leveled it at Becker. Now let go. With his free hand, Becker tried to wrest the pistol from Mannering. Mannering fired. The round hit Becker in the arm. Becker screamed, let go of the steering wheel, and recoiled from the cart, clutching his wounded arm. A look of stunned disbelief swept over his face. He couldn't believe Mannering had shot him. Frenzied by the sight and odor of the fresh blood oozing from Becker's arm, ghouls clawed and trampled over each other, trying to reach him first. Mannering slid into the driver's seat. Reba, he bellowed. He scoped the area for her. He had heard her screaming earlier, but he had been too preoccupied fighting off Becker to notice the location of her screams. He couldn't see hide nor hair of her. He fired at a zombie that was reaching for him. The bullet hit it in the head. Staring face of the creature jerked back. The creature dropped dead. Reba! He couldn't hear her screaming any more. Did you see where Reba went? He asked Halverson and Victoria, who were in their cart up ahead. I saw her roll into the road, but I lost track of her, answered Halverson. Reba! Mannering called out again. No answer. Two shirtless male creatures lunged at Mannering. The taller creature had a greenish hue to his waxy, rotting complexion. As he sat in the cart's driver's seat, Mannering slapped the creature's groping hands away from him. We gotta go, said Halverson. They're all over the place. We can't leave Reba, said Victoria beside him. We don't even know where she is. Mannering squeezed off a round into the shorter ghoul that was closing in on him. The nine-millimeter bullet slammed into the creature's forehead. To Mannering's left, two creatures held Becker by his arms. Each creature was trying to yank one of Becker's arms off to devour it. Help me! screamed Becker. Halverson trained his persuader on one of the creatures and blew it away. The thing fell dead and released Becker's arm. The other creature continued to tug on Becker's arm that had the gunshot wound. Halverson couldn't get a clear shot at the ghoul. Becker was standing in Halverson's line of fire. The creature yanking on Becker's wounded arm was exacerbating the pain that was already flowing in waves from Becker's wound. Becker yelped. took the last three red cartridges out of his pocket and fed them into the Mossberg's magazine. I still have my trusty cleaver said Mannering. But we are seriously in need of more firepower. Can't fight them here. We've got to get out. They drove toward the end of the block. Suddenly Mannering bellowed a curse. His motor cart limped to a halt. Can't stop here, said Halverson. Keep going. Got a fucking flat. They were twenty-odd feet from the corner where the generator was rumbling. You'll have to make a run for it, said Halverson. What about the money? We'll have to come back for it later. Halverson had no intention of coming back for it. He was just trying to ally Mannering's concern about it. The bottom line was that they had to keep going, whether they had the money or not. He wanted Mannering to forget about the money and concentrate on surviving. On Mannering's right, a creature burst out of a beauty salon's plate-glass door that advertised Brazilian blowouts for one hundred and fifty dollars. Nothing was cheap on Wilshire and Santa Monica, Halverson knew. It was a city of the well-heeled and the down at the heel. It was a small city, but it wasn't much different than its big city neighbor Los Angeles in that respect, except everything was more expensive. This Santa Monica beauty boutique, the Living Inns, was no exception. In fact, the female creature's hair was the best part of the ghoul. Halverson didn't know a Brazilian blowout from a blow-dry, but compared to the rest of the creature— its brunette hair was drop-dead gorgeous. 
creature's face was an oozing mass of suppuration and disintegration, and had gums and cracked teeth the green hue of the wicked witch of the West complexion. Mannering was facing in the opposite direction when it happened, and had no idea the creature was lurching toward him. "'The god behind you!' exclaimed Halverson. Mannering whirled around. As he did so, the creature snatched Mannering's arm and took a bite out of his forearm. Mannering cursed. Cleaver started bleeding again. "'You guys get out of here,' he yelled to Victorian Halverson over the deafening cacophony of the jackhammer. Victoria was reluctant to leave. "'Go ahead,' Mannering went on. "'I'll try to take out as many of those things as I can to slow them down.' "'Are you sure?' asked Victoria. "'Just get out of here before it's too late.' Creatures inched dangerously close to the motor cart. Victoria accelerated. She drove into the gnarl of cars abandoned on the street, then veered onto the next block sidewalk. Alverson blasted a zombie that had wandered too close to them. The creature's head burst into skull fragments and brain pudding that bedecked a scarlet, custom-made Ferrari's hood. Creatures massed around Mannering, who hollered at them and held the pounding jackhammer up in his arms. Whenever a creature came at him, he thrust the jackhammer into its face and made mincemeat of it with it, driving blows of the edged cutting tool. Come and get it, thundered Mannering. A seventy-something tall creature hobbled toward him. It had a bald pate, close-cropped gray hair, and lousy posture. The geezer zombie was wearing a black Hollywood park cap. It hobbled toward Manring on its bum pins. It opened its mouth and groped toward him. Unable to raise the jackhammer high enough to reach the ghoul's head, Manring jabbed the smoking, raucous tool into the geezer zombie's ribcage. The rapid thrusting of the tool's drill pulped the creature's chest. In fact, the drill bored all the way through the ribcage, the heart, and the creature's back. But the creature kept plodding toward Manring. Mannering wrestled the jackhammer out of the creature's ribcage and this time mustered enough strength to aim higher at the creature's screwed-up, emaciated face. He managed to home in on the creature's bulbous nose and atomized it with the rapid metallic jabs of the jackhammer's drill. The drill crashed through the skull and decomposed flesh as easily as through an egg, obliterating the diseased, reanimated brain encased in the cranium. Its face an unrecognizable mask of mush. The geezer zombie dropped dead at Mannering's feet. Mannering kicked the creature away from him. More creatures swarmed around Mannering. There was no end to them as far as Mannering could see. He kept jamming away at them with a jackhammer, overheating in his hands. As soon as he dropped one creature, another one took its place in short order. A wall of corpses was piling up in front of Mannering, some five bodies high. Still, ineluctably, the creatures kept coming. Mannering kept drilling the walking dead with the juddering jackhammer. The strain of holding the heavy jackhammer high up in his hands was taking its toll on him. He could barely hold his arms up. It was only with a great effort now that he could lift the jackhammer waist high. He bored the smoking jackhammer through the next zombie's entrails, all the way through the spine and out the other end, without even slowing down the grimacing creature. The creature kept walking toward him, heedless that it had no spine or stomach left as intestines spooled out in front of it. Mannering kept his back to the chugging generator to prevent any creatures from bushwhacking him from behind. He remained vulnerable on his flanks, however. As he buried his jackhammer to the hilt into the stomach of one creature, another creature staggered toward him on his left and clawed his head. Manning tried to hoik the jackhammer out of the stomach of the creature in front of him, but there were several other creatures lined up behind their mate, exerting pressure on the creature, forcing it into Mannering, rendering it impossible for Mannering to withdraw the jackhammer in order to turn it on the creature bearing down on his left. The creature on his left opened its toothy open mouth, and descended on Mannering's carotid artery. Chapter 59 Victoria kept driving toward the ocean. Halverson glanced over his shoulder at Mannering, but could not see him any longer. All Halverson could see were zombies swarming over the generator like bees on a hive. 
Halverson flinched in shock as he saw an amputated arm suddenly catapulted out of the pile of creatures. As the arm plummeted, a creature snatched it out of the sky, stuffed it into its yawning mouth, and buried its teeth into the bloody flesh. His gorge rising, Halverson turned away from the mayhem, unable to watch the slaughter any longer. Victoria saw the same thing in the rearview mirror and gasped. Unconsciously, she released her foot from the gas pedal. The cart slowed down. Keep driving, urged Halverson. Those things will come after us as soon as they finish with Hank. Victoria pulled herself together and accelerated. They didn't see any creatures in front of them. At least there aren't any of those things ahead of us, said Victoria. They can't box us in. Maybe we can make good time now, said Halverson. Why are we in such a rush? Where are we going? we got to get out of this area. We're going to the coast. But what's there? Do you think it's any better there? Maybe, he lied. Do you really think things are going to get any better? The only good day was yesterday, said Halverson. What's that supposed to mean? It's the motto of the seals. Are you a seal? No. He didn't like lying to her, but lying was part and parcel of the job of spying. He felt uncomfortable lying to her. He wanted to tell her the truth. But in the end, he decided it was probably best for her that she didn't know what he knew about the origin of the plague at the Erasmus Medical Center. That knowledge alone would be enough to get her killed, along with him, by the government. Then how do you know about the model of the seals? she asked. I told you, I do a lot of research for my articles. One eyebrow cocked, she looked at him skeptically, doubtful he was leveling with her. From what Coogan had told him over the phone, Halverson knew the coast wouldn't be any better than anywhere else. The whole world was a wasteland now, overrun with the infected, living dead. The man-made plague had wiped out most of the human race. There could still be pockets of survivors like him and Victoria out there somewhere, he suspected. After all, his boss Mellers and a contingent of the agency as well as of the executive branch of the federal government were holed up in Mount Weather in Virginia. In Mellers' case, it wasn't exactly a good thing that he was still alive, not for Halverson. Halverson was convinced Mellers had tried to take him out with the missile fired by the drone, and Halverson figured Mellers wasn't the only one in on the attempt on Halverson's life. However, it proved that survivors of the plague existed. Whether they were enemies or friends remained to be seen. The important point was that Halverson and Victoria weren't the only ones left on Earth. After the missile attack, Halverson was having second thoughts about finding other survivors. He and Victoria might live longer if they avoided other humans, especially if those humans worked for the government. On the other hand, it would be tough sledding for the two of them to make it on their own. To do so, they would have to start a farm or commandeer one somewhere and become self-sufficient. It wouldn't be easy, he knew. It would make more sense from a self-defense standpoint to join up with other survivors and form some kind of society with the vision of labor. That way, they would have a better chance of defending themselves from zombie attacks. In the end, there was safety in numbers. Of course, none of that mattered if they didn't live through the day. The immediate goal was to survive. He heard a noise overhead. He looked up. As he had feared, he saw the drone. The drone's back, Victoria said anxiously. Question is, can it see us? Halverson felt relieved on one account. At least the drone could not home in on the GPS signal in his sat phone to track him any longer. But did the drone possess some other means of tracking and IDing him? My question is, why does it want to kill us? said Victoria. What were its orders? wondered Halverson. Was its mission to hunt down and kill him, or to hunt down and kill any and all survivors? Why would anyone, even the government, want to kill all survivors? I don't know what its mission is, said Halverson. Maybe it's programmed to kill zombies. Halverson watched the drone rumble above them. He didn't notice any red laser dots on his chest. That was a good sign. 
Maybe his jettison sat phone was still generating a GPS signal and the drone was searching for it, he decided. I don't want to take any chances with that thing, he said. Pull under that marquee so it can't see us. Victoria steered under the marquee of a hotel, out of view of the drone. Drones are operated by the federal government, she said. The government's not supposed to kill its own citizens. They're not supposed to, but who's to tell the feds what they can or can't do? How many missiles can a drone carry? Depends on the drone. That's an MQ-1 predator. Carries two AGM-114 Hellfire missiles. It's already fired two missiles. It must be empty now. That's the same drone that fired as was before, but it might be a different one. I don't understand why they're attacking us. It makes no sense. It would make sense to her, he decided, if he told her that he knew too much for the agency to allow him to live. But he was sworn to secrecy. He could not tell her anything he learned at the agency, and, for her own safety's sake, the less she knew of the catastrophe that occurred at the Erasmus Medical Center, the better for her. Whether it makes sense or not, we have to deal with it, said Halverson. Just think about it. A world full of flesh-eating ghouls? None of it makes any sense. The world is chaos. The person who's operating that drone must be nearby. Maybe we can find him somehow and get him to stop shooting at us. Halverson shook his head no. He could be anywhere. Most of the piloting of drones is done from Creech Air Force Base northwest of Las Vegas. All you need is a satellite link to fly one. She searched his face. How can you know all this? I do research for my articles. I think there's more to you than meets the eye. That could be said of anyone. Unsatisfied with his answer, she shook her head. She changed the subject. Whoever's flying it should be killing ghouls, not humans, she said. She pounded the steering wheel in exasperation. Halverson could not hear the drone overhead. I think it's gone, he said. Let's keep going. Victoria put the motor cart in gear. She ventured out from under the shade of the marquee. Sometimes I think we'd be better off dead, she said. One thing we have in our favor is the smoke. Drones can't see through smoke, said Halverson, scanning the skies for any trace of the drone. Victoria coughed. It's havoc on our lungs, though. A couple more miles and we'll be at the coast. If only we don't meet up with any more ghouls. They drove for a mile through desolate and ruined Santa Monica. They don't seem to be around here, said Halverson. Even Wilshire was less congested with abandoned motor vehicles in this part of town than it had been further east. Maybe it's safe for us to rest here, said Victoria dead on my feet. Halverson thought about it. We better keep moving. These buildings could be infested with creatures. How do they keep finding us? We're not exactly hiding. Halverson startled as somebody screamed. It sounded to Halverson like it was coming from one of the cars parked on Wilshire. What was that? asked Victoria, Google-eyed. Halverson scoped out the abandoned cars. At first blush, he missed it. Then, out of the corner of his eye, he caught sight of a Chrysler sedan rocking in the road. The car wasn't only rocking. Its windows were being splashed with blood from its interior as a creature was tearing apart a thirty-ish woman in the front seat. The woman frantically hammered the car's horn with her dying breath. We can't do anything for her now, said Halverson. Chapter 60 Less than ten minutes later, Halverson and Victoria reached the coast. They drove on to Ocean Avenue, which skirted a bluff that overlooked the Pacific Coast Highway in the Pacific Ocean. A palm-studded pocket park of neatly trimmed grass carpeted the western border of the avenue that included the bluff that was verged by a concrete fence with three rails. Victoria crossed over Ocean Avenue and drove onto the dirt path that ran through the park parallel to the shoreline. They could see the Santa Monica Pier bisecting the ocean nearby. 
with a motionless Ferris wheel unique for its solar power and a yellow roller coaster at its base, the weathered sepia wooden pier jutted into the shimmering mirror-like sea. Where now? asked Victoria. To the pier, answered Halverson. Creatures could trap us there. From there we'll take a boat and get out of here. What boat? Halverson pointed toward the end of the jetty. Isn't that a boat tied up to the end of the pier? Victoria squinted at the pier's edge that protruded behind a two-story mustard-roofed Mexican restaurant nestled on wooden planks supported by pilings anchored in the sand underwater. A small skiff bobbed on rollers undulating into the pilings at the end of the pier. Looks like it, she said. That's our ticket out of here. That little boat won't take us far. We're not putting out to sea. We'll sail like a coaster till we find somewhere safe on land. As they reached the road to the pier, they noticed a herd of creatures gathering near the intersection. We need to get to the intersection before they do, or they'll cut us off from the pier, said Halverson. I'm already flooring the gas pedal. The motor cart raced along the dirt road, kicking up rooster tails of dust behind its rear wheels. On the beach down below the bluff, Halverson could make out eight volleyball nets pitched in the sand with a square concrete one-story restroom nearby. Beyond the restroom stood a faded sky-blue lifeguard tower with an American flag flying above it. The flag slatted in the prevailing winds, while shrieking seagulls swooped and glided on shaky white wings in the offshore blustering gusts. Near the ocean, just east of the high water mark, Fifty-five-gallon rusted yellow oil drums were half buried in the sand fifteen or so feet away from each other in a row along the coastline, out of reach of the incoming boiling surf. Fast the volleyball nets was a tractor parked next to a runoff ditch. Behind the tractor canted two attachable blades for grating sand on the beach's volleyball pitches. Out in the ocean, a rocky black breakwater cropped up, surrounded by surf and swirling spume. About a hundred feet beyond the breakwater to its south, a boy was bobbing and swaying in the ocean. Bordering the beach side of PCH stood an array of mostly three-story apartment houses, asphalt parking lots with toll booths, greasy spoons, as well as upscale restaurants. Most of the apartment houses were painted subdued grays and duns, except for an exotic flare-up of color now and then, like day-glow purple and screaming yellow. Victoria reached the road, driving full tilt. She hung right with such velocity, the cart all but tipped over. She careened down the steep, narrow asphalt road that passed over a service road for coastal shops, as she blazed toward the pier. They were in luck, decided Halverson. The pier looked deserted. He didn't see any creatures milling on it. Victoria drove onto the jetty's promenade of bumpy weathered wooden planks. Deserted souvenir shops lined either side of the pier. On the southern side, amusement rides, gaming arcades, and cafes stood interspersed with the souvenir shops. A parking lot stretched behind the Ferris wheel and bumper cars. Halverson craned his neck around. He could see that the creatures were lumbering after them down the steep grade he and Victoria had just traversed. We're going to have to block the pier's entrance, he said. Why? I want to make sure we have enough time to get onto the boat and out of here before those things get anywhere near us. Just how are we going to block the pier? Halberthson thought about it, scoping the jetty. There are cars parked near the Ferris wheel. We can line those up and block the pier's entrance. They parked in a lot near the side of the pier. Muddy, dark green seawater impregnated with algae crashed and frothed against the pilings underneath them, casting foam up toward the floorboards. Countless barnacles engirdled and crusted the aging pilings all the way up to water level. Oh, look! said Victoria plaintively. Halverson followed her gaze. Banks of smoke scudded over the ocean and smudged the sky as the Santa Monica Mountains burned around the bay. Even Malibu was in flames. Halverson could see as he looked north at the smoking blight where the exclusive enclave lay ensconced in the hills that ran down to the coastline. Nobody's safe anymore, said Halverson. 
He had around and watched the conflagration. The SUV and the bug exploded almost simultaneously, spewing flames skyward. How long will those burn? asked Victoria. Depends on how much gas they have in their tanks. Hopefully the SUV at least has a lot. Seems to be holding the ghouls for the moment. She didn't sound too certain of herself, decided Halverson. He watched the creatures thrashing their arms at the lurching, wavering flames. Can't hold them forever, he said above the roar and crackle of the fire. We're just buying time till we can board that skiff and put out to sea. He heard a commotion underneath the pier. He strode to the edge of it and looked down. Creatures were milling on the sand between the pilings underneath the pier. Victoria followed him and peered down. Can they climb those pilings? I doubt it. They're too spastic to shinny up those pilings. Further north on the beach, he could make out creatures thronging onto the sand from PCH. They seemed to be chasing something scurrying through the sand. He squinted to discern the object. He could not believe his eyes when he made it out. Chapter 62 Isn't that Newton the Iguana on the beach over there? he said. Victoria peered in the direction Halverson nodded at. Yeah, I think it is, she said, smiling. Look at him run. Where's he going? Looks like he's headed here. Halverson started jumping up and down and waving at the iguana. Over here, Newton, he hollered. Halverson felt like a fool. Only an idiot would call to an iguana, he figured. But he had to admit it felt good to see the fluorescent orange and lavender reptile. Victoria joined in, cheering Newton and waving at him, too. She suddenly turned grim. He won't make it here with all these ghouls swarming on the pier and under it. He's moving pretty fast, but you're right. I don't see how he can get past these things on the pier and surrounding it. The iguana came to an abrupt halt and spun around to face the creatures pursuing him. He hissed at them and expanded his dewlap to make himself appear larger and more threatening. Unfazed, the ghouls kept trudging toward him through the sand. The iguana whirled around, shot across the sand, and scurried into the ocean, where it writhed like an eel through the water. Can iguana swim? asked Victoria. Apparently. What about the creatures? I don't see how they can do much of anything except stumble around like winos. Good for Newton. Halverson watched as the ghouls squelched through the wet sand and into the onrushing surf in their efforts to catch Newton. The ghouls kept scrambling through the water until their heads disappeared beneath the three-foot-high swells, pounding against their dead bodies. After the waves passed over them, the ghouls continued their trek into the ocean and disappeared out of sight under the water. Halverson thought he could distinguish something knifing rapidly through the water toward the pier. He ran to the end of the pier to get a better look at the swimmer. Just as he had thought, he recognized the bright lavender and orange colors of the iguana's skin slicing through the sea. He's heading here, said Halverson. Victoria ran over to Halverson to watch Newton. The iguana made a beeline through the water toward the edge of the pier. What's he going to do when he gets here? asked Victoria with concern. As if to answer her question, Newton reached the corner piling underneath Halverson and Victoria, sank his claws into the wet brown wood and scrambled up it to the top of the pier. He mounted the wooden handrail in front of them and looked at them. Victoria laughed. I think he recognizes us. Halverson smiled. He couldn't remember smiling in a long time. All it took was an iguana to cheer him up, he decided. Then Halverson cut his eyes to the right and down at the skip, floating near the pilings, and his good humor vanished. What? said Victoria, picking up on his change in mood. The skiff's taking on water. Maybe the waves are just splashing into the skiff, said Victoria, trying to sound hopeful. It's not the waves. It's always something, Victoria said miserably. The skiff's got a hole in the bottom of it. Isn't there some way to plug the hole? With what? Even if we could, it wouldn't last very long. The hole's too big. No, that skiff's not going anywhere. Now what do we do? We have to find another way out of here. Victoria gazed at the burning blockade of cars on the pier. We don't have a whole lot of time. Halverson leaned on the edge of the pier and looked down at the pilings. Armies of ghouls were mobbing under the wooden floor planks, meandering between the pilings and wading into the muddy surf. Several of the creatures started banging their fists against the pilings in seeming frustration. 
Other creatures weltered into the ocean and disappeared under the swells. We should be safe here as long as that blockade holds, said Halverson. Then what? Even as she spoke, a tiny girl ghoul managed to slink around the blockade somehow. Her blonde tresses on fire, she shambled toward the end of the pier. Victoria froze at the sight. The girl reminded her of Shauna. Halverson snatched the persuader from Victoria's hands, swung the barrel upward, and trained it on the creature's flaming head. He squeezed the trigger. With sinking heart, he heard a click. Undaunted, shotgun in hand, he charged the tot. Lowering, she reached out to claw him. He reversed the position of the shotgun in his hands and now gripped the muzzle. With both hands, he swung the shotgun stock at her head. Taking the full brunt of the blow upside its head, the creature pitched off the wharf into the pounding surf below. Halverson took the shotgun and inspected the barricade to make sure none of the other creatures were breaching it. Satisfied with his examination, he jogged back to Victoria. She was sobbing, her head bowed, overcome with images of Shauna flooding her mind. Halverson draped his arm over her shoulder to comfort her. Things were going from bad to worse, he knew. The shotgun was empty. He had no more ammo in his pockets. The pier might wind up as their deathbed. He stared out at the flint-green ocean as clouds of smoke drifted over it. He did a double-take. He thought he could make out a sailboat floating on the undulating sea in the distance. Am I imagining that? he asked. What? she said, raising her head. He pointed at the vessel. It looks like a sailboat she said. Chapter 63 Halverson called out and commenced jumping up and down, waving exuberantly to the sailboat. Victoria joined him. Sailboat didn't change direction. Maybe they're too far away to see us, said Victoria, ceasing waving. Halverson followed suit. He noticed the boat was sailing with the wind. He thought about it. I wonder if anybody's on that boat, he said. Victoria squinted and raised her hands over her eyes to shield them from the sun. I can't see anyone from this distance. There's no way to tell if anyone's aboard. Wouldn't they head over here if there was? Unless they couldn't see us or they thought we were infected. This is stupid. They're so close. Why can't they just come over here and check us out to see that we're okay? Not only that, we have that fire burning on the pier. They ought to be able to see the flames of nothing else. Victoria shrugged in dismay. I guess we'll never know if anyone's piloting that boat or not. There's only one way to find out for sure. What's that? He faced her. Can you swim? No. Then it's on me. You're not thinking of swimming all the way to that boat. That's except that the boat was continually sailing farther away from him. That could be a problem, depending on its speed. If it was heaving faster than he was swimming, obviously he would never reach it. Maintaining a firm, steady pace was the best thing he could do at this point, he decided. He hated leaving Victoria by herself to face the ghouls on the pier, but he saw no way around it. Their only chance for survival lay in that sailboat. He kept stroking through the ocean toward the sailboat, breathing at a steady rate. The seas weren't rough. He didn't have to fight high waves. He could make it, he told himself. Never give up. Never quit. He would reach that boat if it killed him. He found himself fighting a current. He had to swim harder. He couldn't allow himself to be borne along by the current, which was streaming in the wrong direction. He kicked harder and increased his strokes, bound to determine to break free from the current's potent grip. He felt himself breaking out of the current. He kept stroking until he had completely freed himself from its watery shackles. He peered at the sailboat. He tried to gauge its distance. He seemed to be gaining on it, but it was still a long ways off. As long as he kept gaining on it, he would finally reach it. The question was, how long could he maintain this pace? Another concern was niggling at the back of his mind. He wondered if there were sharks in Santa Monica Bay. He didn't think there were. On the other hand, he had heard of shark attacks along the Southern California coastline. He pricked up his ears at a rumbling overhead. 
He glanced up into the smoky sky that drone was flying over him. He didn't think it could sense him in the vast expanse of the ocean, especially with the veil of smoke wafting above the water. As the drone flew directly over him, he held his breath and dove underwater. There was no sense in taking any chances. The decomposing, sickly green face of a male twenty-something ghoul bobbed into Halverson's view as the thing clumped up the companionway. Green slabs of flesh were melting off its face and attracting a swarm of blue bottles. The creature was wearing a torn, grime-streaked wife-beater. As soon as the creature clapped its white eyes on Halverson, it bared its green teeth and green gums and moaned with hunger. Jesus Christ, thought Halverson. Chapter 64 when Victoria picked up the drone flying over her, she ducked into the Mexican restaurant to hide. She didn't consciously think about it. It was more of a reflex reaction. After all, a drone had fired a missile at them earlier, though she had no idea why. None of anything that had happened since yesterday made the slightest bit of sense to her. Pestilence, flesh-eating zombies, missile-firing drones, what next, she wondered. Martians? The world was well and truly falling apart at the seams. The roaring of the drone trailed off into the distance. Circumscriptly, Victoria emerged from the restaurant. Newton the iguana was laying motionless and contented on the top rail at the end of the pier, soaking up the warmth of the sun's rays. The sun had baked off the briny seawater that had soaked him during his swim to the pier. Victoria walked around the restaurant to scope out the blockade a hundred-plus feet from the other side of the building. She froze in her tracks at the sight. A male teenage creature was in the process of tumbling over the BMW's hood, onto Victoria's side of the burning barricade of cars. Somehow, the thing had crawled onto the BMW's burning hood, even as the thing itself was burning. In fact, both of the creature's arms and its hair were being immolated. The creature ignored the flames. Awkwardly, it contrived to get to its feet on the dock's wooden floorboards and traipsed toward Victoria. Victoria knew the thing wouldn't die until its brains boiled inside its skull. Apparently, the blazes on its scalp hadn't burned through its skull to the gray matter. Victoria refused to let the creature cower. Shotgun in hand, Victoria rushed the scrabbling, flaming thing. Running toward the creature, she didn't know how she was going to attack it. She just knew she had to stop it post-haste. When she reached it, she started jabbing the shotgun's muzzle at the creature's chest, knocking the creature back. Then an idea coalesced in her mind. She knew what she was going to do. With a shotgun, she shoved the creature toward the edge of the pier, and with one final forceful shove, knocked the creature off the pier into the brawling water below. She peeked over the edge of the dock and watched the creature flailing in the crashing surf. A two-foot wave slammed into the creature's head and doused the flames on it. Now the creature wouldn't die from the blazes, she realized, as long as its brain remained undamaged. The creature would shamble on ad infinitum. Didn't matter to her one way or the other whether the creature lived or died. As long as it wasn't on her side of the pier, she could care less about the ghoul. She eyeballed the barricade. The flames on it were burning lower. Sooner or later they would die out altogether. How much longer did she have before more of the creatures broke through, she wondered. She felt confident she could fight them off if they crawled over the blockade one at a time. However, when they started breaching the barricade in numbers, she would have to retreat or they would surround her and kill her. She glanced in the offing in the direction of the sailboat. The craft was still sailing out to sea, she realized, disheartened. Halverson could have drowned by now for all she knew. Her shoulders slumped, then she straightened up. She wasn't about to give up. She still had some fight left in her. A boat with a captain and passengers in it might float this way, she decided. It wasn't over till it was over. As long as she was drawing breath, there was a chance she could get out of this debacle. 
And then there was Halverson. He might still be out there, she knew, still alive, still swimming to the boat. Victoria noticed the money bags lumped in the back of the motor cart, parked nearby. She decided to drive the cart to the end of the dock, so she and Halverson could load the sacks quickly onto the boat when he arrived. If he arrived. In any case, she wanted to be prepared to embark at a moment's notice. She checked one last time to make sure none of the creatures were surmounting the barricade. Then she climbed into the motor cart, fired the ignition, put the cart into gear, and drove along the creaking wooden planks of the pier's floorboard until she reached Newton, who was basking in the sun on the top rail at the end of the pier. She searched the blue and green marbled ocean for the sailboat. To her right, isolated, arching palm trees studded the beach. Also on the beach were marauding zombies, stomping through the sand. She swept her eyes westward across the sea till they lighted on the sailboat. The boat was still sailing away from the pier, she saw. She sighed. If only the boat was at least sailing in this direction. She decided to return to the barricade where she could spot in short order any zombie trying to breach it. The name of the game was Survival. She was trying to hold on as long as she possibly could. It was crucial for her to kill the creatures as soon as they got past the barricade, where they were at their most vulnerable. Otherwise, they would gather together after passing over the wall of cars and attack her en masse. As soon as they banded together, they would become invincible by sheer weight of numbers. She withdrew her cell phone from her pant pocket to see if she could make a call to her mother in Santa Barbara. Maybe the phones were working now, Victoria hoped. They weren't. Nothing worked. They might as well be back in the days of the covered wagon. Time to suck it up and be a pioneer. Why not? Her ancestors had done it. Why couldn't she? Instead of battling Indians, she was battling zombies. Her heart accelerated as she spotted another creature, trying to make its way over to the burning cars. She braced for another attack. Chapter 65 Flat on his back, on the sailboat's wet rocking deck, played out, Halverson wasn't sure he could move a muscle as he watched the creature shuffle toward him, his jaws wide. He knew he had to do something. His basic instincts were flashing red, warning him that he had two choices left, fight or flight. He wasn't going to flee back into the ocean, that was for sure. Or his trek out here had been all for naught. If he returned to the ocean, he figured that would be the last of him. He had to find the strength deep down inside him to fight it out with the creature. He yawned, still unable to move his body. He had a killer headache, his eyes burned, and his lungs ached. But he knew if he did do something, and soon, that thing in the wife-beater was going to have him for lunch. Halverson had to keep going to save himself and Victoria. He and Victoria were the only two persons that mattered to him anymore. Despite his pain and fatigue, he willed himself to move as the creature crouched down beside his chest and prepared to gorge on his throat. Halverson delivered a sharp jab to the creature's solar plexus to keep the creature at bay. His fist landed in mushy, decaying flesh. He wanted to punch the thing in its face, but its face was so rotten and fly-blown, he dared not touch it, lest he become infected. Indeed, maggots were squirming in and out of the creature's nostrils and cheeks. Halverson wanted to throw up at the sight. Instead, he mustered the energy to roll to his right out from under the descending ghoul. Standing behind the ghoul, he kicked it in its butt. The creature staggered forward and fell on its stomach on the deck. The creature thrashed its arms as it tried to stand up. Halverson was standing feebly, bowed forward, his hands braced on his weakened knees, breathing deeply, trying to regain his strength. The creature managed to find its footing. It advanced on Halverson. Halverson wished he had more energy, but he would just have to make do with what little he had left. He cast around the boat for a weapon of some sort, something he could club the creature's skull in with. 
he picked up on a boat hook lying on the port side of the deck. As the creature moved in on him for the kill, Halverson lunged for the boat hook. He snatched it up from the deck with his right hand, held onto the pole with both hands, and thrust it at the creature that was following him. Drove the spike at the end of the pole into the creature's chest, stopping the creature in its tracks. Try as he might, the creature could not advance now that it was pinned on the boat hook. Halverson strode forward and shoved the creature backward until it toppled over the gunwale into the ocean. Halverson wrenched the boat hook free of the creature's chest in the midst of the creature's fall. He dropped the boat hook on the deck. Now he had to turn his sailboat around and tack close hauled into the wind toward the pier. He hoped Victoria was okay. He could see the car still burning on the wharf. That was a good sign. As long as they were still burning, they should keep the creatures from advancing to the end of the pier where Victoria was waiting for him, hopefully. He could not see her from here. The pier was too far away. Sailing was second nature to him because of his seal training. If anyone could sail there in time to save her, he could. The wind whipped into his face as he stood at the wheel of the twenty-foot sailboat. Chapter 66 Victoria slammed the butt of the Mossberg into the six-five creature that was lumbering toward her in burning, smoking clothing. The thing had a massive tombstone-like head. She couldn't miss it if she tried. She connected with a shotgun stock, the shotgun steel muzzle vibrated in her hands, and all the way down her arms as the stock slammed into the creature's skull. Not good, she decided, her arms twinging. Felt like striking a steel girder. The creature pitched to its right, but didn't fall over. The stock not only didn't crack the creature's skull, didn't damage the thing's brain either. Victoria cursed. The creature's skull was too big and thick, she decided. She wasn't going to be able to kill the ghoul this way. She backed away from the ghoul. As she did so, three more ghouls tumbled over the burning blockade, their ragged clothes on fire. She wouldn't be able to fight them all off any more. There were too many of them. She had to retreat. Her heart in her mouth, she whipped to the end of the pier. In desperation, she peered out to sea. She saw the sailboat heading in her direction. Halverson had made it, she saw. But would he get back to her before the zombies got to her? She glanced back at the blockade of cars. She shook her head despondently. Too many creatures were crawling she could summon. Aided by the gusting wind, the end of the painter flew through the air and landed on the boat's bow. Halverson scrambled to retrieve the painter before it slid off the bow. He latched onto the painter and wound it around a steel cleat on the slippery deck to moor the boat to the rail. Meanwhile, on the pier, three zombies were closing in on Victoria. Chapter 67 Halverson dove into the ocean. He swam to the pier. He had seen the ghouls swarming around Victoria and knew she couldn't fight them off by herself. He dog-paddled up to one of the pier's pilings and embraced it. He started shinning his way up the wet, brown wooden piling. He managed to gain purchase, clawing the barnacles that girded the wood, cutting his hands as he gripped the sharp crustaceans and hauled himself up. Whenever he saw a wave approach, he stopped climbing and hugged the piling until the wave rolled over him. Otherwise, the wave would sweep him against the pile or off the pile into the water below. After the wave passed, he resumed climbing. He reached the pier's floorboards. He grabbed the railing and hauled himself over it and onto the pier, just as a tall creature pushing seven feet with a tombstone head lunged at Victoria. The creature's shabby clothing was on fire and its features were seared. Its eyebrows and lips had been burned off its face. Halverson kicked tombstone head away from her. The creature recoiled, staggering backward. Halverson took the shotgun from Victoria and charged the stumbling creature. He grabbed the muzzle with both hands and swung the stock at the creature's monolithic head. He didn't hear the skull crack, but the impact of the jolt sent vibrations all the way down both of his arms. Tombstone head shuffled around groggily. 
Other than its daze, the creature showed no ill effects from the wallop. The creature's head felt like it was made out of cement, decided Halverson. He didn't know if he had the strength to bash Tombstone Head's brains in. Halverson opted for another means of attack. He kept poking the Mossberg into Tombstone Head's chest, driving the ghoul back toward the edge of the pier. Despite its immense size, the creature didn't possess any more strength than any other creatures Halverson had encountered. He was able to drive the ghoul backward. When Tombstone Head backed all the way to the end of the pier, the rail prevented the ghoul from falling into the ocean. Now what? wondered Halverson. How was he going to push Tombstone Head over the rail into the ocean? The ghoul was built like a tank. Halverson observed that Tombstone Head's center of gravity was high on account of his great height, which would make Tombstone Head vulnerable to falling over the rail. All the ghoul needed was a strong push in the right place. Halverson sprang to Tombstone Head's side at the rail, cocked the shotgun like it was a bat, and swung the shotgun with all the strength he could muster into the ghoul's throat. Continuing his swing, till Tombstone Head pitched off balance, over the rail into the crashing surf below. The two other ghouls moved in on Victoria. Halverson knew she couldn't fight off both of them at the same time. While one attacked her in the front, the other could whipsaw her by bushwhacking her from behind. Halverson hustled toward the afire forty-something female creature, plodding nearest him, swung the shotgun at it, and creamed the back of its skull with a stock. Halverson heard the sickening, muffled crunch of the ghoul's skull splitting open. The creature dropped to the floorboards. The stench of the ghoul's burning, dead flesh. Maybe he was mistaken. Halverson hoped with a sigh of relief. But then he twigged the dirty cast wrapped around the creature's left leg, and... The capper, the silver Arabic puzzle ring, wrapped around the creature's left forefinger. Halverson glanced down at an identical ring on his own left forefinger. There was no doubt in his mind now. That's my brother Dan, he said, shutting his eyes, clutched his forehead. Chapter 68 "'How can you tell? His face is half-eaten away,' said Victoria. "'When we were teenagers, my mother gave us identical silver puzzle rings, "'and we both put them on the same finger.' "'Halverson held up his left forefinger. "'She saw the same ring on the creature's left forefinger. "'Her breath caught. "'I know what you're going through,' she said. "'I hate having him walking around like that. "'Then kill him. Like you killed Shauna, said Victoria glumly, recalling Shauna's demise. Halverson agonized over the idea. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can bring myself to kill my own brother. Remember what you told me about Shauna back in my house? That's not Shauna anymore, you said. It's one of those things. But it looked like Dan, decided Halverson and therein lay the problem. It was much easier for him to kill a stranger that had turned into a ghoul than it was for him to kill his own brother that had turned, especially if he had to kill his fake brother by moving in close to it and dashing its brains out. Killing Dan with a bullet would have been easier, but Halverson didn't have that option. Shotgun in hand, he gnashed his teeth and took two steps towards Dan, then brought it up. Halverson could not face wasting Dan. Halverson. Chapter 69 Victoria rose to the surface, windmilling her arms, gulping water and coughing, panic-stricken. She tried to glom onto Halverson's arms to keep her from drowning, digging her fingernails into his flesh. Unable to swim, with her grabbing his arms, he fought her off to free himself from her desperate embrace. He wrapped his left arm around her throat, her chin in the crook of his arm, and swam with her floating on her back toward the sailboat, 
that was bobbing up and down on the rolling combers. Joking on seawater, Victoria continued fighting Halverson, thinking he was trying to strangle her, when he had wrapped his arm around her neck. The salt water stung her eyes and was wreaking havoc on her stomach, which was feeling queasy from her swallowing mouthfuls of the ocean. She felt like she was suffocating and, at the same time, felt the urge to vomit, which intensified her sensation of suffocation. Death by drowning, she decided. It was even worse than people said it was. And why in the world was Chad trying to strangle her? Maybe she was flipping out. Which would she do first? Go raving mad, drown, or suffocate from being choked to death? Halverson grasped the lowest rung on the aluminum ladder on the sailboat's seaward gunwale, and with his other hand tried to haul her up over his body so that she could crawl up the ladder. She heard him saying something to her, but she couldn't make any sense of it. Her mind was loggy from lack of oxygen. She was having difficulty focusing. Crawl up my body, she strained to hear him saying like he was talking through a pillow. As if to emphasize the point, he attempted to pull her head up toward the ladder in the crook of his arm, which choked off her air supply. She felt her face turning red. When the neck wobbled to her feet, still woozy from her dip in the ocean, she and Halverson watched the zombie-infested pier. One of the creatures managed to climb over the rail and plunged into the ocean. Newton scampered onto the sailboat's prow in front of Halverson and her, and mounted it, joining them. She and Halverson took in the shoreline. The wind was swaying the isolated palm trees that studded the beach. A couple of Squeaking gulls swooped through the smoky air. On the sand, thousands of creatures thronged the beach, while hundreds waded into the ocean. How do we go on living? she asked. We just do. This has been Zombie Necropolis, Chad Halverson, written by Brian Cassidy, narrated by Mike Vendetti. Copyright 2012 by Brian Cassidy. Production copyright 2013 by Brian Cassidy. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.